Okay, so uh, uh, just to check we are all in the right room. Um, this is philosophy three, the nature of mind. Um, we'll be looking through the semester at issues to do with what the mind is, how to understand how the mind works. Here's what we're going to do in the class. Um, we're going quite quickly to go over the classical views on the nature of the mind. The idea that the mind, the, that the physical stuff and the soul, the physical stuff in the mind, are made of quite different sorts of substance. We'll, look at, we'll start looking at this a bit today and uh, go on with it at the start of next week. So that idea says the mind is essentially non-physical. In contrast to that, uh, some philosophers and psychologists have argued that all there is to having a mind, if you're asking whether an animal has a mind, if you're asking whether the person sitting next to you has a mind, all you are interested in really is whether they can engage in certain complex behaviors. Having a mind is a matter of being able to behave intelligently. In contrast to that, more recently, people have said, well, uh, minds are physical. There's only one world, and it's a physical world. Um, but it's wrong to say that the mind is having a mind is just a matter of behaving in a particular way. A complicated robot or an automaton could behave in very complicated ways, just as complicated as the ways in which you or I behave, without having a mind. What really matters for having a mind is that you have the right kind of brain. The mind is the brain. These are kind of three classical ideas that we'll go over quite quickly in the first week. Um, the most important single idea in analyzing the mind is none of these. It's functionalism, um, which has been for the last 50 years the dominant uh, uh, notion in um, both in philosophy and in experimental psychology and empirical work in the mind. It probably is right to say that it's functionalism is the working hypothesis of the scientific study of the mind today. Functionalism is the idea that what matters for having a mind is not what kind of stuff you're made of or whether it's brain or behavior or what. What matters is that you have a structure that is wired up in the right kind of way to constitute a mind. What matters for having a mind is not what the thing is made of, but how you have various parts of the thing all connected to one another. Having a mind is a matter of having the right kind of circuit diagram the right kind of flowchart apply to you. If you've got the right kind of flowchart um, uh, organizing everything that you do, then you have a mind. Whether you're made of steel, um, whether you're made of um, whatever it is humans are made of, flesh and bone, um, or whether you're um, a large corporation, you can have a mind if you are organized in the right kind of way. As I said, the working hypothesis of scientific psychology for the last, uh, I guess, 60 years or so has been that the way to study the mind is to study the functional organization of your subjects, the ways they're wired up. So it's a very important idea, and in some ways it's the, mo it's the, it's the only game in town. But um, uh, it's full of problems. And we will spend most of our time looking at the problems for this idea, in particular problems to do with consciousness. Um, the idea that we have a conscious life, that we have feelings, stabs, throbs, yearnings, pangs, um, all these aspects of the mind don't seem to be a matter of just how you're wired up. They are very resistant to scientific study for that reason. And we'll spend quite a lot of time looking at how these problems are generated. If you say, though, that the conscious life is something different to the way that you're functionally organized, then there's a basic problem we have about how you can be free. Because your conscious life, that seems to be something that lifts off from your physical organization. But we live in a physical world. 
The physical organization of a person really determines what movements they make, how they behave, what actions they perform. The laws of physics govern your body just the same way they govern every other body in the universe. If your subjective life is not a matter of how you're wired up physically, then your subjective life, your conscious life, your mental life seems to have nothing to do with what happens. You are being driven about by your body and deliberating, planning, deciding what to do seems to be having no impact on the outcome because after all, at the end of the day, your body is just a collection of atoms being driven about by the laws of physics and any sense that there is something non-physical making an intervention in this has to be an illusion. So again, we'll look at this kind of problem under consciousness. We'll also look at problems about the self. Problems about what it is to be the same person over a long period of time. I mean, if someone has a, a problem that is going to become more and more um, real as time goes on, if someone has advanced Alzheimer's, they have no memory of their previous life. All that there is is the same body, but you can't get any glimmering of recognition. That person doesn't recognize the people around them. You can't even see the old person in this frame. Is that the same person? Should that have the same legal rights as the original person? If someone has a psychological disorder, it's a familiar and distressing fact that um, you know, a disease is usually something that um, a disease is usually something that a person has. It's the same person that has the tuberculosis that, you, that uh, used to be perfectly healthy. But if you've ever known someone who has a psychological disorder, um, a psychiatric disorder, then there comes a point where you get the sense this isn't a disease that this person has. This isn't a disease that my old friend Bill or Sally has. This is something that has gone deep into Bill or Sally and is affecting who they are. I don't even know that I'm dealing with Bill or Sally anymore. So these questions about identity uh, we'll spend quite a lot of time on in um, one uh, section of the course. And we'll also look at um, psychological explanation and how talking about people's thoughts can be said to explain what they do. So um, let's see. Um, I'm going to end um, earlier today than usual because, um, sorry, I should have said this earlier, but uh, it's very important that you um, get yourself into a section and coordinate, um, what's the word I want, bond with a GSI. Uh, and um, so uh, I'll stop about 20 minutes early today, so you have plenty of time to um, um, initiate the bonding process, right? Because uh, uh, <laughs> is that a fair description? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, but let's just look a bit about what we'll be doing in foundations when we're looking at dualism, behaviorism, and central state materialism. Um, uh, the first thing to look at is Descartes Meditations on First Philosophy. This is in the uh, Chalmers collection. It's 10 pages of the Chalmers collection. Just a quick word about the readings. All the readings you'll be getting will be pretty short. Like this is 10 pages. Some of them are six pages. Some of them are one page. Um, this is not actually to make life easy for you. Um, it's because these are usually quite dense readings. and. For many people, not all, I mean, I'm sure some of you will just shoot through it, but I never have. Um, I think the usual experience in reading one of these readings for the first time is you read the 10 pages or the 6 pages or whatever it is, and you think, I have no idea what this is about. Um, and at that point, you have an irresistible urge to sleep um, or, <laughs> or to do something else. Um, and so I, I, I want to kind of encourage you. The reason the readings are so brief is um, you have to have faith both in yourself that you can crack it and in the reading that it actually does make sense and that there is something there for you to crack. 
And please believe me that you will find, you, 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 will, you all got into UC, um, you're all perfectly capable of this, and the readings are fantastic. Um, um, the, the readings have been very carefully chosen. It's the very best stuff there is uh, in the readings. So have faith in the reading and have faith in yourself. The thing is, you read the 10 pages, and what you do then is you go back to the beginning and you start again, and then you do it again. And with these kind of readings, it's perfectly reasonable to spend a few hours just in one paragraph, just figuring out what is going on in a couple of paragraphs. Um, and you, you can do it. It is worth it. Um, have faith at this point, and uh, I won't ask you to have faith at about the three-week mark. If you see what I mean, at that point, you should be perf you'll be able to make your own judgment as to what's going on. Okay, so that's for, uh, if you can look at that, Descartes um, stuff for Monday, and then on Wednesday, we'll look at a paper by Ryle in the Chalmers 32, pages 32 to 39 of the Chalmers collection. So, let me just sit, try to say something briefly about how the problem of the mind comes up, um, how it's framed, and uh, why we're starting off with Descartes. Problems about the mind and the physical universe really come up sharply only in the 17th century. In the 17th century, we have mathematical physics being developed with Galileo and Newton. Um, and so, the implication of that is that for the first time with math mathematical physics, there's a sharp conception of what the physical is. And it's only once you know what the physical is that you can ask, well, what is the mind? Is it physical? Does that fit in? Um, before physics, it's possible to think that the medium-sized world, the world of tables and chairs and other people, the world that you see when you look around you, the buzzing, blooming world with its colors and smells, the fragrant, sensuous world of everyday experience. That's all just out there waiting for you to find out about it. What happens is that it's all just there, and then as a child, you develop your capacity to lock on to one or another aspect of this medium-sized world. And it's the same world that everybody else is locking on to. So you know that all your minds are pretty much in sync because you're all just exploring the same universe. Before physics, you can think that what's happening is that you, as the observer, are just taking on board, encompassing in your experience particular sectors of the medium-sized world. Mathematical physics blows all that up. It says, Consider what is really going on. When you look at a flower, you get the color and the smell. All that's really there, really there is a configuration of atoms, basic quantum mechanical forces. What's really there is something quite alien. If you think what physics tells you about the room that you're in at the moment, it is really something quite stark. It says that none of these familiar things are actually there. What is really there, if you could but see it, is an alien collection of fundamental forces, particles floating in the void. What's going on is that there are these configurations of atoms out there, and they are causing experiences in you. The colors and smells and tastes, they are not the fundamental forces in the universe. The colors and smells and tastes are just things that those fundamental particles generate in you. You project the colors and smells and tastes onto this array of fundamental particles, this array of atoms. But then at that point, you think, well, what's going on in the room right now is that all these fundamental particles are generating conscious experiences in you. They're generating conscious experiences in the other people in the room. But once you've got to that point, it's a question, are they generating the same experiences in me as they are in my neighbor? How would you know? All you ever get is the, the uh, color and smell and taste sensations of your own. What's being generated in your neighbor might be something unimaginably different to what's being generated in you. And in fact, how do you know that anything is being generated at all in the people around you? 
Maybe you are the only sentient person in the room. Maybe the rest are just collections of particles driven about by physics in pretty much the same way that your body is driven about by physics. So it looks just like the movements of your body look, but there's nothing there in sensation. Once you accept that mathematical physics is describing the way the world is, this problem is just automatically generated. There is no escaping it. So it's hard to draw the world as described by basic physics. But let's take this as an artist's impression. What physics is telling you is something pretty stark. This is all that's really there. Everything else is just a projection of consciousness. The world that physics describes doesn't have any room for colors and smells and tastes. It doesn't have any room for your friends, for your parents, for your lovers. It throws all that out. All that there are are the fundamental particles. But once you get to this point, you say there are just the fundamental particles and the projections that consciousness makes on to that structure of fundamental particles. Well, where does consciousness itself fit in? Consciousness itself doesn't seem to be a collection of particles. It doesn't seem to be mathematically describable. It doesn't seem to be made of atoms. It seems to pervade the atoms like a kind of gas, if you see what I mean, a kind of ectoplasm moving in and out of the particles that constitute the physical world. But what is it? There isn't any ectoplasm. Where does the mind itself fit in? This is where Descartes first takes the stage. The development of 17th century physics in the 17th century generates the basic problem we have today about where the mind fits into the physical world. And Descartes says, well, what's going on here is there are two kinds of stuff a moment ago I said, there's no such thing as ectoplasm. Descartes says, there you go too far. Actually, there is such a thing as ectoplasm. That's what your mind is made of. It's not physical. I've said a couple of times there's only one world and it's a physical world. Descartes says that's not right. Uh, there are two different kinds of stuff, the mental stuff and the physical stuff. And he has, in, in the section that um, I'm asking you if you can look at for Monday, he has three arguments for that view. One is your knowledge of your own existence, your knowledge that you have a mind, is much more certain than your knowledge of any physical thing could be. I mean, maybe you fell asleep shortly after getting, <laughs> I mean, hard to imagine, of course, but maybe you fell asleep in the first couple of minutes of the lecture, and um, the rest has all been a dream. Maybe it's a dream right now. Maybe all you've ever had is a dream. Maybe the whole physical world doesn't exist. It's just a kind of hallucination generated in you somehow. But the whole physical world is just an illusion. You can make sense of that. I mean, I'm not saying it's likely. Um, <laughs> don't be alarmed, um, but um, uh, it, it makes perfect sense. At the same time, even if it's all just a dream, even if it's all just hallucination, you still exist. You know of your own existence, of your mind's existence, with a complete certainty, even if the physical world all falls away as a hallucination. That's Descartes' first argument for saying the mind can't be physical. Anything physical might not exist, for all you know. But your mind definitely exists. You have a kind of certainty about the, your, the existence of your own mind. Um, his second argument is you can conceive of yourself existing without a body. I mean, you know how it is. You're in an argument. You've been humiliated. You think to yourself, they'll all be sorry when I'm gone. You imagine yourself floating above 
the, um, the sad, regretful faces of the people you know as they look at your body and they say, oh, we wish we'd treated um, him or her better. Um, we're sorry now as you float off into a disembodied state. I mean, <laughs> I'm not the only one who has that kind of thought sometimes. <laughs> I, you, you can imagine yourself without a body, but if you can really coherently imagine the mind lifting off from the body, then they can't be separate things. They must be, oh, sorry, they can't be the same thing. They must be separate things if you can imagine them lifting off from one another like that. Descartes' third argument is harder to um, pin down. I'll, I'll, try and, I'll talk some more about that on Monday. But his third argument is, matter's divisible. Whenever you've got a bit of matter, you can keep cutting it in half, keep cutting it in half. Um, but the self, the mind, isn't like that. Matter has a kind of divisibility that the mind does not. Therefore, they must be different things. The mind, there's a sense in which the mind is a unity. It all hangs together. Um, can I take just two more minutes? I, having set up Descartes' three arguments for um, uh, dualism, I want to just make a quick remark about what I think the problem is with dualism. I mean, the basic issue here is how could consciousness be generated by a bunch of particles? That really seems hard. The point I really want to get at here is not so much that um, there isn't any second kind of stuff, is that you don't actually explain anything by appealing to a non-physical stuff. <laughs> what I mean is, suppose that some intelligent Martians land on Earth. I mean, Martians are very, very smart. This is pretty generally known, I think. Um, and they find a TV, uh, and they look at the colored images being produced in the screen of the TV. And despite being very smart, they just can't figure it out. They can't quite get how the images are being generated, how the uh, uh, streams of electrons and so on are producing those images. So they puzzle about this. They have degree courses. They have late night talk shows devoted to the subject. Um, they are uh, uh, newspaper columnists opine about it. Um, but they, really, nobody's getting it. Um, and then someone says, I've cracked it. What's going on is. TVs are not fundamentally physical. TVs are made of a special TV stuff. It's that TV stuff that is making the brightly colored images. And people say, that's brilliant. <laughs> You've done it. That was the blind alley we were going up, trying to explain this as if it was physical. Um, and there's probably a career to be had out of, out of that kind of move. But really, you, you see that it doesn't help at all. Because the basic puzzle was, how can physical stuff be producing these colored images? Um, the, it's just as puzzling, how can TV stuff be producing these kind of images? I mean, what the hell, what is TV stuff? I mean, all you've done is make things more obscure and more difficult to understand than they were before. You haven't addressed the problem at all. Um, these basic questions are, what is TV stuff? How is it making those images? And what does TV stuff have to do with physical stuff? Um, so when someone says about the mind, um, uh, well, we're going to postulate a non-physical mental stuff. That generates all the sensations. That's the thing that you really have this specially certain knowledge of. You haven't helped a bit. It doesn't solve anything. You have less idea what this soul stuff is than you do what physical stuff is. With physical stuff, you at any rate know it's made of atoms and so on. With this other stuff, you have no idea what it's made of. And you actually have the very same problems. The problem is where your knowledge of your own existence is more certain than your knowledge of any physical thing. But your knowledge of your own existence is also more certain than your knowledge of the existence of any kind of ectoplasm. Um, I mean, suppose there is a kind of ectoplasm that you're made of. You could surely imagine 
Imagine I left the, you can imagine I left the old body behind. You could equally well imagine you left the old ectoplasm behind. Maybe you think I would lose my hang-ups if only I could discard it, my soul, like a shell and transfer to a new soul, a fresher, younger one. Um, <laughs> then uh, you are conceiving of the self as distinct from the ecto. All the same problems come up with ectoplasm as come up with physical stuff. Okay, so um, I, don't, I, I don't want to sabotage your reading of Descartes, um, but um, I, 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 <laughs> I, I do want you to be able to think about these issues as you're reading the Descartes. Okay, um, I'm going to go, but you don't go because it's very important to initiate bonding. Okay? <laughs> Come up, <on>, guys. <laughs> Hello, good afternoon. Let's start. Good afternoon, class. <laughs> um, okay, the, the note I ended on last time was that it's very difficult to see how the mind can be a physical thing and Descartes was probably the first person to articulate so clearly and forcefully the difficulties in um, uh, seeing how the mind could be physical, how the self could be physical. Um, what I said last time was that although it's very hard, uh, although I think he's right, that it is difficult to see how the mind can be physical, um, it doesn't really help to say, well then, it's made of some non-physical stuff. Whatever this non-physical stuff is, there really might be a non-physical stuff. I mean, we could discover that. There's the, there's the stuff that's made of atoms and so on. Um, but the stuff that's made of quite different particles, or maybe the stuff in the universe that isn't made of particles at all. But whatever that stuff is, is going to be equally difficult to see how it can be sustaining a mind. Um, so Descartes' move there doesn't really help. That was what I was suggesting last time, but what I want to do today is go through his three arguments for, um, three key arguments for saying that the self can't be a physical thing. Um, on Wednesday, uh, the reading will be um, Gilbert Ryle's uh, uh, piece Descartes' Myth, which is just six pages, I think. Oh no, it's a bit longer, nine pages of the Chalmers. Um, how many of you have looked at the Descartes? Good. How many of you found it difficult? Yeah, <laughs> okay, you're not alone. Um, uh, reading it again uh, uh, this morning, um, I, was really, I, I had actually forgotten how rich and complex um, the, the, the discussion is there. Uh, today I'm just going to pull out what I think are three key arguments from that text. But it's a text... Um, I think I, I was just calculating it is nearly 40 years since the first time I read that. Um, and it's, I still see things in it that I have never seen before. So um, uh, uh, although I'm going to pull out brutally what I think are some main lines of argument in it, um, there's much more in it. And especially as the course goes on and you go back to it, you will keep seeing more interesting ideas in that paper. Okay, um, so he has three key arguments, I say, in these selections. He says, first, your knowledge of your own existence is more certain than your knowledge of any physical or material thing. The second argument is, you can conceive of yourself without a body. Therefore, the body and the self must be separate things. And finally, matter is divisible, but the self is indivisible. The self is an indivisible unity. So let's just w w work over those three arguments for saying that the mind can't be physical. The idea is you have a kind of certainty about your own existence. This is this famous remark um, that I think I exist. That is a fundamental certainty. Um, you have a certainty about your own existence that's greater than the certainty you can have about the existence of any physical object. Um, the background point here is um, 
When you say, I am, I exist, anyone who says that has got to be right. I mean, people, <laughs> particularly at university, people challenge you the whole time about um, uh, things you believe. But whether you exist, someone takes you up on that one, you really are in a very strong position. Um, I mean, if they defeat you, if they leave you speechless, still you must be there, being defeated, being left speechless, wondering what's going on. Right? You still exist. Whenever you can so much as raise the question, what's going on, you know that you exist. So there's a really basic kind of certainty about that. In contrast, suppose that, as science tells us, the conscious experiences you have, the visual experiences you have, are caused by configurations of atoms, the physical stuff out there in the world. That's what we generally think is going on. There's all that physical stuff out there that causes me to have experiences. Um, and uh, I uh, hypothesize the existence of these causes on the basis of my experiences. Right, that's what's going on, that's what has to be going on. But if your experiences, if you suppose that your experiences are caused in that way, there are actually endlessly many different ways in which your experiences could also be being caused. If something has one cause, then there could, in principle, be other ways in which that very thing could be caused. Um, you might, for example, be plugged into, you might be a brain plugged into a giant computer um, in a nuclear wasteland. Um, all the experiences you have could be just the same, just a different cause. If your experiences can be caused by a configuration of atoms, they can be caused by practically anything. They could be being caused, Descartes' hypothesis, by an evil genius, a malign neuroscientist, a malign god, who's actually manipulating your nerve endings, making you have these experiences of being in a lecture theatre, um, looking at a screen, writing, in a, uh, writing notes. That's, everything would be just the same for you if that was what was going on. So when you say, um, uh, I know that the physical world exists, I know that these other people are here, I, I, I know what's going on, your certainty in that can't be as great as your certainty in your own existence. Because whichever of these hypotheses is true, this could be being caused by just about anything. The world could be radically different to the way you think it is. Um, you could be in a matrix style scenario uh, without realizing it. You could be a character in a computer game. Um, and uh, still, your experiences would be just the same, uh, although the cause is so different. But in all these scenarios, you still exist, and you know you exist. Physics is just one hypothesis among many about the possible causes of your sensations. So there's a certain uncertainty about your knowledge that the physical world exists that doesn't attach at all to your knowledge that you exist. And Descartes goes to some lengths to say, well, actually, we're familiar with the idea. It's an ordinary idea that your sensations could have non-standard causes. Um, perceptual illusions happen the whole time. I mean, there, there are an example, I've never seen this myself, but there's an example that goes back to the Greeks of um, the visual experience of a round tower being caused by the perception of a square tower. I have never... I've seen lots of towers, actually. I've never seen this happening. But anyway, this is a very common example. But um, giving them the benefit of the doubt, let's suppose that you've got a square tower in the distance um, that looks round to you. Then the sensation is being caused by something other than you think. But more than that, in ordinary dreams, your sensations are but creatures of the heat-oppressed brain. When you dream that... Um, your house is on fire or whatever it might be, that you're having these sensations, these perceptual experiences, but the causes are really non-standard. 
Madmen have experiences uh, that, are, that they take to be real. They're talking to people that just aren't there. So in illusions and dreams and madness, the cause of the experience is quite different to what the subject thinks it is. And Descartes sums this up by saying, what shall I now, what shall I now say that I am? You say, well, the existence of the physical is only provisional. That's only a hypothesis. That I exist isn't a hypothesis. That's a real bedrock certainty. So what are you? You know you exist, but what is it that you know exists in all these different scenarios? What shall I now say that I am when I am supposing that there is some supremely powerful and, if it is permissible to say, malicious deceiver? I mean, you note the caution there. If there really is an evil neuroscientist causing all your sensations and you're going to say is malicious, well, you better be courteous about it. Um, you, <laughs> you are in an extremely vulnerable situation. Um, but if you're supposing there is a supremely powerful and it's permissible to say malicious deceiver that's deliberately trying to trick you in every way he can, but you still know that you exist, then what is it that you know to exist? Can you say that you are something, that you are this great pianist, this fine athlete, the person with this body? Can you say that you possess even the most insignificant of attributes that um, he's just said belong to the nature of a body? The thing whose existence is known certainly by you is something that exists through all these different changes in scenario. Whether you're plugged into a computer, whether there's an evil genius tricking you, whether you're dreaming, whether the world is just the way you think it is. But this body, the body that you have, is not there through all these scenarios. Um, if um, any of these scenarios is correct, you don't have the body you think you do. This is just an avatar. So you can't be identical to the body. You know of your own existence, so certainly, but you don't know of the existence of this body, certainly. So you can't be that body. So what is it? Well, through all these different scenarios, the thing that is there is thought. You are thinking in all these scenarios. You are having thoughts about the world around you. So your essence, what you really fundamentally are, must be thought. That's Descartes' main conclusion. This, and this must be something non-physical. There's something, this is really a key idea in Descartes, and there's something really puzzling about it. Suppose you reflect right now on what you're thinking. Try it now. Shut your eyes. Look into your head. What am I thinking? <laughs> I mean, psychologists do studies of this kind of thing, and um, they find that there's a very low correlation between what the lecture is actually about and what people are thinking. But um, whatever it is, whatever stray thoughts or plans or appointments or whatever are going through your head, pin that down right now. Right? That's what he's saying. This is a mundane phenomenon. Right? It happens every day. You look in your head and you say, oh, I can't believe I just thought that. Well, it happens to me every day. <laughs> um, so you look inside your mind and you find a thought. But how could that, that very thought can't be identical to you? That can't be what he means, right? that particular thought. Um, what he means is something much more puzzling. Whatever the self is, it's got to be an object. It's got to be the object that has the thoughts. But when you look inside your mind right now, do you get the object? I mean, it's okay for me to say, look inside your mind right now and see what stray thoughts are going through it, what you're thinking. Look inside your mind right now and find the object there that is yourself, that is your soul. Can you put your hand up if you've managed to do that? Yeah, I share the difficulty. <laughs> that's really a hard thing to do, but that's, that's what he's saying. That there's something when you look inside that is really you. How could that be? 
All you get, or all I get, is the stray thoughts. You get the flotsam and jetsam of your stream of consciousness. But these are, that is just a torrent of individual thoughts, images, impressions. Anyway, that's his first argument. I'll come back to this point. Um, he has two other arguments. This is the first argument. Your knowledge of your own existence is more certain than your knowledge of any material thing. His second argument that um, the self can't be identical to a body is that um, you can imagine the self without a body. You can conceive of yourself without a body. Therefore, the body and the self must be separate. So here is what he says. The fact that I can clearly and distinctly understand one thing apart from another is enough to make me certain that the two things are distinct, since they are capable of being separated. This is, this is a little bit difficult, this argument. I mean, consider Lois Lane. It suddenly, actually, it just occurs to me, there may be a generation thing here. Do, do you guys know who Lois Lane is? Yeah. Okay, okay, <laughs> just checking. <laughs> right. um, uh, okay, anyway, suppose Lois is struck by the thought, um, could Clark, Clark, be Superman? Could that, could that really be what's going on? And then she reads Descartes. <laughs> and Descartes says, I can clearly and distinctly understand one thing apart from another. Then that's enough to make me certain that the two things are distinct. And she thinks, well, wait a minute. I know all about Clark, right? I know about his boring habits. I know all about Superman and his wonderful feats. So I can clearly and distinctly understand one thing apart from the other. Therefore, the two things are distinct. He's not Superman. That would be the wrong conclusion, if, if I remember the story. But, <laughs> right? So if you follow Descartes' logic here, it seems to give the wrong result in that case. Um, I mean, he's arguing, I can imagine the mind apart from the body. Therefore, like Superman and Clark, the mind and the body must be different things. But maybe that's not what's going on. Maybe, uh, maybe you've just got two different ways of thinking about the same thing. What he's saying here is something, I think to make this come, work, to see what he has in mind here, you've got to say that clear and distinct has got a lot of weight going on it. I mean, if you think about Lois and Superman, she's got to be, she would have to be thinking, the way this would work is, um, if I can know everything there is to know about Clark without knowing anything about Superman, and if I can know everything there is to know about Superman without knowing that he's Clark, then they'd be different. That would follow that they're different. I mean, if I kept tabs on Clark every moment of the day, um, and kept tabs of Superman every moment of the day, and, I could, and they were clearly distinct throughout the whole thing, then that would prove that they were different. But um, um, it's clear and distinct here, it's the idea that you see the whole thing. So if you can grasp the whole nature of the mind without thinking about the body, and if you can grasp the whole nature of the body without thinking about the mind, that would be enough to show that they're distinct. Something like that is, must be what he's after. Clear and distinct there. Um, it's kind of a technical term. So the argument is, you can imagine the whole material world was just an illusion. But the whole story about your mind would still be the same. Imagine that you were born in a vat. Imagine that you're a brain born in a vat. Um, provided with images of your loving parents, your mischievous brother, or, 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 all that, your hamster, or, all that stuff. That was all just an illusion. Um, you can still tell the whole story about your mind. You can trace the whole story about the development of your mind throughout all that. Your, the totality of your mental states would still exist. 
And similarly, you can imagine something that was just like you, only there wasn't a mind attached. There could be a zombie. Something, I mean, this is a familiar idea, right? Your neighbor might be one of the undead. Um, could be just biology, just driven by the laws of physics, driven around as a collection of particles with no mind associated. So you can really conceive of the whole stories of these two things being different. Um, the body and the consciousness. I might consider, here is Descartes uh, with the zombie hypothesis, I might consider the body of a man as a kind of machine equipped with and made up of bones, nerves, muscles, veins, blood and skin in such a way that even if there were no mind in it, it would still perform all the same movements as it now does in those cases where movement is not under control of the will, just driven about by physics and consequently not under the control of the mind. That could be happening, that could be going on right now. So since you can conceive of mind and body coming apart, they must be different things. That's the second argument. It's possible for mind and body to come apart, therefore they must be different. So again, that seems like a forceful argument. So I said there were three arguments. Your knowledge of your own existence is more certain than your knowledge of any material thing. Uh, you can conceive of yourself without a body, so the body and the self must be separate. And the third argument, I said that's the hardest. The third argument is matter's divisible, but the self is indivisible. We'll actually spend some time in this a little bit later in the term when we look at um, work on brain bisection in humans. Um, but let me just say, make a brief remark about this argument right now. Um, the body is by its very nature always divisible, while the mind is utterly indivisible. Well, what's the sense in which the mind is indivisible? Think of it like this. Suppose you're aware of one thing and you're aware of another thing. You can always compare the two of them. Suppose you have a pain in your foot and a pain in your tooth and your sympathetic friend says, which one is worse, the pain in the foot or the pain in the tooth? Then if you have both pains, you must be able to give some answer to that question. It couldn't be right to say, I can't possibly compare them. I'm aware of them in quite different ways. There's some sense in which your mind is a unified perspective. You have a single experiential perspective on the world. And every experience you have all comes into that single perspective. So any two things that come in to your experienced perspective on the world can be compared by you. They can, you can say, this one's more intense, this one's going faster. Um, they are drawn in to a single unity. Or you might think there's a pattern here. The pain in my uh, tooth is pulsating, but the um, pain in my uh, foot is going very, very slowly. More of a throb, really, than a pulse. Um, anyway, um, it doesn't make sense to say, with one part of my mind, I'm aware of A. With another part of my mind, I'm aware of B. If your mind had components, if your mind was made up of modules, then you should be able to um, be aware of A with one bit and be aware of B with another bit, um, but not be able to compare them, not draw them together. That doesn't seem to make much sense. I mean, if two things are both in your mind, you can compare them. You can survey the contents of your mind. But it's different with the brain it's different with any biological system. Any biological system is made up of components. And it's not going to have that kind of unity. It makes perfect sense to say, with one part of my brain, I'm responding to A. 
with a different part of my brain I'm responding to B, but there might not be any monitoring station in the brain that is in a position to compare A and B. The brain is not a unity in the sense in which the mind is a unity. Okay, that's rather brief. I hope that's not too mystifying about um, that third argument. As I say, it's a difficult argument. We will come back to it. The general point, I think, of that third argument is we can't explain the unity that the mind has the way the mind all hangs together as a single perspective in the world, we can't explain that in biological terms. So that's the three arguments. Knowledge of your existence is more certain than knowledge of any material thing. Knowledge you can conceive of the self without a body, so body and the self are separate, and matter is divisible, but the self has a unity, is indivisible. Actually, before I go on to discuss these arguments, are there any comments at this point? Uh, I, 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 uh, okay, one, two. Uh, the mind and soul? I, as I'm using it, mind and soul are the same thing. I think Descartes uses them interchangeably. Um, I mean, soul, I, I guess, has kind of um, religious connotations n nowadays, but um, for our purposes, the, these are not to the point. Yeah, they were very much to the point for Descartes, but not for us. Yeah. Okay, so mind and soul, same thing in this discussion. Yeah. Yeah. So what does Descartes have to say about multiple personality disorder? Uh, well, multiple personality disorder, I think, was not identified until the uh, 19th century. Um, so <laughs> you, you have an advantage over him at that point. Um, but... Um, Well, what should he say? I mean, what he has to say is that the multiple personalities, whatever they are, are not physical. Right? That's very clear. Yeah, that's all right? Oh, you, oh, you mean in terms of the indivisibility argument? Okay, okay. Uh, uh, in terms of the segmentation of the mind. Okay, well, if you have a true multiple personality case in which there are many different personalities connected to the same body, yeah, then how many minds do you have? Do you have a single fragmented mind here? The thing is, that seems to make no sense. It's in the very name we give it. If it's not unified, then it's many. And each of the personalities is in itself unified. That's the way we, we actually talk about these cases. Yeah? We, we, we say that unity goes along with um, having a single mind. If there isn't unity, then there must be more than one mind. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, one, two. Uh, how, well, he, it was only a very... Did, did, did you catch that? How could he say that um, God was a malicious deceiver and not go to jail? Um, I'm not really um, all that well versed on church politics at the time, but um, I think if you look at the passages, he is extremely circumspect um, in that provisional hypothesis. And um, the whole point of what he's doing, actually, in these passages is to establish the existence and benevolence of God. Um, and uh, uh, there isn't really any threat here. There's only a very circumspect um, mention of an alternative hypothesis as one that he's going to explain what's wrong with it. Yeah. Uh, one, two. Yeah. That's exactly right. He considered the brain a physical object and the mind not. Yeah, yes, I mean, that, 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 uh, that, that, that is the whole point. It's an exercise you go through, a discipline of the mind. Yeah. But it's not a... It's not a the, 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 he's not trying to establish that you actually are being tricked by a malicious demon. He's bringing out the implications of the fact that you can entertain this possibility. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep.
Yes. That's right. Well, uh, for, for it to really be a soul that you were seeing when you looked inwards to your mind, well, it's actually very hard to know quite what you'd have to encounter, but it would have to be a unity that is the thing that is doing all the experiencing. But... Uh, well, you, you, it really is worth thinking this through. Uh, how it's, in fact, what I'm going to do in a moment is just try uh, to do some of the thinking of this, this through. Um, if you think of it uh, looking inwards in your own mind with the mind's eye and thinking what it would mean to see the self with the mind's eye, there would have to be an object there, not just one of the thoughts this object is having, but the object there that has all the thoughts. Yep. Um, and that object, it would be like a kind of tinnitus or something, you know, a ringing in your ear that accompanies you constantly. And whenever you think, am I still around? You kind of look inwards and say, yes, that's me, still here. Um, and th there's something slightly crazy about that, because when you think about it, the one who's viewing that object is you, right? The, <laughs> if it's something that you view, then it isn't actually you. You're the one that does the viewing. If you can bring it into view, then it's not you. You, you see what I mean? Um, you're the one that looks at stuff. It, there can't be such a thing as looking at that and identifying it in your mind as the one that is doing all the looking. Yeah? Um, so what Descartes is after here, I think it really can't be had, that idea that you can look inwardly to your mind and detect there the essential self. He has to be thinking of it like this, that this, what you encounter when you look into your mind are the thoughts, the actual stream of consciousness. Um, but this is the question you just raised, right? Are you really aware of a self when you look inward, rather than just a lot of particular thoughts? Well, the thing is, the self, the thing that is having all the thoughts, that's not something you encounter when you look into experience, when you look in your, into your own mind. All you encounter are the particular thoughts. The self is shimmering out there beyond any access you have to it. The self, the soul, just becomes a hypothesized object that you say, well, there must be something out there that's doing all that thinking. Yep? Yes, you can ask yourself about your desires. That's right. You, you can interrogate the self. You can say, what do I really want? Am I really happy? Am I really truly happy? Am I happy the way I want it to be? Um, you can raise those questions, you, you know, at 3 a.m. or whenever when you uh, search your heart. Um, and you can say, look, now I'm finding out about the nature of this object, the soul, the self. But the self is not... It, the, thing, the self is not itself any one of those states, any one of those thoughts, any one of those feelings. Um, here's a hypothesis that Kant uh, set out. He said, look, suppose, you ha suppose there are souls. Suppose you've got this uh, collection of thoughts, this stream of experiences and feelings and pangs and so on. You've got that. And suppose that there are souls there are things that have those thoughts. But suppose that each soul only lasts for just a few milliseconds. Suppose they're very short-lived. But that 
each soul, as it goes out of existence, um, passes on all the thoughts and experiences and feelings to the next one. So um, what is going on is a kind of scenario like this. Here are all the souls. You see them? Soul one, soul two, soul three, soul four, soul five. You don't actually usually, this is the whole point, you don't actually usually get a good look at them. But this is kind of an artist's impression of what the souls would look like, right? The things that are there underneath the river of consciousness doing all the thinking. And suppose that each one um, is sustaining a particular collection of thoughts. And as it bumps into the next one and goes out of existence, it passes on all those thoughts. Well, everything would be just the same for you as it is now. Suppose that over the course of your life, there wasn't a single soul there, but just thousands upon thousands of them, each passing on the string of experiences and consciousness, conscious states to the next one, then everything would be just for you the way it is now. Um, so if you say, well, there's just one soul, I've got, I've got, I, 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 I've got just one soul, no, no question about that. It doesn't matter. It doesn't explain anything. There might be thousands of them. There might not be anything there. All that's really there are all these particular thoughts and experiences. Or you might suppose at any one time, there isn't just one soul having all those thoughts and experiences. There are thousands. So that when I speak to you right now, what's happening is that a thousand souls are acting in concert to generate these golden words. Um, that's what it takes, right? Um, uh, 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 everything would be just the same. That's a way of bringing out that the hypothesis of the soul doesn't do any work. We've got this really puzzling phenomenon, the mind. We've got this problem. How can um, that be physical? And then you say, well, actually, it's not physical. There's a soul. And you say, but how does the soul work? And you find that it doesn't do any good at all to say there's a single soul having all this. It, oh, the, the datum, the fact, is a string of thoughts and experiences and the physical body. And the only puzzle, really, is to understand how they fit together. Supposing that the hypothesis of the soul doesn't really explain anything. I want to end, though, with um, a remark about why dualism was such a good thing in intellectual history. Um, I said that um, in, in, on Friday that it's in the 17th century that you first get the conception of the physical. You first get an explicit conception of what the physical is so that you can even give a clear sense to the question, is the mind physical? Um, here's the way people used to think of the puzzle of vision. People knew about the, I mean, since the Greeks, people had the idea that the eye is a lens and that um, what happens in vision is that there's an image formed on the back of the retina. Um, and when you uh, think about what the image, what, what, how by the laws of optics the image formed on the back of the retina um, uh, is going to be generated, the image is going to be upside down on the back of the retina. Um, so then, um, for centuries really, people were cutting up um, cadavers, people were um, looking at uh, brains and um, trying to find out how the visual system in the brain worked. What happens? after the eye. And the central problem for centuries and centuries was this. This is Leonardo da Vinci writing about it. He said, the pupil of the eye, which gets through a very small hole, the images of the bodies situated beyond the said little hole, always gets those images upside down. But always, and this is the critical thing in everyday experience, the visual power, you see everything the right way around. How does that happen? So for centuries, what people were looking for was 
the path, the point in the brain at which the image gets flipped round the right way. That was a central problem, that when they cut up um, um, brains, they were looking for the point in um, uh, brain biology where you get an upright visual image. And they were completely unsuccessful. This is what they were looking for, this bit here, where um, uh, the thing gets flipped round the right way. But of course, there's no such thing. Um, Here's Leonardo again. This happens because the visual power, seeing everything round the right way, this happens because the said images pass through the center of the crystalline sphere situated in the middle of the eye. Um, in the center, they converge in one point, then they spread out over the opposed surfaces of the sphere without bending. And over the said surface, the images are flipped. They become upright like the object from which they came. Now, when you think about what is going wrong here, I take it as kind of obvious that something is going badly wrong here. Can you put your hand up if it's kind of obvious that something is going badly wrong here? Okay. <laughs> we have to drag you guys out of the Middle Ages. Um, something is going badly wrong here because um, it's not as if there is a person deep in your brain viewing the images, right? You can, you're seeing everything around the right way. It's just a quite different phenomenon from the generation of a, bio, a bit of biology in the brain. The great advance of dualism was to say, look, these questions about how the mind works are quite different from questions about the biology of the brain. Um, if you're hearing a glorious symphony, there doesn't have to be some bit in your brain where there's a small radio playing the symphony. You see what I mean? It's not as if you, I mean, someone who um, said, well, I'm really interested in the biology of hearing, so I'm looking for the small radio in the brain. Um, then you could really spend a lot of time doing that. I mean, brain biology is very complicated, and you might think, oh, is this it? Is that, is that the radio? Um, but it's a bad question. When you want to understand what the experience of hearing is, is not related in that direct way to the biology. We have to make a sharp distinction between the biological and the psychological questions. What was going wrong in Leonardo da Vinci's um, uh, way of approaching the biology of the brain was that he hadn't sharply distinguished um, the biological question from the question about conscious experience. And uh, Descartes, move was a great advance because he said, look, um, do the biology and forget about that stuff about the visual power with its tiny radio or um, um, upright image or whatever. Just forget that stuff. That all relates to the soul. As you'll see next time, what Ryle is arguing is really that Descartes was right about that, to make a sharp separation between the questions about the mind and the questions about biology, but that he wasn't radical enough. He's still thinking of the mind as a piece of the clockwork that underlies behavior, only it's a piece of kind of ghostly clockwork. It's a kind of bit of ectoplasm that's driving the thing around, not now more physical stuff driving the thing around. And um, uh, Ryle's analysis, and actually I think the common analysis today, is that this is not radical enough. You shouldn't be thinking of the mind as a piece of the clockwork like that at all. Okay. Uh, I, I'm ending just a couple of minutes early, but I think that's the, unless there are any questions, that's the end of the message for today. And I'll see you on Wednesday. Wednesday. Okay. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, let's start. Um, so today, uh, we're still in foundations. Um, we've just had a look at Descartes' dualism, and today we're going to look at behaviorist views of the nature of the mind. And I'll try and set out why behaviorist views can seem like a good thing. There is, there is something right about all of the views we're discussing, even though I think um, 
none of these three views can really in the end be, be the whole story, but there's certainly something right and important about all of them. Uh, so I'll try and bring out today what I think is right about behaviorism. Um, and we're looking at uh, the selection from Gilbert Ryle called Descartes' Myth in the Chalmers Collection. For Friday, uh, we look at Putnam's Brains and Behavior article. That's about nine, uh, nine pages in the, um, again, in the Chalmers Collection. Okay. Um, okay. So I want to start out, and really the theme today I want to think about is um, how you have knowledge of your own mind and how you have knowledge of other people's minds. I mean, do you know about what's going on in your own mind in a way that's different to the way in which you know about what's going on in someone else's mind? How do you know what's going on in your own mind anyhow? How do you know what's going on in someone else's mind? Maybe you can't. People often say that, right? You can't really know what someone else is thinking. Um, there's some way of, I don't know, rolling your eyes back in your head, taking a look inwardly. We all did this as a class exercise last time when I said, what are you thinking about right now? What thoughts are going through your head right now? And you kind of roll your eyes sideways and um, <laughs> look at what's in there. Yeah, that, that's it. Um, uh, okay, um, I, and I want to look at Ryle's idea of a category mistake, explain what that is and how it relates to behaviorism, and his central idea, mental states aren't causes of behavior. That's really Ryle's signature point, mental states are not what cause behavior. When you're looking at the causes of behavior, you're talking about stuff that goes on in the brain, the physiology. The causes of behavior are not the mental states. And then I'll give one classic formulation of behaviorism, of Carnap's attempt to give a, a behaviorist definition of a psychological state. Okay, so what are the mental states? I mean, can I just ask right now, how, how many of you straight off would say you have knowledge of your own mind in a way that's different to your knowledge of someone else's mind? Can you put your hand up, just, just so I know? <laughs> You put your hand up if that seems plain enough. Wait a minute, a lot of hands went up and then some went down. And then some <laughs> okay, 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 that's very interesting. So, most, but uh, certainly not all. Okay. Um, well, what are your own psychological states? There are lots of different psychological states. Your mind has many mansions. Um, there are all your emotions. Um, you can be afraid, you can feel happiness or depression. But you're not, it's not always true that you know when you're afraid. I mean, I say to you, you know, some um, terrifying individual looms before us in a dark alley, and I say to you, I'm not, I'm not afraid. I mean, I'm not afraid. Um, and, you know, I shake and I quake and um, I beat a hasty retreat. Uh, you, you might really be mistaken about whether you're afraid. I read the other day someone saying, about a time that they had in their lives years before. She said, um, we were happy then, uh, now that I look back. We didn't think so at the time, but that was really probably the happiest time, that one. You can be happy, but not know about it. When I was in Bulgaria, someone said to me, um, under the Soviets, the whole nation was depressed, but we didn't realize we were depressed. <laughs> it was only after they left that we realized we were depressed, and that was even worse. Um, uh, and actually, a friend of mine a little while ago was diagnosed with clinical depression. And um, the person who gave him the diagnosis said, um, you have likely been clinically depressed for at least five years. It had never occurred to him, or it had never occurred to me, that he was actually clinically depressed. I wouldn't have said he was merry, but... Um, uh, uh, depression can be hard to pinpoint. Your knowledge of your own emotions is not all that uh, uh, reliable. And um, sometimes it seems like you have knowledge of your own emotions in pretty much the same way as you have knowledge of other people's emotions. And you find out that you're depressed 
by noting your own lethargy. You find out that you're happy by thinking about the way that you behaved and what was, what was going on in your life then, which is pretty much the same way you find out about someone else's happiness. Well, you might say, well, that's all right for uh, emotions, but what about pains? What about, um, surely, if I've got a pain, if I've got a stabbing pain, or if I've got a tickle in my foot, I know about that. I, do, you know, I know about that really immediately. Um, and uh, someone else's pain, I only have to infer that they're in pain from the way they're behaving, right? I don't have to see myself hopping about and yelling and say, oh, I think I must be in pain. Um, you, you, you see what I mean? You, 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 just, um, <laughs> well, you just know straight off. Have you got a headache? Well, whether someone else has a headache, you can only know about because they tell you or they give some sign. Whether you have a headache, well, um, you just have to check. You, know, you, you don't really have to look to see what you're doing to know whether you've got a headache. But even there, um, it, it's not that straightforward. Um, I mean, suppose you've got a headache and um, you come into a really gripping and absorbing lecture. And um, during the lecture, you just completely forget about your headache. That, that can happen, right? Well, <laughs> make, make it a movie. <laughs> um, you, you go to a movie, and the movie is just really, it just picks you off your feet. Um, you forget about the headache after the movie. Um, uh, the, the headache's there. But presumably, the headache was there the whole time. You just didn't notice it. I mean, there are these cases of, um, Football players uh, with broken arms who carry on. They don't realize until someone tells them your arm doesn't look right at all. Um, uh, presumably, you can't break your arm without having pain. But who are very focused in the game or soldiers in the battlefield. There are all these stories of um, soldiers with just terrible injuries who carry on because they, they, they are trying to survive. And they don't realize they're in pain. That can happen. Um, what are you, what you're thinking? Yeah, if I ask you what you're thinking, you know that. That's tough, right? <laughs> Presumably you know what you're thinking in a way that someone else uh, doesn't. You know, I can keep my thoughts secret. You can, go into, you can go to your meeting with someone saying, I have a secret agenda and they mustn't guess, and that'd be all right. Um, your beliefs, you can believe, it, it, your friend can say to you, you don't think that doctors are to be trusted. That's the trouble with you. You don't believe in doctors. Um, and you might never have thought of that. But it's true. You think about it. You think, well, I guess I don't actually trust doctors. Or what about things like how kind or generous you are? Someone's interviewing you, and, uh, uh, and you, they, they say to you, tell me a bit about yourself. And you say, well, um, I'm kind, generous, brave, um, loyal. And um, anyone who knows you, might say, there is not a word of truth in any of that. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is a deceitful cheat who um, would never give a penny to anyone uh, uh, they didn't do it to. Um, well, you can be quite sincere, but be mistaken about what virtues you have. Or whether you're shy. Um, the most implausible people one of the greatest um, oily exhibitionists I know was telling me the other day that he's really very shy. Um, and this is someone who, um, whenever he's in public, just glows with delight, um, <laughs> visibly glows with delight at it. Um, so in all these cases of states of your mind, it's not actually as if you can just look inward and tell what's going on every time. You're always open to make mistakes. You, you can always have to look and check. Um, and when you think about knowledge of someone else's mental states, if you have a friend you know well, if you have someone in your family you've known for years, then you can have very good knowledge of their emotions, sensations, thoughts, beliefs, and so on. I mean, um, Someone in your family might have better knowledge of your emotions than you do yourself. You say, jealous? I'm not jealous. They say, you are jealous, you know. Um, and, but you're quite sincere. You say, I'm not jealous. But there you are at 3 AM, sitting in a parked car, saying, well, I was just passing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is not autobiographical. 
Um, <laughs> so when you think about these cases, um, it looks like, isn't, isn't this what's going on? Um, when you think about uh, the way, say, political theorists uh, learn their subject, most people specialize in one country or a, a bunch of countries. So you get someone who's a specialist on Egypt or a specialist on France, say, and um, this person really knows a whole lot about France and typically they will know quite a bit about the politics of other countries, but this is the one they really know about. Now it's like that with people. You make a specialist study of some people, you know, there are going to be a whole bunch of people you know about their minds in, um, to varying degrees. But some people, your best friends, your worst enemies, you really make a special study of. You really want to know what's going on there. Um, and uh, think about your own case. I mean, are you a specialist on yourself? Well, hell yes. You know, you've been around yourself since you were born, right? <laughs> Now, in the case of um, someone in your family, someone that you've known for years and years and years, the slightest thing that they do can tip you off as to how they are feeling. In the morning, you hear just the way the floorboards creak as they um, walk into the room, and you know immediately what's going on. You get mad in, the f in a heartbeat um, when you just hear that they're in that mood again. Um, that can happen, right? You can be really so tuned to how someone is. Well, in your own case, you might be finding out about how your own mental life is in just the same way you find out about how other people's mental lives are. Um, it's just that since you are such an expert on yourself, really it takes very, very little to tip you off as to what's going on with you. So you could argue, I mean, some people have argued that you know about your own mental states in exactly the same way as you know about the mental states of other people. You know about the mental states of other people basically from their behavior. You know about your own states basically from your behavior. But um, um, it's just that in your own case, you are such an expert and so fast and precise in your judgments, that you, we think there's a kind of inward introspection you're doing that is quite different to what's going on with other people. Can I just ask you, have, have I persuaded you that um, uh, quite likely you do know about what's going on in your own mind in pretty much the same way as you know about what's going on in other people's minds? Can I just ask you the same question I asked you at the beginning? How many people think there's really a difference between um, how you know about your own mind and how you know about someone else's mind. Can you put your hand up if you think there's a big difference? I see. <laughs> so much for all that rhetoric. Well, <laughs> um, according to uh, Ryle, that view of Descartes, uh, that, that view about introspection, that there is some special faculty of introspection by which you know about your own mind, but you don't know about someone else's mind, um, that's part of Descartes' myth. That's really where Descartes is getting things wrong on the point where you guys agree with him. Um, here's Ryle explaining what Descartes' view is. Not only can a person view and scrutinize a flower through his sense of sight and listen to and discriminate the notes of a bell through his sense of hearing, he can also reflectively or introspectively watch without any bodily organ of sense the current episodes of his inner life. That's what you guys think, right? There's that capacity for reflective or introspective watching. When you turn in in your stream of consciousness, I'm not saying you're wrong actually, um, but th that's the view that you can turn in and watch the current stream of consciousness the flotsam and jetsam that is bobbing along um, in, in your current life. This self-observation is commonly supposed to be immune from illusion or confusion or doubt, unlike your sense perception, where you can't have illusions or you can be dreaming or whatever. If you turn introspection inwards, you always get it right. On the other side, 
you, are, you don't have that kind of access to anyone else's mental life. Um, on the other side, you don't have any direct access to the events of the inner life of another. And here's Ryle's melancholy conclusion. Absolute solitude is, on this showing, the ineluctable destiny of the soul. Only our bodies can meet. Okay. That's Ryle expounding the notion of introspection. Are there any questions about that before we go on? Okay. Oh, uh, yep. Are you saying that um, there isn't a different process by which you know someone else's mind compared to your own? Th that's, what I was th that's what I began by saying. Yeah, I began by trying to make the case for, for that view. Um, but you guys reject that, that there is no difference between the way in which you know about your own mental states and other people's mental states. And I think, I actually think that is right. That, that there must be a difference. Yeah. So if you ask me what I think, um, I think there has got to be a difference between the way in which you know about your own mental life and the way in which you know about other people's mental lives. I think for the reasons I was giving, talking about depression or jealousy or um, happiness or whatever, you ha it, it's not a simple thing. Um, knowing about your own mental life is a difficult thing. Um, so it's not that you really just turn your eye inwards and have a quick scan and you know exactly what's going on. That really is a bad picture. You know, that's not right, I don't think. Um, but it, it just pushes it too far to say, so your knowledge of your own mental life is just the same as your knowledge of someone else's mental life. Um, there's got to be a difference. I, I just agree with you guys on that one. Um, yeah. But some quite serious people, some distinguished psychologists at this university have argued that um, there isn't really any difference in pretty much the way I just did. Yeah. So it's, it's not, I don't think it's a daft to you at all. Yeah. It could be the same in that I don't really, I don't, might not fully know myself or fully know yourself, but the way that I try and understand myself is different from the way I try to understand myself. That's very good. I think that's exactly um, the, the, the right picture. Um, uh, that um, is not all that full or complete or necessarily accurate, either in the case of my, my knowledge of my own mind or in the case of knowledge of someone else's mind. Still, the way you have knowledge of your own mind seems to be quite different to the way you have knowledge of someone else's mind. Yeah, I think that is the right answer. Yeah, I mean, it's open to dispute. Yeah, but I th myself, I think that is the right answer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Quick one. Yeah. You're more sure of your own emotions, even if the process is... I, I, it depends on the case, really. I, I mean, I really do think that in, the, in cases like being happy or depressed, um, someone else can have more insight into your life than you can yourself. You know, that's why, um, that, that, that's why close friends have all these midnight discussions about their mental, <laughs> about their emotional lives, right? Because it's, it's not just a... A stupid thing to do that, to have a long discussion about your emotional life, because talking to someone really can me mean that they provide more insight into what is going on with you than you have yourself. That is one reason people have therapists. Yeah, I mean, you wouldn't do that if you thought, well, actually, I, I know better what is going on with me than anyone else. You know, therapy, if that was really, if everyone really thought that, then therapists would, you know, you would pretty much um, generally be out of a job. Yeah? OK. OK. Um, let, let, let's go on to talk about, to, to look at Ryle's notion of a category mistake. I want to um, uh, begin, though, with an example that I think brings out what is right about behaviorism. Um, um, let me, um, sometimes when you're doing arithmetic, like if I say to you, what do you get if you add seven, seven and five? Seven and five? Very good. Um, what do you get if you add 63 and 83? What do you get if you add a million and forty-three to a million nine thousand four hundred and eighty-six? Okay, sometimes it gets too hard, right? You can't do it in your head, as we say, and then 
you, there's no choice. You just have to, you, you say, I can't do that in my head. I need to do this out loud. So let me give you an example. Um, so I want to just take the screen up for a second. Um, I was thinking about long division. Um, I was never very good at long division, and it's actually quite a long, it's years actually since I have done any long division. Um, but um, give me a hard long division. So with long division, you've got two numbers. You've got the number you divide into. Uh, if you see, the, the, there's a number that's getting divided and the number that does the dividing. I, I, I don't really have the technical vocabulary to explain this correctly, but um, it, g give me a difficult number. Someone? 7,833. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm, I'll divide into that. Um, 49. 49, very good. Okay. Okay. So can you see what I'm doing? OK, so it goes, that, I, I couldn't do that in my head, right? So I have to do this out loud. So um, if I'm going to divide 49 into 78, then uh, 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 that only goes once. <laughs> but <laughs> isn't that right? And then I go 49, and I say 9 from 8, 9 from 8 is 9, and uh, 5, 5 from 7 is 2. And I take down three, and um, uh, 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 I think that, that must be um, four, five. It must be five. I think it's five. Five. So that's five nines are 45, and uh, five fours are 20, and four, 24. Oh, boy. Uh, eight. There are not many classes you get to see this kind of thing. Um, eight, uh, four, uh, and three. Oh, dear me. And this is nine, right? Okay, so we'll just call it a day there and we won't go <laughs> any further. Um, but look, um, the, the, the point is, for better or worse, what you saw there was me thinking. I mean... <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't say you saw me at my best. You, you, you should see the, some of the stuff I really can do. Um, but if, if I made a mistake, if I hesitated, if I got it right, you saw exactly what was going on. Right? Now, the important point is, I was not doing the calculation in my head and then just writing it down. Because if I'd been able to do it in my head, I wouldn't have needed to write it down. You see what I mean? I'm not, I, I could just about manage it, um, doing, it out, do, 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 doing it with the chalk. Um, I couldn't have done that in my head at all. So there was, <laughs> I mean, you might say you wouldn't call that thinking, would you? But um, it was thinking. Um, but the thinking was all going, out, going on completely in public. It was completely open to your view everything that I thought there. Um, so it w it's just a mistake to suppose that, oops, I blushed. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> we'll be back on the air in a second. Uh, it's just a mistake to suppose that um, thinking is something that always goes on in secret in your head. And in a way that's perfectly um, commonplace. You know, when you say, well, I was thinking out loud. That's exactly right. That's what goes on. Um, in an ordinary conversation, it, you know, it can happen if it's a very important conversation that you've been preparing for. It can happen that you've got a plan, you've got an agenda, what's going to happen in this conversation. And um, uh, everything you say, you think about beforehand. That can happen, but it's very unusual. I mean, you're talking to me, I promise you that's not what's going on. The whole thing is out there. Yeah? So thinking is something that happens in public as, as much as in private. Um, I mean, it wouldn't be a bad working definition of thinking to say, thinking is manipulating with symbols. Um, and the symbols that you're manipulating, sometimes they're deep in your head. That's right, that can happen. But very often, as in long division, the symbols you're manipulating are all out there on show in public. 
So the mental act of thinking, in that case, is actually also behavior. It's not what's causing the behavior, it is the behavior. The thinking was the behavior in that case. It's just that sometimes you do this in private. So that you can do one and the same act of thinking privately. You can say, I'm going to do this in secret. No one's going to know what I'm thinking. Or you can do the very same act of thinking out front, out in public, as an act of manifest behavior that anyone can observe just as well as you can. That's what seems to me right about behaviorism. And it's an important point that doesn't apply only to thinking. I'll come on to that in a second. But people often suppose, no, the thinking, that's got to be in your head. Any mental state can't be the same thing as behavior. It's got to be deep in your head, the kind of secret um, driver, the organizer of all the behavior. Ryle's point about that is, it's just a mistake. The mind is not what organizes your behavior. The mind just is, having a mind just is a matter of exhibiting organized behavior. Um, he's got this example. Um, well, actually, let, let me come back to these points. Um, he's got this example showing someone around the university. So a friend of yours visits and says, um, I want to see this great university you're at. And you show them around, you, have them a, you give them a look. You say, this is Wheeler Hall, site of the famous demonstrations. Um, this is where the protesters dangled by their heels. This is where the police lined up. Um, here it all is. Here is um, the Campanile, the merry throng at Sather Gate. Um, uh, uh, the industrious students, faculty, sound asleep in the libraries. Um, there is um, uh, <laughs> the... Uh, the austere and dignified figure of um, uh, 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 Oski, there is a gate. You say, look, look at all this stuff. And um, your friend says, that's all just fantastic. But where is the university? And you say, well, wait a minute. Um, I've shown you all this stuff, and I can't really say that the Campanile is the university, or that the library is the university, or that Oski is really the university. Um, but, um, it's kind of a hard question when you say, where is the university? Um, it, the idea is what your friend is thinking is, well, somewhere deep, deep below California Hall, um, there is a kind of dungeon, and th th down there is the, the chamber from which it all emanates. What? Um, and that's just a mistake. And Ryle's point is, if you show someone um, uh, organized human behavior, and um, you, 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 you see that uh, they're, um, <laughs> they're doing long division, they're uh, talking about um, their uh, friends, they're um, playing chess, they're doing all this stuff. And then you say, yeah, but where is the mind? The mind is some kind of dungeon in the brain that controls everything. That is just a, a mistake, a bad question. All there is to being a university is having all this stuff organized and related. That's what a university is, it's when all that stuff's organized and related. Having a mind is not something deep in the brain, deep hidden, that does the organizing of all the behavior. It just is the organizing behavior, the organized behavior. Um, let me go back a bit, there's something kind of things I skipped here. Um, the basic point here is that you can know what someone else is thinking as well as um, they know it themselves. When I was doing that stuff in the board, you had just as good knowledge of what I was doing in the calculation as I did myself. Um, or if I, you know, at the start of the lecture, realize I've lost my watch, I put my watch down here somewhere and I'm hunting about for it. You can see what I'm doing just as well as I can. You can see, that, you know, there he goes again trying to find his watch. Um, and the thing about trying to find your watch is there are different ways you can do it. You could do it by actually, um, you know, I keep turning things over and I, I, I look inside a bag and I hunt through my pockets. Um, you can do it kind of overtly so that anyone else can see what you're doing. Or another way you can hunt for your watch is by um, 
just reflecting, just trying to think, now where did I last have it? Where did I last see it? And then you might not be able to tell what's going on um, uh, because I'm just doing it in this hidden way. So these psychological acts are things that sometimes you can do out in public, sometimes you do completely inwardly, but it would be just a mistake to suppose that um, um, what's going on is that you're always silently reflecting at the same time as you do the behavior. The behavior just is the hunting. Or being angry. Yep. Uh, can I repeat it? I'm not sure. Oh my God, I can't let, uh. Oh yeah, yeah. It would just be a mistake to think that there's all, when, you're, when your mind is at work, there's always something hidden going on, and that's the real mind, and the behavior is just a kind of outward manifestation of that. Sometimes the behavior, the outward behavior that everyone else can see as well as you, that is the operation of the mind. That's what I mean about the lung division. That is the mind functioning. And it's not that there's something behind it causing that functioning that makes it the mind. Um, if you're angry with someone, um, one way you can do it is you can sit there in a silent, repressed rage, maybe, <laughs> maybe with the blood pressure building up, um, and people might not be able to tell. But another way you can do it is by yelling, banging the table, um, threatening to sue them, um, the, the, you know, the whole thing. Um, anger is like that too. Anger can just be behavior. Not, it's not always something hidden. So the general point is psychology is not a matter, according to Ryle, psychology is not a matter of finding what's causing behavior. It's a matter of classifying behavior. Um, the behaviors that we're talking about, sometimes you can do them in a way that nobody else can find out about. I mean, I could have done the long division um, um, in my head. I could have done it in the restroom so that nobody, nobody would realize I was doing it. There are different ways it can be private. Um, but uh, uh, it's not that there's always a private thing going on that underlies the outward behavior. The outward behavior just is the functioning of the mind in many cases. Wittgenstein's got an example um, where he talks about um, expecting someone to come for tea at four o'clock. So suppose you just think what goes on when you're expecting someone to come for tea at four o'clock. Um, then uh, what happens? Well, um, towards four o'clock, you start to look at your watch. You um, fill the kettle. You look at the book of instructions. Now pour the boiling water out of the kettle and into the teapot. Um, you uh, look out the window to see if they're coming. Uh, if the hand goes past four and they're still not there, you get more um, concerned. Um, that, these behaviors, that's all there is to expecting someone to come for tea. There isn't some essence, some, some real um, primal thing going on in secret that these are all just manifestations of. That's what it is to be expecting some, someone to come for tea at four o'clock, that you exhibit that kind of behavior. And this is the kind of scene that um, is the happy conclusion of that kind of episode. Here is the young Wittgenstein. Um, this is thought to be the kind of tea that Wittgenstein would have enjoyed. Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> so, so much for the notion of a category mistake and the idea that psychology, the way of classifying behavior, Yep. Um, I, I was just wondering, like, in the case of the long division, in the case of, in the, of, the, in the, case of the long division, yes, right, in the right. case of the uh, T example, isn't there more going on than just, uh, like, for instance, when you're sitting at, when you're standing at the, uh, the, the chalkboard, you're sitting there, and you, you say, um, um, and then you yes. write something down, and it wasn't entirely explicit to me exactly what you were thinking. Like, there was a behavior going on, but there was also a, there is that stream of consciousness and that mental dialogue that is responsible for the number that you went down after, like, in the oh. That is a good question. So far as I can tell, what was going on when I said um um was just I said um. You know, it's not <laughs> it's not like I had so I was saying to myself under my breath um, 
Oh yeah, that's uh, so, so, so naturally five times forty nine is um, whatever it is, uh, um, and masking that by saying for your benefit, um, you know, <laughs> you see what I mean? When I said um, I was just playing for time, and. Uh, <laughs> I uh, tried to you know, give you the sense that I was still talking to you while I, uh, <laughs> while I waited for the answer to come to me. That, that, that's how I describe it. I waited for the answer to come to me while I was saying, um. Do you see what I mean? So you wouldn't say that you're doing like, multiplication in your head like, as you're saying, um. Like, yeah. I, I would say that's, or at least when I was looking at what you were doing, I was saying, OK, 49 times 3 is something like around 130 or something like that. That's fair enough. Um, l l let me put it like this. Um, you might say, I mean, if you're really doing a serious psychological an psychologist analysis of what was going on there, um, then you might say, look, um, it's really a matter of memory, this. Um, that's to say, each particular step, like um, what's five times nine, you do that in your head and then just write down the answer. Yeah? Uh, so when you break down each individual step, Maybe for each individual step, there was something going on in my head, yeah, and I was manifesting that. But the thing is, sometimes I can do the whole thing in my head, right? So, you know, and some people can do that kind of long division in their head. Some people, you know, in Oxford, there is a professor of arithmetic who um, presumably does very hard sums all day. And, um, uh, you know, some people just can't do very hard sums in their head. So. When someone's doing that, there is at any rate a psychological operation, storing all the results in memory, yeah, and um, assembling them all in memory, um, that I wasn't doing here. So some psychological operations, you're right, when you do a serious detailed analysis, some of the psychological operations I might have been doing in my head. But there's a global thing of memory. Uh, remembering the results of each particular calculation and assembling them all together. That was too much for me in that case, but in other cases you could do. So that operation of memory will really be the thing that is um, uh, now sometimes done in your head, now completely out front on view. Yeah, uh, But th th that, that's quite concessive. I mean, it would also be possible to argue that um, Really, the whole thing is being done out front on view. I mean, it's no more puzzling how the whole thing can be done out front on view than it is how it can be done inside your head. You see what I mean? If you ask, well, how did you do it inside your head? Well, you just had to wait for the answer to come to you. Yeah, but that's what I said out about what was going on outside the head. You just waited for the answer to come to you, and then you wrote it down. Maybe that was all that was going on. Uh, let me just—I I would like to take more questions, but let me just check the time. Um, uh, okay, can you, we, we'll have to be quick, but I'd like to hear what people say. Uh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So my question is kind of basic, though. It was, uh, you said that with the, in the cases of like uh, speaking in public and doing long division, not being yeah. able to do it in your head, that sort of thinking becomes behavior, correct? That's right. Okay. It is behavior. Yeah. Um, my point is, um, if you think, the, the thinking of thinking is manipulating symbols. Is, is, is that okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Well, manipulating symbols is, some, is something that I can do. I could do it in a sealed booth, right? Nobody else would be able to observe it. I could manipulate the, the, the symbols um, on a blackboard. Everyone can observe it. Yeah. It's the same thing I'm doing in the sealed booth as there. So what I'm doing in my head is still just manipulating with symbols. It's just a kind of accident that nobody can observe it. I mean, if you slice the top off my head and um, uh, you, you use the magnifying glass, you might be able to see it perfectly well. It would be just the same thing that was going on out front. Yeah, th 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 that's the point. So then the thought process itself then becomes part of behavior? The, the thought process itself is a, just a kind of hidden behavior, okay. unobserved behavior. Yeah. So when you bottle up your anger, um, what you're doing is inwardly doing the same thing that sometimes you do right out front. 
Okay. Um, well, there are quite a lot of questions, but I, okay, let, me, let me try and take them, but let's be brief. Can you put your hand up if you've got a question? Uh, yeah. Right. But what if you had like lied to us and put down a three instead of a four? But like you yourself knew that it was wrong, but from like when we are observing your actions, yeah. That's right. That 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 could happen if I was very skilled. Then I then I could do that. Yeah. Um, I, 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 uh, uh, so th that really is possible. I, I don't deny that. The reason I chose that is that you know I, I really don't do long division very often, and I'm never very sure I'm, I'm, I've even got the thing set up right with that um, kind of uh, line. You know, the line that goes like this. I never. It, it, you, the reason I did that is that I, I use that example is that there's no question of me doing that kind of thing. I'm not really up to it. I, I, I don't want to diminish my credibility in your eyes. <laughs> but that's why I chose that example. Yeah, because what you say sometimes happens, but sometimes it isn't what's going on. Sometimes it's all out front. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, is it possible that behavior is just an indicator of how somebody is thinking, but it isn't actually happening? Again, that can happen, right? The behavior is, 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 is uh, you, you know, if you're deal dealing with a politician, say, then that's someone who's going to be very aware of how they're behaving and what signals they're sending, yeah? Um, and trying to manipulate that. Um, but it isn't always the case. The, 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 that's, the whole, that's the only point. But, but I, I don't mean like when somebody's like intentionally trying to manipulate the uh -huh. behavior, but I mean just like in general. Like somebody's behavior is just like reflection. Yeah. I, th I think that, that's what Descartes thinks, right? Somebody's behavior is just the outward sign of what's really going on. Um, but that's why I chose that long division example, because really, I promise you, there is nothing going on backstage except what you saw. It, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, qu qu quickly, but uh, yeah. Sometimes it is, yeah. That's right. OK, the, 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 let's, let's take that example. So every day you wake up, you say, I'm going to attend 10 classes today. Um, and um, at the end of the day, you say, well, <laughs> it didn't work out again. Right? Now, at a certain point, um, your friend who's listening to this routine every day will say, well, frankly, you're full of it. <laughs> you don't really mean to be attending 10 classes today. You're just going to bunk off like regular. You, you see what I mean? Um, so uh, there are degrees in these things. Yeah. Sometimes it makes sense. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes if the behavior is not there, you say you didn't mean to do it at all. Yeah. That was a lie. Or I tell you, you may have been perfectly sincere, but you just got it wrong about what your intention really is. Yeah. OK. Um, I, I, I want to just whistle through. Um, uh, 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 I think you, 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 De, here, here's Ryle's analysis of what's going on in Descartes. Um, Ryle says Descartes had a paramechanical hypothesis. The idea is the brain's the mechanical cause of what's going on, and the mind is a mechanism like the brain. It's more clockwork that's underpinning behavior. So uh, Descartes is thinking of the mind as a kind of ghostly clockwork. Descartes had mistaken the logic of his problem. Instead of asking by what criteria intelligent behavior is actually distinguished from non-intelligent behavior, instead of asking on what basis do we classify some behavior as intelligent and some behavior as not intelligent, um, Descartes said, given that the principle of mechanical causation, um, that, that, the, that the brain works as a kind of clockwork, the brain is working as a kind of clockwork, but that doesn't tell us the difference between um, intelligent and unintelligent behavior. The problem was not one of mechanics. Um, so Descartes assumed it must be some kind of counterpart to mechanics. And psychology is thought of as the, a kind of ghostly mechanics, the mechanics of ectoplasm, a clock, clockwork 
made of some non-physical stuff that is then driving the physical stuff. Um, and Ryle's point is, that's like looking for the real university somewhere in the basement. Um, uh, th that's not the way it works. There are just all these parts to the university that cooperate or, or fight and are organized. Um, uh, that's all that's happening. The paramechanical causes were assumed to be known infallibly by each of us through introspection. So you could never know how to classify someone else's behavior. And of course, that's not true. I mean, um, we know perfectly well, in many cases, how to classify one another's behavior. Descartes should have asked by what criteria intelligent behavior actually is distinguished from non-intelligent behavior. How do we actually go about it? And that doesn't involve um, finding causes. Um, so the psychological terms are just ways of classifying complex behaviors. They're not ways of identifying the causes of behaviors. And that really is a good statement of behaviorism. Behaviorism is the view that psychological terms are just ways of classifying complex behaviors. So if you think about that, then how are we going to explain the meanings of psychological terms? You know, words for psychological states. Well, you can describe behavior in non-psychological terms. You know, he moved his arm, he walked forward, he walked back. Um, you could define psychological concepts in terms of behavior in this view. Here is the great philosopher Carnap. Here is the old boy himself um, uh, defining excited. So excited is um, uh, a psychological term. What does it take to be excited? Carnap says, A is excited asserts the existence of that physical structure, the microstructure of Mr. A's body, especially of his central nervous system, that is characterized by a high pulse and state of breathing, which on the application of certain stimuli may even be made higher by vehement and factually unsatisfactory answers to questions by the occurrence of agitated movements on the application of certain stimuli, etc. So that's excitement. Um, <laughs> that, um, now, it, it, it's just wonderful that um, um, Carnap would only give factually unsatisfactory answers to questions when in a condition of excitement. But um, um, the thing is, if you think how you're going to define psychological states behavioristically is going to be very difficult to do. I mean, it, well, uh, Carnap is a great philosopher, and this is hard to do any better than this in giving a behavioral definition of a psychological state. But when you look at it, you can see perfectly well that you could, someone should, could surely be excited without that being true of them. You know, some people. Um, just look more, and they look more and more languid the more excited they are. It's just their way of coping with it. Um, you could be excited without having any tendency to show those symptoms. It's all deeply masked. Um, and similarly, um, you could have those symptoms. Some of us give vehement and factually unsatisfactory answers to questions anyhow, um, <laughs> whether we're excited or not. Um, and uh, you may have a high pulse and rate of breathing just because you've been working out. I, I mean, it's very difficult to give this kind of definition of even something that looks like a good candidate, like excited. Um, so the definition looks very, very difficult. I mean, how could you do it for any psychological term, really define it in behavioral terms? And the other thing is, if Carmel was right, if this was what excitement was, then the way we began this class was by agreeing, basically, that um, there is a difference in the, way that you be, in the way you know about your own psychological states and the way you know about someone else's psychological states. But if this kind of definition was correct, 
To know you're excited, you'd have to know that you had a high pulse and rate of breathing, that you were giving vehement and factually and satisfactory answers to questions and so on. And that's just the same way that somebody else would know about your um, uh, uh, excitement. So um, you'd actually have better knowledge of whether someone else was excited than you had of whether you're excited yourself. Um, but where we came in was that there is just that difference that doesn't go away between the way you know about your own uh, psychological states and the way you know about someone else's psychological states. So I've been saying I think there is an important insight in behaviorism we have to hang on to, but you can't press it so hard as to give behavioral definitions of psychological states. Okay, thank you. Great questions. That's the end of the message for today. Okay. Okay, hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon, class. <laughs> um, okay, let's start. Um, so today uh, and on Monday, we're looking at a pair of papers by Hilary Putnam. Um, um, the paper we look at, the paper we look at on Monday, um, the nature of mental states is a particularly important paper, is really um, one of the foundations of philosophy of mind for the last 50 years or so. Um, paper we'll look at today, Brains and Behaviour. I'm going to present one way of reading Putnam's argument in that um, article. He takes, on, on the article we'll look at on Monday, he takes the argument in a, in a quite different direction. Um, but let's start with uh, Putnam's idea of cluster concepts. Um, we looked, uh, where we finished up last time was um, looking at Carnap's attempt to define X is excited as um, X's pulse rate is increased, X gives vehement and factually unsatisfactory answers to questions, and so on. And um, I, I said, well, obviously that kind of definition is no good. Um, the relationship between a mental state and behavior is always much more indirect than that. Um, it's much looser than that. Um, you might be excited and you might uh, display that in many different ways. Um, you might care passionately about someone, um, but people have such very different ways of showing it. Um, there isn't really any tight behavioral definition to give that links up a mental concept to a particular way of behaving. Um, and behaviorists, when they were faced with that kind of criticism, said, um, uh, well, what that shows is we can't give tight definitions here, but nonetheless, all there is to being in the mental state is behaving in this loose, hard to specify way. So Putnam starts out by pointing out, and that the application of a word like pain is controlled by a whole cluster of criteria. There are millions of different ways of saying what pain is. I mean, the most natural way would be, I mean, uh, you say to me, what, what is pain? What is that again? And I stick a pin in you and say, ha, ha now you know what pain is. Um, <laughs> Um, very popular among small children. Um, <laughs> but, you know, if, if you're not going to do it quite like that, then there are actually lots of alternatives. You don't have to do it that way. Um, so, for example, you might say pain is that feeling which is evinced by saying ouch or by wincing or in a variety of other ways or often not evinced at all. Now, you might think, well, that, that's not tremendously helpful. Um, well, once you grasp how many different ways uh, people can behave in when they're in pain, you might think, well, how am I going to be able to explain in behavioral terms what pain is? Um, well, Putnam's got a quite different model to the behaviorist of what the relation is between the behavior and the mental state. If you say, well, of course, pain in itself has absolutely nothing to do with behavior, what Descartes would have said, then you really wind up making it completely mysterious how you could ever know about someone else's pain. And that can't be the right answer. If you think of pain as something hidden behind the behavior, then how do you ever know it's there? Someone is lying on the ground shrieking in agony in front of you. 
And um, someone says to you, for God's sake, why don't you help them? And you say, well, I, I saw they were behaving like that. But for all I know, they're not in pain. That's just behaviour. The pain might be there, or it might not. We don't actually believe this for a second, the idea that you don't know what someone else is really feeling. If someone's in agony, then you better help them. Uh, you know, we, we just take that for granted. Um, so what is the connection between the behavior and the mental state? You can't just say there's no connection. And on the other hand, if you say, well, uh, the, the, uh, the pain just is the behavior, that doesn't sound right either. Well, to get Putnam's model here, suppose you think about um, the way you find out about diseases. Um, suppose, you're, uh, suppose you're a doctor in a small country town, so you're in the sticks, you're in the middle of nowhere, and you find that the patients who are coming to see you um, are, well, I mean, I, I, I talked to a doctor once about, um, I said, don't, don't you find that lots of the patients who come to see you say things that make no sense at all? They say things like, doctor, it feels like my cheeks are stuffed with cotton wool, and you think, what, <laughs> what, do, I, what, what do I do with that? Um, and she said, well, um, when that happens, what I do is I say, um, take three aspirin every day, and um, if there's anything really wrong with them, they'll come back um, and give me some, <laughs> they'll have more symptoms by then. Um, I, I don't know if that's generally what doctors do, but you, um, you, you imagine a doctor in a small country practice who's um, getting some distinctive set of symptoms coming through. A lot of the patients coming through are complaining about a particular kind of cough. They've got a particular kind of tickle in their throat. Um, a lot of them are um, having trouble sleeping. They're getting headaches. Um, and after a point, you say, look, I've got a cluster of symptoms here. Um, a patient comes in with a cough, and the doctor says, I bet you're having trouble sleeping too, or I bet you're particularly sensitive to bright light, or are you getting the headaches? And you say, well, we've got a syndrome here. This is not just a bunch of unrelated symptoms. Something's going on here. Um, maybe you find that the people who have this collection of symptoms are usually minors. They're usually people who are working deep underground. And you think, they've all got something. They've all got the same thing, whatever it is. I mean, the way it works is, you say something like, well, we've got a collection of symptoms that's constituting a disease here. Um, that's all a single disease. When you've got all these symptoms coming as a group, and from the fact that someone has one of the symptoms, I can usually predict that they're going to have the rest. And you might find, this is the kind of thing that you, you kind of work out as you go along. It works like this, I think, with Legionnaire's disease. You get a collection of symptoms, and people say, well, something's going on. And you put it together. You, try and, you then try and find what the thing is that's going on. Is it a virus or what? Um, but the first thing to do is to say, this collection of symptoms is hanging together, and it's not an accident. So if you've got a collection of symptoms regularly recurring as a group, and they're predictive of further symptoms, then you say, this is a distinct disease. So that's the kind of picture. You say, um, I've got this collection of symptoms, S1, S2, S3, and S4. And I hypothesize there's some underlying virus there's something down there that is causing them all. That's how it works, right? In medicine generally. Um, so at that point, you say, well, look, what is having the disease? Is it a matter of having those symptoms? Well, having the disease and having the symptoms are different things. Um, somebody might have the virus, but not actually show any of the symptoms. Somebody might have all these symptoms, but for some other reason. Having polio, polio fits this model very well. I think that's Putnam's example. Having polio isn't just having the symptoms of polio. Having polio is having the underlying virus, whether or not you've got the symptoms. To have polio is to have the underlying virus. That's all right. I mean, people sometimes say, a doctor will sometimes say, well, you have this condition, but it's asymptomatic. 
you've got the virus, but um, you didn't realize it because uh, you didn't show any of the symptoms. That just happens. Um, so when a virus, here's Putnam, when a virus origin was discovered for polio, doctors said cases in which all the symptoms of polio had been present, but in which the virus had been absent, had turned out not to be cases of polio at all. People who had those symptoms had something else wrong with them. So you treat the symptoms as diagnostic of some underlying virus. You don't yet know what it is, but you say there is some one thing that all these symptoms point to, and that's the critical thing for whether or not you've got the disease. So Putnam says that's the kind of model we should have for um, mental states and behavior. What happens is, suppose you think of yourself as, um, say you're a Martian anthropologist coming among humans, and you, you're finding out, do these creatures have minds? What happens is you notice that there are clusters of behaviors that hang together. You get things like, you spot that very often when a human is banging a nail into a wall um, and they hit their thumb with a hammer, they exhibit a whole bunch of symptoms. They drop the hammer, they hop, they cry out, um, they suck their thumb. Um, they wince. And being um, a smart Martian, you say, well, something's going on here. Um, I, you say, well, that hitting the thumb with a hammer causes something, and in turn, that causes all these symptoms. When you're saying there's such a thing as jealousy, there is such a thing as love in the human heart, here are its causes, here are its symptoms. Now, they may be many and various, these symptoms. These, um, uh, the symptoms of a disease generally, people, two people with the same disease may, may have not the same symptoms at all. They may have some overlap in their symptoms, or they may be showing it simply in different ways. Um, and similarly, when you've got the, the mental state, the underlying cause here, um, you, you say, well, something's going on here, but two people may show that in quite different ways. So Putnam says, Putnam's model is, what we mean by pain is not the presence of a cluster of responses. It's not having the behavioral symptoms. That's what it is to have pain. It's the presence of an event or condition that normally causes those responses. So we're in the, with regard to each other's minds, we're in the position of the country doctor who doesn't know what the virus is, doesn't, maybe doesn't even know about viruses, but says, well, something is going on here. These symptoms all hang together. They are diagnostic of something. That's the relation between complex human behavior and the mental states. We group the behaviors as being diagnostic of something. That's what's going on when we say someone has a mind. Okay, so that's Putnam's model. Um, it's not the same as Descartes, obviously, um, and it's, but it does say there's a connection between the behavior and the mental state. But it's not at all that having the mental state is a, ma is a matter of showing the behaviors. It's that behaviors are diagnostic of the mental state. So that explains how you can have knowledge of what someone else is feeling. You treat their behavior as diagnostic of the disease, of the mental state. Um, I mean, you're in, just as a country doctor can know that someone's got this disease uh, on the basis of them having the symptoms, even though having the symptoms is not the same thing as having the disease. Is that plain as day? Yes? Oh, I see. <laughs> you just agree. Okay. Right. Um, okay. Well, Putnam's got an argument uh, f for this view that explains why this is better than behaviorism. This is stuff about super Spartans. Um, super Spartans? Um, so, so uh, it, if this model is right, if this kind of model is right, then um, um, it should be po just as it's possible for someone to have the virus asymptomatically. It should be possible for someone to have pain asymptomatically. Um, 
that's the key difference between Putnam's model and a behaviorist model. This model says you could have the disease perfect, uh, uh, all right, even though there weren't any symptoms present. Behaviorism says, unless there are other symptoms present, you can't have the mental state. Um, so the key difference between Putnam's view and the behaviorists is that Putnam is saying you can perfectly well make sense of the idea that the mental state is there in the absence of any symptoms. And so the super Spartans are him trying to explain how that could be. And it is, well, um, consider um, um, a people who regard expressions of pain as undignified, unheroic. Um, the, the head of the super Spartan is gone here, but, um, but I promise you he has a head. <laughs> it's not a master of them being decapitated. Um, but OK, um, among the Spartans, um, uh, expressing pain is regarded as a sign of great weakness and a lack of dignity, a lack of proper self-respect. Um, so uh, uh, they don't flinch, wince, or anything like that. Um, they train themselves to say in um, well-modulated voices, the agony is unbearable, and <laughs> things like that, <laughs> without any behavioral expression of it. Um, my arm seems to have been torn in two. Um, and this goes on and on. I mean, people who show that kind of behavior don't, who do show, um, do in an uncivilized way express their pains, don't find mates. Um, it's really, uh, uh, eventually, it's just bred out of them that they will express pain by flinching or wincing or hopping about. So after a few centuries, they're just born only um, expressing pain only by saying, in a pleasant, well-modulated way, the agony is extreme. Um, so they have the state. That makes perfect sense. I mean, it's not, I, don't, I don't say it's likely, but it could perfectly well happen. They don't have the state. People who have chronic pain really do have to teach themselves um, to get through a regular life. Um, uh, without <laughs> um, simply registering anguish all day, they, they want to hold down jobs and so on. Um, so there really are cases where people now with chronic pain say, um, where it can't be, there isn't any good treatment for it, um, uh, just have to try to get on with things even though they're feeling great pain. Um, so the thing makes perfect sense, this. Um, so they have the sensation, but they don't have any of the behaviors. And eventually, Putnam says, you can imagine an X world where even to talk about pain is um, are regarded as uh, uncivilized. So there on the X world, people still do still feel pain. If you cut them, they bleed, and they do get the sensation when the knife divides the flesh. Um, they have the pains all right, but they just don't talk about them. They never express them in any other way. That makes perfect sense. And if that's right, then the behaviorist must be wrong. Um, because here we've got the sensations without any accompanying behavior. I mean, the behavior on Earth is still diagnostic. I mean, our behavior, the behavior now, is still diagnostic of the, of the pain. So that explains what the connection is. But the thing that they're diagnostic for could perfectly well exist without the behaviors, just as the polio virus could exist without the usual symptoms of polio. And if you buy this example of Putnam's, it's natural to wonder how far you could push it this is a case where nobody's ever going to know about anybody else's pain. They're all having pains, but they just never know about it uh, in each other's case. But if you have pain yourself, presumably you know about it, even if nobody else does. No matter how civilized and so on you are, you still know that you have the pain. I mean, it's natural to think, if you've got a pain, you must know that you have a pain. 
Pain is self-advertising. <laughs> if, if, if something hurts, then it kind of flashes a pop-up to you and you think, yes, I'm in pain now, that really hurt, right? You can't have the pain without knowing that you have the pain. The pain having the pain and knowing you have the pain are different things. I mean, presumably animals feel pain um, without knowing that they feel pain. They just have the pain, they don't know about it. You and I not only have the pain, but we know about it. But um, you might not know much about it. Um, I, I mentioned uh, a couple of weeks ago these football players or soldiers in battlefields who have um, serious injuries um, as a result of which presumably they're feeling pain, but they just don't notice it. They're focused on what is going on um, and uh, they just don't attend to the pain. There are also cases where um, th there's a terrifying report about some um, anaesthetics uh, that were being used a little while ago where it was discovered that the anaesthetic which had been used um, for quite a long time was actually it contained two principal ingredients one was a muscle relaxant so if you took the thing you couldn't move your muscles the other was an amnestic that is a drug that causes you to lose your memory of what is going on at the time you've taken the drug so you take this thing then you go out and afterwards you can't remember a thing about what happened and people say that it hurt and you say no but the terrifying thing is if that's all that happened then the thing is not killing the pain at all the thing is just killing your ability to protest when the pain is caused when the surgeon slices through the bone um, uh, you can't move because you've taken the relaxant and afterwards, you can't complain because it's got the amnestic in it. But you presumably still felt the pain at the time. Um, they're not using that anaesthetic anymore. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you might be unable to report or remember the pain, but l let's push it a little bit further. I mean, you know, I said if you're distracted when you've got a headache, that doesn't presumably make the headache go away. You're just not thinking about it anymore. The headache's presumably still there. Well, Putnam has an X world where um, people don't know about each other's pains. I mean, could we make sense of the idea of a Y world? Where, I mean, in a Y world, it's not just that super Spartans regard it as uncivilized to, um, register pain or even talk about it these super spartans um, regard it as, un as uncivilized even to notice that they have it themselves they don't focus on the condition of their own bodies they never even notice that they have pains they always focus on what's going on around them I mean if you imagine that they spend their lives in a state of perpetual war for example, they never leave the battlefield. You, 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 you might be able to fill that out a little bit. So can you make sense of that? Um, there's pain. Nobody else notices you have it. You don't even notice that you have it yourself. I guess that does make sense. Um, and in fact, when you think about it, couldn't it be that this is a why world? Couldn't it be that we actually live in a world like that? That is... What's going on is, there is actually an ocean of suffering in this room at the moment. Only, we're too well-bred to writhe about, express it to each other. We focus on the philosophy. It keeps our minds off the pain. Usually, we don't even notice that it's there. But that's what this room is, a sea of pain. <laughs> I guess that makes perfect sense. I mean, and certainly on Putnam's analysis, I guess it should make perfect sense. Okay, that's the Super Spartans. Oh, uh, yeah? Is 
The pain that we, no, I don't mean the pain that you've accumulated and forgotten about. Um, I mean, um, yeah, I know, uh, um, we all have that, right? The pain we accumulate through our lifetimes, um, the sadness, um, yeah, life is like that. Uh, but um, um, that's not what I mean. What I mean is right at this moment, maybe everyone in the room is experiencing great pain. But, you know, we accept that with, say, footballers in a game or um, um, uh, people on a battlefield, if you're focused on what's going on outside, you may not notice that you have pain. Yeah? That's all right? Okay. Here's step two. Suppose that um, uh, this sea of pain, is, this, these pain sensations are in the room right now. But people aren't noticing them because they are so riveted by the lecture. Um, and of course, you don't want to writhe. And, so we're very inhibited about expressing pain to each other. So we don't notice that we're in pain ourselves, and other people don't know about it. That's the hypothesis. Um, yep? Uh, it's a good question whether you can attend to only one thing at a time. Um, my inclination is to think that you can actually only attend to one thing at a time. Um, I once read a, um, a science fiction story um, which um, began with an alien sitting on um, a chair reading two books simultaneously. Um, and I, I always like that example because it's so mundane, you know, it's, so, it's such a low key thing. But you just think about that for a second, and geez, that's really weird. I mean, how could you read two books at the same time, not switching back and forth between them, but really simultaneously scanning both of them? Yeah. Um, it's not that your eyes won't do it, it's um, your mind won't do it. You, you, you see what I mean? It's very hard to, to, to get a sense of how you could give your full attention to two different things at the same time. Yeah? Uh, so, you can, so, of course, you can switch back and forth. Yeah? But uh, and sometimes you can switch back and forth pretty quickly. So quick, you can multitask. Yeah, j j just the way a computer multitasks, you switch from task to task very fast, right? So to the untrained eye, it looks as if you're um, uh, attending to the two things simultaneously. But I think it probably doesn't make sense. Yeah. Uh, uh, Yep. If you don't know you, if you don't feel pain, then you don't have pain. I agree with that. But that's not the issue. The issue is, if you don't know you have pain, could you have pain? And see, an animal, it seems to me, animals don't have the concept of pain. I mean, or at any rate, maybe some animals do, but I think lots of animals don't, right? Um, so, um, um, presumably, the average dog does not wonder about whether other people are in pain. You know, it might come and lick your hand sympathetically, but really, it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't know what human pain is, yeah? Um, I guess. And it doesn't know what dog pain is either. It has the pain. Yeah? But see, th think of this diagram. It has the pain, but it doesn't have any concept of pain. It can't think about pain. So it can't know it has pain. Yeah? So uh, animals can have pain even though they don't know about it. And um, the pain and the knowledge are really different things. So I agree with you that it's a subjective state, but what I'm asking is, couldn't these really come apart? Yeah, they do come apart in animals. Couldn't they be coming apart in us too? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, just from that example, uh, if a dog has pain, then won't it be barking around or, you know? If a dog has pain, then it will just show it has pain. I, uh, dogs, dogs are not super Spartans. Um, uh, uh, no, no question about that, yeah. What is it? Well, it's a sensation. 
what more do you want to know? Well, <laughs> no, that's not fair. It's a per that's a perfectly sensible question. But all, all, all I mean at this point is, that's the question of the whole class. What is the nature of this thing? Yeah. Um, so um, at the moment, what we're doing is, the, the, the point of this kind of argument is to try and get a fix on it. And the fix that, um, the fix that Putnam, the, the point that Putnam is m making so emphatically is that it can't be just the same thing as behavior, um, just because you can imagine these super Spartans. Um, and I'm asking just another question about, how do, the, the, the question I'm asking here is something about, how does pain show itself? What is the connection between pain and other people's knowledge that you have the pain? and your own knowledge that you have the pain. I'm just trying to get a fix on this thing and say, can't it come apart from all of these? Yeah. yeah. So I, I do say that that hypothesis that the room is a sea of pain um, is kind of startling, but doesn't it make perfect sense? I mean, if it doesn't make sense, then tell me why not? Oh, why couldn't it be true? Yeah. Uh, that's right. Um, um, I mean, being able to say, for example, that you're in pain. Yeah. Is, is that okay? Is there another way of thinking of knowledge? It knows something's going. It certainly knows something is going on, but I guess in, in my well, I don't know. I, 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 I my dog once um, um, was exhibiting strange behaviour, and it took me a while to understand what was going on. It had a huge piece of wood, propping its jaws open, um, that I'd obviously tried to swallow, and it must have been causing it a lot of suffering. But um, it didn't seem to even realise its jaw was in question. If you see what I mean, I think often all that happens is the attention is directed to the body part, not to the mental state itself. You see what I mean? If, you're in, if you hurt your thumb, you attend to your thumb. You don't necessarily attend to, to the pain itself. Unless you're a connoisseur and you're saying this is the most exquisite pain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, you see what I mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so animals can learn from pain. Um, a, a dog can learn from being bitten by a snake to, to avoid the snake. Yeah, is, is, is that? Yeah. yeah. I think that's absolutely right, but I don't think it shows knowledge of pain on the part of the dog. What the dog learns is keep away from snakes. You, you see what I mean? It's not, the dog doesn't have to reflect. I had the pain sensation last time that snake bit me. All the dog, all that happens is that the dog is conditioned not to go near the snake. It doesn't need to reflect on the sensation. I mean, if it was going to reflect on the sensation, it would be able to think things like, this is a kind of sharp biting pain, whereas the pain the snake caused me last time was um, a dull, bloody kind of pain. You, you see what I mean? It should be able to compare and contrast like that. But surely dogs, well, what do you think? I mean, surely dogs can't do that. I, yeah, it's knowledge and understanding, all right, but I don't, know, I don't yet see that it's knowledge and understanding of pain itself. It's knowledge and understanding about what's, what to keep away from and what not. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Right. It might not be an, uh, a knowledge that you're absorbing, it just might be a, a, a kind of connection that he feels. 
Uh, that's right. I mean, I, 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 I think that's perfectly fair. It, it might be, um, it might be an association. Is, is that a way of putting it? Um, uh, that um, um, it just uses to keep it away from snakes, yeah, rather than something about reflection in its mental life. Um, one, two. Yeah, I, I can't. Uh, was it you? Yeah, yeah. One, two, yeah. three. Um, <laughs> yeah. It, can I put you on hold in that one? Because we're just going to talk about that in a, in a moment. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I can come back in a moment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Can, can you do that loudly? More loud. More loud. Yeah. Pain is self-advertising. Yeah. So the, the, sorry, the, the, I, I'm, I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing you. So, so um, let me just play that back as I got it. It's that um, there's a difference between the example of the dog and the example of the person who has the pain but gets distracted. Yeah, yeah right. Is, it, so, is, is that the whole thing? Yeah. yeah sure. The, the, the example of the dog shows there can be pain without knowledge of pain. I, I think that, that, that is what it shows. Um, uh, the, the, the person who does it, gets distracted from the pain, that's different. They have the capacity for knowledge of pain. It's just that they're not exercising that capacity right now. Well, I don't know. What do you think? I mean, I'm assuming that the person who gets distracted still has the headache, even though they, that they're not attending to it. But um, I mean, you might say, well, it's just as good as an anesthetic anyhow. I see, I see you might say that, but I don't see what, well, my inclination is to say you've got the headache, even if you've just been distracted. That would fit with that last remark about a biological sensation. Um, yeah. We will come back to these things. Um, okay, last one and then we should move on. Uh, Whoa, that's a, <laughs> that's a subtle like, move, yeah, yeah. Biologically, like he was saying, uh -huh. the cause of the pain without feeling the pain is pain. Okay. The, uh, I think the, 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 that and the thing about biology are both good subtle points, and I, 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 I want to move on and, and, and look at this a bit more uh, at this point. Is that all right? Uh, uh, okay, okay. So it's not that I want to brush this aside. I, th I think it's so important I want to take a lot of time on it. Okay. Okay. Um, Okay, um, so it seems to me that the, the way Putnam's argument is going is to say that mental states just are brain states. I mean, he's saying what we mean by pain is not the presence of a cluster of responses, but the presence of an event or condition that normally causes those responses, right? The behavior is diagnostic for this event or condition. Yeah. Um, so we have to be able to go further, just as in the case of a disease, you can go on and specify what the virus is. Um, and we do know what the cause is of those responses. I mean, that's what people um, working on brain physiology do. They, um, they find what's causing you to wince, jerk your thumb, cry out. Um, it's a state of the brain. If you follow the physics of the situation um, from the thumb, um, to the uh, leap into the air, then you would, it would be physiology the whole way. So what is going on here is that you've got a cluster of symptoms that are diagnostic of a brain state. So pain just is that brain state. And you might think that's kind of weird. Look, I mean, if, if you cut off the top of your head and um, put a mirror up so you could see the top of your head, and someone said to you, see that there? That's you feeling pain. That's really such a strange idea, right? You think, how could that be? How could that grey sludge be me feeling the same thing as me feeling pain? Um, it's kind of a strange thing, that. But there can be two different ways of identifying one and the same thing. Um, I mean, and this happens all the time in science. 
they say, well, there's heat. You know, there's that sensation you feel when you put your hand on the radiator. There's heat. And there's motion of molecules. And heat actually is just the same thing as motion of molecules. It's when all the molecules are scampering about faster and faster. That's when things are hot. Gold just is the stuff with atomic number 79. Water just is H2O. You didn't know that when you looked at water running through the river. But that's all it is, hydrogen and oxygen. Um, so you could say, well, lightning. What's lightning? Um, well, uh, it's very surprising, but lightning just is electrical discharge due to ionization. So similarly, you could think, well, pain is like that. This is kind of like when you have the pain and then the electrical discharge due to ionization bit is when you talk about the biology of the brain. Um, so um, you could say, well, maybe it's C fiber firing that is what pain is. That's really what it is to have pain, is to have your C fibers firing. Um, so we have these behaviors that are diagnostic of something. We say there's something going on here. Um, and it turns out what it is that's going on is C fiber firing. And pain was just our name for whatever it is that's going on there. It's like the polio virus. That is the key thing for having polio. The C fiber firing is the key thing for having pain. Um, OK, so, so much for biological sensations. Um, any quick comments on that? Yeah? Um, if you're, um, if you're not paying attention to your pain, does your sleep batter still, still, still fire? Very good, yeah. Uh, well, I guess it would. I mean, it could, anyway, even though you weren't paying attention to it. Yeah? Um, so the, the mental state doesn't necessarily uh, mean that, you're, that that's the only uh, single target, like, single entity of your mental state, I guess, or the like, defining factor of your mental state. So, so what's not the defining factor? Sorry. Um, like, the C-fiber is not the defining factor. Uh, well, I'm assuming that the C fiber firing would not necessarily declare itself uh, to you. That's what I'm saying about pain not necessarily being self-advertising. That, um, I mean, this room might be a sea of C fiber firing. Yeah, even though people only notice little bits of it here and there. That's what I was suggesting. So, it, C fiber firing does not mean that you're paying attention to it or that it's... Uh... That's right. The C fiber firing is one thing, and whether you're attending to it is another. So, this is one of the points, actually, where it's talking about biology and talking about sensation really seem to start coming apart. Um, I mean, with lightning, uh, say, suppose you see something in the sky, suppose you see something like that, and you think, well, that's lightning, it looks like lightning. Um, but it turns out what it was, was um, the first death ray being fired by an advancing Martian um, um, squadron. Um, well, in that case, I mean, you might think there were more important issues to discuss, but um, whatever that was, it wasn't lightning, right? It wasn't electrical discharge due to ionization. So it could look like lightning, but it's not really lightning because it's not um, electrical discharge due to ionization. Yeah. So it said pain is C fiber firing is like um, the lightning is electrical discharge due to ionization. Um, but if that's right, then um, suppose you think you're experiencing pain, but somebody's got, you, you've got somebody's got a scanner on you, and there's no C fiber firing going on, and they say, well, actually you're fine. It doesn't hurt. You think it hurts. I accept that. But it doesn't really hurt because there isn't any C fiber firing going on. That would be just like the lightning case. You're lying there on the operating table and you're saying to the doctor, for, for the love of God, get me, get me out of this. Um, and the doctor is saying, no, no, look, don't, don't, don't get upset. Um, um, we know it feels like pain, just the same way it looks like lightning. But it's not really pain, so we don't need to worry because there's no C fibers. Um, Putnam actually makes this point in the article. He says, um, you can have a hallucination of a pink elephant. Right, we've all been there, right? You, 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 
you see, you see the pink elephant sitting in the corner of the bar, and um, uh, you think, no, <laughs> I know this one. <laughs> But, so you can certainly hallucinate an, uh, an elephant that's not there, but hallucinations of pain? Does that really make sense? You go to the doctor and you say, I've got these blinding headaches. It, 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 it incapacitates me. And the doctor says, yes, you know, I, I know it feels like that, but actually science has shown that it doesn't hurt at all. Um, next. Um, <laughs> you, well, that, that's not right. You can't have pain hallucinations. It doesn't make sense. If it feels like pain, then it is pain. Yep. Yeah. Maybe more of like a biological question, but then how does this tie into panic or anxiety attacks, which manifest physical symptoms to something that by all accounts is created kind of mentally or emotionally, but possibly genetic um, conditions? But panic attacks are a complex case. Um, here I'm just trying to focus on what you might think is the simple sensation of pain. Yeah? With a panic attack, there's, there's arguably some kind of loop going on between mental and physical. Um, so um, uh, in a panic attack, is it something happens like you're going up the stairs and you're breathing heavily and you think, my God, I'm breathing so heavily and my heart is pounding and that makes you very anxious. And then because you're so anxious, your heart rate goes up and you breathe even more heavily. And you think, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> and and the, it just keeps looping around um, uh, until you're simply incapacitated by the thing. Um, that is quite a complex case. Here we're just trying to focus on the, the, the specifically mental bit, the sensation itself. Um, and that's what I'm saying. You can't have a hallucination of the thing. Um, any situation, here's Putnam, any situation that a person cannot discriminate from a situation in which he himself has a pain counts as a situation in which he has a pain. If it, how should I say, if it looks like a pain and feels like a pain, it is a pain. Yeah, there's no such thing as a look-alike for pain. Um, I have to press on, really, we don't have much time left. Um, um, so a situation that a person can't distinguish from one in which a pink elephant is present is not necessarily count as the presence of a pink elephant, but um, the situation in which you can't discriminate what's going on with you, you can't tell the difference between what's going on with you and, what, uh, and when you have a pain, that is a situation where you have a pain. It makes no sense to talk about hallucinations of pain. Um, so does it really make sense to say that um, Pain is a brain state. Pain is a distinctive brain state. Um, I mean, thinking that you're in pain, feeling that you're in pain, could be a good indicator of the presence of a specific brain state. C fiber firing or whatever it is, whatever your favorite candidate for the brain state is. Um, but your sensations couldn't be an infallible guide to whether you have that brain state. It would always be possible to think you were in that brain state, but not really be in it. So how could pain be a brain state? It doesn't really make sense. If, if it's pain, it's something you they can't have hallucinations of, but brain states you could always make a mistake about. <coughs> you might also think about our old friend, the octopus. Um, I mean, octopuses, I, I, I was just reading something about octopuses where um, uh, one reason octopuses are so interesting is that um, their biology is so different to ours. Um, they are very intelligent. Um, they have very large brains, um, bigger than human brains, though, you know, size isn't everything, but they are very big brains. And, um, uh, and yet their biology is so different to ours, they might as well come from a different planet. But um, couldn't an octopus feel pain even if it doesn't have sea fibers? I mean, if the animal rights people are demonstrating and saying you shouldn't treat octopuses in this cruel way in your research labs, are they going to be happy if you say, yeah, but we've looked and there's no sea fibers there? Um, octopuses could still feel pain for all that, even if their brain biology is completely different to ours. Um, and anyway, um, um, we're always being told that um, 
This is just one small part of a vast universe. Out there, there are millions of stars, millions of planets. Um, couldn't there be intelligent animals out there that talk just as well as you or I, remember just as well as you or I, but they don't have sea fibers? Doesn't it make sense to say, well, they could nonetheless feel pain? Be the capacity for being in pain just can't be the same as the capacity to be in a particular biological state. Because the condition of life, the tragedy is that the condition of life is that no matter what you're made of, if you're intelligent and conscious, then you could experience suffering. On that poignant note, uh, we'll stop for today. Okay. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. So, today, today, class, we move into the world of present day discussion and debate. We move into the modern world. Um, today, we start in on functionalism, which is probably the most important single idea in philosophy of mind and experimental psychology in the last uh, 50 years. And we look at Hilary Putnam's article, The Nature of Mental States. On Friday, we'll look at uh, Ned Block's paper, Troubles with Functionalism. Um, I just want to say something about the reading. I, I take it that many of you are finding the reading difficult. <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, the, the th even though it's so short, right? So the thing to do with the reading, ideally, uh, I know you guys are very hard pressed with other stuff and so on, but ideally what you do is, you do the reading, then you come to lecture, and after lecture, you do the reading again, um, and then you go to section, and after section, you do the reading again. Um, and if you have any spare time, you do it again. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, the idea is that in, in these lectures, I will give you kind of headlines that I, I will try to single out what I think the most important single idea in the reading is. Um, in section, you get to discuss the details, but the idea is, but it doesn't work unless you yourself are doing the reading in between times. You see what I mean? So the idea is that we know the readings are difficult um, but the whole point of the process is if you work back and forth between the readings, lecture, and section, it gets you there. Okay, anyway, um, um, Ned Block's Troubles with Functionalism for um, Friday. Okay, so let's start out by saying what functionalism, uh, what, what motivates functionalism, where it comes from. And then we're going to look at what functionalists might say about consciousness, about the existence of subjective experience. So in that Putnam article, um, in the Putnam article we're looking at today, he starts out raising the question, is pain a brain state? We say there isn't any ectoplasm, or if there is, we've no idea what it is or how it's meant to work. If you cast around in the, in the universe for where you might find pain, it looks like it must be the brain. And what else could it be but a state of your brain? Um, and Putnam says, well, the, the natural resistance you have to that is that my concept of pain, my understanding of what pain is, the understanding you get when someone sticks a pin into you, that's not an understanding of a brain state. The way the thing feels, the um, sharp, jagged awfulness of it, um, th 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 that's not, doesn't seem like it's just your C fibers firing. How could that be the same thing? And Putnam says, that's right that the concept of pain is not the same as the concept of a brain state. But um, that's like the case with lightning. When you see these flashes in the sky and someone tells you as a child, that's lightning, and you say, wow, scary, or interesting, or whatever you react, then um, and that's not the concept of the discharge of um, 
electricity due to ionization. That's a different kind of concept. Nonetheless, it's one and the same thing. So you might be thinking about pain in a very different way to the way you think about a brain state, but nonetheless, pain could just be a state of the brain. So it could be that pain just is the firing of C fibers. It's one and the same thing. And Putnam's key point against this is the point that we ended with last time. It's, um, it is a technical name, but it's not a very difficult idea. The, the name is variable realizability. The point is, if you can find, this is Putnam, if you can find even one psychological predicate which can be clearly applied to both a mammal and an octopus, despite the big physiological differences between them, and the physical chemical correlate is quite different in the two cases, then the brain state theory has collapsed. That's to say, if you find that humans have pain and octopuses have pain, but in humans, what you're getting is C-fiber firing, and octopuses don't even have C-fibers to fire. They've got some quite different um, kind of uh, brain chemistry. Then um, that psychological state, the sensation of pain, can't be just the same thing as C-fiber firing, because then octopuses wouldn't have it. So if octopuses have pain despite having a quite different physiology to us, then pain can't be just the same thing as C-fiber firing. It can't be just the same thing as a state of your brain. So that's variable realizability. You get one psychological state, and the correlate over in the brain might be quite different in different cases. I mean, last time I, was, I, I, I mentioned the possibility of aliens. Um, octopuses are really the closest thing to an intelligent alien we know, because they are physiologically so very different to us. But surely out there in the distant stars, there may be things that feel pain, even though their brain chemistry is quite different to ours. And in fact, um, there's a lot of variation in the human brain. I mean, but one of the first things that um, people who work on brain imaging learn is about what's distinctive of their own brains. I remember um, uh, a, a brain researcher telling me that when she was a graduate student, she found out that her hippocampus was particularly large. And, um, you know, the current state of brain research is very hard to know whether she should be congratulated or whether you should sympathize with her. Um, but, uh, you know, we don't really know what the significance of all that variation is. But there is a lot of difference among uh, people, uh, different people's brains. I mean, if, for example, someone goes blind, then the visual pathways in the brain are not being used for vision anymore. And what happens is that the brain takes them over, um, starts to use those structures for different purposes. There may be different structures in the brain being used um, for the same purpose in uh, different humans. And in fact, in a single individual across time, suppose you um, lose a leg um, and uh, the surgeons say to you, we have this fantastic um, replica or uh, artificial leg we can give you. You couldn't tell the difference between that and the real thing. It's not made of regular flesh and bone. It's made of uh, silicon, but um, it works fantastically. You'd have to be insane to say, yeah, but it's not a real leg if it's not made of flesh and bone, so I don't want it. If it'll work just fine, then you take it. A leg is a leg. If it works like a leg, it operates in every way like a leg, that's fine. That's all you want. Similarly, if, you're, if let's say your vision is failing and uh, the scientists say, um, well, uh, what we have, suppose you're in a big car crash, your brain has been partly destroyed, but they say, we can rebuild her. <laughs> and um, they put in all kinds of implants into you. In particular, they put all kinds of implants into your brain so that in, in your visual system in the brain, they put in, um, I don't really have the technical vocabulary to describe exactly what happens, but they put in chips, let's say, um, into the visual system in your brain. Um, then what's going on in the physiology of vision in you is quite different to what goes on in a regular person. A regular person has these um, um, cellular pathways. You have a bunch of chips there. 
But you can see fine. You wouldn't say, that's not seeing because um, I don't have uh, uh, the regular physiology. You'd say, this is great. This is exactly the way it was before. I can see just fine. So even in a single individual across time, you might have different physiologies for the very same mental state. So the mental state just can't be one and the same thing as a particular kind of physiology. But if you ask, well, nonetheless, there seems to be some similarity between all these different creatures or all these different people with the same kind of psychological state. Their brains are all wired up in the same kind of way. The organizational structure of their brains is similar. Maybe that's the key thing. I mean, in the thing from Putnam we were looking at last week, I said, well, look, um, he's thinking of it like you have this behavioral diagnosis of a single underlying cause for pain. So you notice that there's this syndrome where people hit their thumb, hop about, um, yell and so on, and you say there's a single cause there, that's caused by hitting your thumb, and uh, then that causes all these behaviours. Um, you put it like that, um, the way, uh, this is just trying to identify C fibre firing, but the thing is maybe what is important is not which particular bit of physiology is here, it's just that there's some bit of physiology or other that's playing that role. So, someone who says pain is just C-fiber firing is using the functional role, the kind of inputs and outputs to this, the way it's structured, as a way of finding out about a physi bit of physiology. But functionalism says it's not the brain state in itself that's the important thing. It's that there is something or other there whether it's C fiber firing or a chip or whatever an octopus has, it's something or other that plays that role that is wired up in that kind of way to the rest of the system. And you might take a much simpler example here, like the notion of a door. Okay, so right from where I am, I can see three different doors. Um, what a door is, is something that it plays a particular role in the structure. If you shut it, you can't get out. If you open it, you can get out. Um, that's what a door does. Um, you can make it of lots of different stuff, but if it's playing that role in the system, then it is a door, whether it's made of glass or wood or a kind of force field or um, ice. Um, so functionalism is saying what matters is the role this thing plays in the whole system. So if you think how it works for pain, Here's how, a, here's how a functionalist characterization of pain might begin. You say, there is a state here which you go into this state if you get a bodily injury. And maybe remembering those footballers and um, people who don't attend to their pains and so on, maybe you have to attend to. So if you have a bodily injury and you attend to it, then that causes this state. And given that you're in that state, then You'll try and avoid whatever's causing the bodily injury. You'll uh, try and protect the injured part. You'll hop, you'll suck your thumb, you'll do all that stuff. Um, provided you're not too inhibited. I mean, if, as I'm talking to you right now, I get the most agonizing pain, I promise you, my, I, I would rise to the occasion and you wouldn't be able to tell. Um, and I know it's the same for you guys. Um, that um, depending on your level of inhibition, um, you just might not display any of those behaviours. On the other hand, if you're feeling pretty free, um, you might give, uh, uh, exhibit the full range. So this is a way of identifying pain by its role in the whole system, not by whether actually, what brain state it actually is, that is C-fiber firing or whatever, just by what it is doing here. So a functionalist says that's what pain is. Um, Remember um, uh, poor old Carnap trying to define excited by saying um, you're excited if you uh, have the microstructure that's characterized by a high pulse of rate and, of rate and high pulse and a high rate of breathing, and you give vehement and factually unsatisfactory answers to questions. 
Well, the thing about that is, um, of course, you could be excited without displaying any of those behaviors. But that's because mental states don't generate behaviors one at a time. It's usually a whole ensemble of mental states that together generate your behavior. So if you're excited, you might act in the way Carnap describes um, if you're being asked to answer questions at the same time. Um, if you're not particularly inhibited, um, but really you may be a kind of super Spartan about excitement. You may not want to exhibit any of those symptoms. You may be highly excited and the form it takes is that to anyone observing you, you just look more and more languid and mellow. So sometimes when people, I mean soldiers on a battlefield or actually students in an examination, sometimes fall asleep as a reaction to the high stress. Um, uh, <laughs> there are other reasons for that too, but um, w w one, reason, w one point is if you raise someone's stress highly enough, you simply can't get sleep as an outcome. And it depends what the rest of the psychology of the individual is. So the thing about, um, this is a very simple example, but the thing about this kind of diagram is that pain is generating behavior only together with other psychological states, what your level of inhibition is, whether you're doing something else at the time, whether you're trying to focus on something else. So you can't define these states one by one, the way Carnap was trying to do. You can't say excitement always generates this kind of behavior because it's always excitement together with other psychological states of yours that generates the behavior. Okay. That's the basic idea of functionalism. Talking about the mind is talking, talking about a kind of um, flow chart, a kind of box and arrow diagram. Yep. I'm sorry, you have to do that much louder. Okay. The functional role of pain and the functional role of brain states, uh-huh. Okay, I say, um, you can ha uh, since we live in a physical world, you can, have, you can be in a state that has the functional role of pain only if you're in a suitable brain state. So your brain states must have those functional roles. There's nothing around to have this functional role except something physical. But it might not be the same physical thing every time just as long as something is playing that role in the, orga or in the organization. Yeah. And you might think of it like this, if you're describing the workings of a big corporation, say the Apple Corporation, you might say, well, there are these basic parts to the thing. There's um, um, the design uh, section, there's marketing, there's the physical plant where the thing is actually made, there's uh, distribution, um, there's uh, uh, the sales office, all these different things, you're describing in black box terms how the thing is all wired up. Now all these systems are there in the physical world. It's not that you're kind of dualist about the Apple Corporation and think it's made of ectoplasm or something. Um, it really is just physical stuff. But what matters for it being the marketing department or um, the sales department or the physical plant is not what it's made of, it's what it does in the whole system. So describing the mind is like that. You're describing someone's brain as if it was a big corporation, and you're describing what everything's doing in this person's brain, how it's all wired up. That's what getting a sense of the mind is. Perfectly happy with that? What else could it be? Yes. Oh, sorry, thank you for raising Okay. Okay, well, um, here's um, an attempt to really uh, do this um, fairly explicitly. Here's um, uh, Daniel Dennett um, explaining uh, what it is to have a conscious life. So if you're looking at an animal, uh, if you're looking at the octopus or an earthworm or a squid or something, and wondering is that thing conscious? What you're asking is something about how the thing is structured, how it's all put together. 
And here's the flowchart for consciousness here. This is what it takes to have a conscious life, is that you be structured like this. So um, let me break this down a bit. This is kind of a complicated diagram. But basically, um, I will blow this up in a minute. I don't mean um, show it's false, but um, expand it um, in a minute. And uh, basically, the picture is that here on the left is um, perception, perceptual processing. Here in the, in the middle is something to do with um, what, you, what questions you're asking about your surroundings and what you're making of all this perceptual processing. And here on the right is something about language output, how language is being generated in response to perception. So this is a very complex diagram, but think of a situation in which someone is just shown um, um, an object like a, a pointer and asked, what color is that? What color is this? Very good, okay. Um, right. <laughs> well, th 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 for that to happen, for you to give an answer as straightforward as that, um, a lot has to be going on. Um, this is not really as visible as I hoped it would be, but um, here, to take my word for it, <laughs> what this is doing, um, here we have perception coming in. So your brain is getting hit by a lot of stuff from vision right now. You're getting the immensely complex array of the whole class, just as you look around you. Um, uh, and that's all being um, presented to you simultaneously. Uh, and you can hold on to that in memory for a little bit. If you shut your eyes, you can still remember for a few moments just what the scene was before you shut your eyes. Um, you figure out, well, which thing am I asking about? You're asking about this, you're selecting this from the whole array. Um, you attend to this, to, to this aspect and then these answers as to what color you're dealing with are delivered by perception uh, to some central system. Then at the central system, it says, okay, um, um, the question I was asking has just got an answer. It's not that implausible. It probably is black, that thing. Um, and then you have to generate the speech. Um, you have to think, you have to decide what it is you want to say. And then you have to select the right bits of language to say that, to select the right kind of grammatical structure. Um, and uh, then actually generate the speech to say that thing's black. So looking at the details here is going to be pretty complex. This is figuring out what your brain's doing there. But if you have this kind of structure, where you have this kind of perceptual input, um, uh, this kind of central system figuring out what to do about the perceptual input, and um, this kind of output system, then that's what it is to be conscious. That's what it is to have a subjective life. That's the basics of it. That. That's Dennett's theory of consciousness. Um, it's still one of the most important theories of consciousness there. So you might think of it like, um, when I was um, uh, a child, I've spent many happy hours with this kind of diagram. Have, you, have any of you guys ever seen this kind of diagram? This is a simple wiring diagram. OK, very good. This is a simple wiring diagram. Can, can you see what happens here? Suppose you close the switch here. Can you guess what happens? Very good. Um, OK, so uh, just breaking, just, just to labor the point, just to spell this out. Um, this is a switch. It's got an open position. If it's got an open position, then um, no current can flow in the wire. Um, if you close it, then current can flow in the wire. You've got a battery that generates the current. You've got a lamp that goes on if current flows um, through the wire to it and out again. Um, so that's all plain enough, right? There's nothing non-physical there. Put up your hand if you think this is a non-physical system. OK. Put up your hand if you think this is going to be physical. OK, very good. That seems to be the right answer. But then. What is the wire made of? Any offers? What, what, what would you say the wire is made of? Copper? Put up your hand. Gold? 
That's the right answer. You don't know what it's made of. It's made of something or other that conducts electricity, right? So you can't, just as you can't say pain is sea fiber firing, because there are lots of different things you can make pain of, you can't say this wire is made of copper. It might be, but there are lots of different things you can make a conductor from. If you ask, but what physical stuff is this? It could be lots of different physical stuffs. If you ask, what is the switch made of? Well, same answer, answer, what is the bulb made of? Could be lots of different answers here. Saying, um, being a wire just is being made of copper is the wrong answer. Because these um, notions like being a conductor or being a battery or being a lamp, these are variably realizable. Nonetheless, um, when you know this kind of switching diagram for um, a simple circuit like that, you know how to work it. You don't need to know what it's made of. You still know how to work it. If I'm trying to operate the electrical machinery in this room, then um, I don't need to know what the wiring in the walls is made of. I don't need to know any of that stuff, but I do need to know something about this switch is connected to that lamp. Um, this switch sends the um, um, screen up and down. Um, you need to have some kind of diagram like this in your head. If you have that wiring diagram in your head um, for how all the switches and various devices in the room are hooked up, then you can operate it. You know how to interact with the electronics in the room. Similarly, if you're talking to another human being, then you don't need to know what they're made of. You don't need to know anything about their brain physiology. But you do, if you're going to interact effectively with other people, then what you need to know is, how should I say, what you need to know is how to push their buttons. Um, you need to have in your head some kind of wiring diagram for other people that will tell you what's connected to what. If I say this, that will remind them of that, and that will make them really upset. Um, that's how we work with each other the whole time. Uh, it's more complex than interacting. I mean, I find interacting with the electronics in this room pretty complicated, um, but humans are much more complicated. But what you're doing when you're understanding how to work with other people is getting some functional diagram like this of how they're all connected together and what all the factors are that you affect when you talk, deal with them and what kind of range of outputs you will get for what kind of inputs. That's the important thing about interacting with other people and that is what you're doing when you find out about their psychological lives. When you find out, I mean there's a little kind of vocabulary in this kind of diagram you know, you've got a concept of a switch here, a concept of a lamp, a concept of a conductor. When you learn concepts like jealousy, or when you learn that there is such a thing as jealousy, what you're getting is a new bit that you can now slot in to your diagram of the way a human being works. Um, there's a bit here that you hadn't realized existed before, but now you know there's this way people can behave, um, given the right kind of inputs, and given that they've got the right kind of other psychological states. Um, that's why I talk about the mind matters. Um, that's why it's so important to all of us that you have a good understanding of what's going on with other people's psychologies. Um, it's not that you're getting some information about what they're made of. You're getting information about how to interact with them. So when someone in, um, when I was talking about pain um, a couple of lectures ago, someone said, uh, you're talking about this pain sensation, but what is that? That's the kind of question Descartes was trying to answer when, he, when he's saying it's a bit of non-physical stuff. It's an aspect of non-physical stuff. Or um, uh, when you say pain is C fiber firing, you're trying to give a deep answer to the question, what is that sensation of pain? That's the question that seems so hard. But on this analysis, on this way of thinking about it, um, there's something superficial about the concept of pain. It's like asking, what is a switch really? I want a deep answer to the question, 
What is the essence of a switch? And then you say, well, really, they must be made of Bakelite. Um, <laughs> or really, they must be made of something non-physical. Um, all there is to being a switch is the role you play in the system. There's no deep answer to be given to the question, what is the sensation of pain really? When you know how pain functions in the whole system, that's all there is to know about what pain is. And similarly, when you know um, what, what, how a switch functions in the whole system, you know what a switch really is. OK? Is it, yep. Yeah, they all have different roles, yeah. So, in, in pain, aren't there several things that go into it? It's not that simple. Right. Well, what I'm thinking is, um, if you ask how this whole system is going to behave, is the lamp going to go on or not? It will depend not just on how the switch is, but on how the battery is, and on whether you've got it wired up right. Yeah, is, is that kind of the point? There's a kind of complexity to the way the behavior... I'm not, I don't think this is very complex, but it's a little bit complicated. Yeah? That's your point? But it's, it's simpler than pain. But <laughs> right, right, right. But in the case of pain, um, even in this very simple diagram for pain, um, uh, you have the same kind of complexity. Um, I mean, if you're going to spell it out, exactly what's going on here, you'd say, um, well, uh, um, if you're very uninhibited, then you will get, and it has been a bang on the thumb, then you will get hopping about. Just like with the um, electrical circuit, if you have got the switch and the battery and the lamp in place, then you will get the lamp going on. So here, if you have all this wired up right, then you will get the behaviors of hopping about and so on. Yeah. So I think it, it if I'm following your question, it's the same kind of complexity. I mean, they could both be made a lot more complicated, right? And, uh, uh, this is just the beginning of, of where you would go on this kind of approach. But it's the same kind of complexity in both cases. You could have a much more complicated electrical diagram for, say, the wiring in this room. Um, you could have a much more realistic, complicated diagram for how pain affects behavior. Yeah? Um, but it's the same kind of enterprise both times. You're just ramping up the complexity of the same type of approach. Is, is that addressing your question? Yeah. Uh, yep. Very good. Um, um, we will actually discuss that very question next uh, on Friday. <laughs> um, but that's right. It, on the face of it, it seems to be an, an absolute implication of, of, of the view that the Apple Corporation does feel pain. Um, and doesn't it feel pain? I mean, when the Newton bombed, you guys probably don't remember the Newton, but um, when Apple puts out a device that bombs, does the corporation not feel pain? Do we not feel its joy when sales soar? No? <laughs> um, Putnam puts in a kind of qualifier at one point in his article. Um, he says uh, um, something like, so long as the units realizing these states aren't themselves sentient. Yeah. So as long as the, these um, uh, states are not actually gen generated by more people. But it's very hard to see why he puts that in. Yeah, it just seems to be ad hoc. And the thing is, we do talk about corporations feeling some kinds of emotions. We say a takeover bid is aggressive. It doesn't mean that anybody in the board is feeling particularly aggressive. You see what I mean? You do talk about corporations in those terms. Um, and it is always a question how seriously to take it. But in the functionalist approach, it really does seem to mean that we should take it completely seriously. 
these corporations feel psych uh, uh, have subjective lives in just the same way as you or I. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, if there is an, um, excellent robot. If an excellent robot. Yeah, and um, we can design it and um, dispatch a better husband. Yes. Like you want to say, ouch, or you want to say, um, and it's hurt, or as it can. But I think we won't say that the robot has to be like A robot could be this kind of functional system. That's right, a robot could be this kind of functional system, no question about that. That's exactly what they're doing in artificial intelligence, is trying to build robots that have this kind of functional system. But when you think about it, what they're doing is the whole project is artificial intelligence. They're trying to make robots that can think and feel. Now, they can certainly make ro you, you and I are agreeing, they can certainly make robots that are functionally the same as you or I. Um, but doesn't, doesn't such a robot think and feel? Isn't that just speciesism? I mean, you're saying, um, it's not a nice warm flesh and blood thing like you or me. It's a nasty, um, cold, metal, um, jaggy, hurt yourself if you touch it kind of thing. So we're not going to say that thing feels pain. If you're going to say it feels pain, you'd have to feel sympathy for it and be worried about torturing it or, you know, causing it unnecessary pain. But it's only a robot. That's how people used to think about their slaves. Um, you know, isn't that just speciesism? Or, it's not even speciesism actually, it's, I mean, it's kind of flesh and bloodism, is <laughs> being of a species as opposed to not being of a species. Uh, yeah, um, I'm not actually sure what, what's the word for that? <laughs> okay, um, you, you see what I mean, anyway. Yeah, I mean, if someone says that fish, fish, how could fish feel pain? Well, because they're nasty, cold, scaly, fishy-eyed kind of creatures. That's not a good reason for saying fish can't feel pain, is it? <laughs> we will come back to this many times. Uh, the, the, uh, yes, there's a question at the back. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, just a second. You, you had a question? I thought there was a question in the back, but it's gone away. Okay, yeah. Do you think this system works identically to non-physical things? Non-physical things? Non-physical pain. Uh, <laughs> like, uh, it's hurt in general. Hurt. I don't know, it depends what you mean non-physical pain. There is such a thing as chronic pain, where the definition is something like, um, I, I, and I think this is the most common psychological disorder in the US actually, um, it's um, pain where there is no identifiable organic cause. Yeah. Uh, it's a really tough condition because since this organic cause can't be identified, it's very hard to treat it with drugs or direct treatment, direct physical treatment. Um, I mean, nonetheless, even in cases of organic pain, of, sorry, of chronic pain, where you can't identify the, the biological basis, there surely is some kind of biological basis for that. The brain of someone who's got um, chronic pain is going to be different to the brain of someone who hasn't got, organic, or who hasn't got chronic pain, um, even if we don't, aren't able to pinpoint the difference. So although there's no identified physical basis there, it's still ultimately something physical going on. Like, what do you mean non-physical pain? I mean, like, if, if you, a close family member or a friend does something to hurt. Oh, the pain in the heart. Yeah. Right, oh, I see, yes, right, right. Of course, yes, no, that, no, I, I, I mean, isn't that the worst pain of all? Um, <laughs> well, no, actually. <laughs> um, but you're right. How come that's pain? It's not caused by a bodily injury. Yeah. Um, I guess, well, look, here's one way to think of it. It, it, it. This might not be right, but here's one way to think of it. That what we've got here is a kind of analogy between this kind of functional structure and another kind of functional structure. Um, you know, I say, um, I got a wound in my leg from that, uh, um, from that old hunting trip. Um, and uh, we talk about a wound in my heart um, um, from that terrible vacation. Um, or um, uh, I say, you injured me. 
You injured me terribly when you left. Um, we talk in those kind of, I mean, it feels kind of analogical when you talk like that, yeah? And you talk about these wounds and injuries um, that are psychological as if they were bodily injuries. And you say, well, and how someone behaves in reaction to that will actually depend on factors like their level of inhibition, yeah? Um, I might every night ring up all my friends at 1 a.m. and weep on the phone, um, or I might um, go about my life just as usual, depending on the rest of my psychology. Um, but it's structurally very similar to the functional structure of physical pain. Yeah, that's why we call them both pain. And it feels kind of analogical. Yeah. Uh, yeah? Chronic pain may just be depression. Uh, no. <laughs> um, well, but, I mean, I mean I'm, not an, uh, I, I'm not an authority on this, but what the authorities on this do say is that they're not the same thing. I mean, a diagno uh, if a psychiatrist gives a diagnosis of chronic pain, that's a quite different diagnosis uh, to a diagnosis of depression. The um, causes and therapies would be quite different in the two cases. Yeah. I mean, chronic pain is like an ongoing sensation that you have to manage even if you're fundamentally optimistic and cheerful in your outlook. You, you, you see what I mean? Yeah. Whereas depression is a different thing. There may be no sensation, nothing you could identify. Yeah. Okay, is that plain as day? So this is such an important idea. If, if, if there's any kind of basic unclarity in what I've been saying, then, um, yeah. <laughs> I, well, my own hunch would be it depends quite how bad the pain is, but um, I don't see why not. People do, people, you know, some people just are incredibly resilient and do manage it, um, you know, if you have a strong social circuit around you. They, they, they seem to be different things. Intuitively, pain is a matter of a sensation. Happiness is a much more um, ongoing kind of thing than just having, it's not that being happy is a matter of having continuous jolts of pleasure, right? Uh, th th these are different things, yeah. Very good. Um, this is, uh, yeah, the, the, the masochism is a very good question. Um, so um, if, you go, if you go into this state, if the masochist goes into this state, um, um, it might not um, generate uh, avoidance behavior it might generate seeking more of it behavior or seeking to tune it just so finely and delightfully <laughs> kind of behavior. <laughs> yeah, so th this, th this whole diagram just has to be a lot more complex. I mean, if you really are a masochist, then um, the rest of your psychology is presumably going to be quite different to that of someone who's not a masochist. There's going to be some surrounding differences. Yeah. Okay, we've, we only have a couple of minutes left, and I just want to um, make a remark about why this approach is uh, so important. Well, first of all, to say more generally, how you describe a system functionally. The general idea of a functional description is it's a very abstract way of describing a system. Um, you say you describe, the t you, really what you want for a complete functional description is a catalog of all the states the system can go into, what the inputs to the system are, and what kind of outputs the system can be in. So suppose you have a system in state S1. A functional description is going to have to explain for every um, possible input here what kind of output you get. So if you're in state S1, I mean, suppose, for example, you're feeling kind of grumpy. Right, you woke up kind of grumpy. So there you are in state S1, you're feeling kind of grumpy, and there you've got a sensory input. Someone asks you a stupid question. Um, so then you give as output, you yell at them. Um, um, you don't answer the question, you just yell at them and reduce them to rubble. Um, and you yourself note you were in state S1 before, you were just plain feeling grumpy, and now you're going to state S2, which is feeling grumpy, but still a bit um, regretful and embarrassed. And um, then now you're in state S2, feeling not just grumpy, but a bit embarrassed. And then someone comes along and you get the same sensory input output, same sensory input as before. Someone else asks you a stupid question. But this time your motor output is different. 
This time, you give them a civil answer um, because you're kind of embarrassed about what happened last time. So there you are. Um, um, uh, 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 after a few of these exchanges, and you're now in a much more complex state, feeling embarrassment, grumpiness, um, and a desire for revenge in the world that has <laughs> made life so tough for you. Um, so you're going to behave in a yet further way when you get the next input. So for each state like this, for each st state you can go into, what you want is um, a catalogue of all the possible inputs to that state. And then as outputs, all the states you go into for each of these inputs and all the outputs you generate for each of these inputs. Um, and at the most general level, that's what describing something functionally is. It's a very abstract way of describing a system, and it's a very powerful way of describing a system. So, um, for every possible combination of a state of the system and a complete set of sensory inputs, you can determine the probability of the next state you go into and the probability of the outputs that you generate. That's what it is. I mean, that's a perfectly precise but very abstract definition of a functional system. Now, I just want um, finally to remark that um, this has really been the guiding idea of experimental psychology for the last 50 years. Let, let me give an example. The, the way it goes in experimental psychology is, um, suppose you're interested in vision, then this is, I, I, I take this as just a characteristic example. The way you go at studying the mind is by studying the brain. and. Uh, the eyes are over here on the left, um, and the eyes send uh, signals to the visual cortex right at the back of the head. And then the visual pathways go in two directions from the back of you. It goes from the eyes to the back of the head, and then a bit goes up to the top, and a bit goes down to the bottom. And what you want to know is what's going on here? What is happening in ordinary vision? This is an aspect of the mind. This is actually the... Um, most successful part of present day cognitive psychology. Um, so what's going on in these two pathways? Well, the first thing you do is just break it down into um, the bits and pieces of physiology you get here. Um, and you say, okay, there's the retina feeding back to the back of the head via these different pathways, um, uh, and um, uh, then going off um, to the top and the bottom to the parietal cortex and the temporal cortex. But that doesn't really tell you what is going on in vision. That's the start. But what you want to know is, what are they all doing? What are those cells all doing? And the kind of answer you get is the cell, the, the pathway that's going uh, to the uh, top of the head is involved in object recognition. So what's going on? in those various pathways is that, for example, here um, you're getting inputs um, that from which the shape of the thing is being generated. You're getting identification of the shape as output. You're getting identification in another pathway. You're getting identification of color, the color of the thing as output. Um, in the other pathway, what you're getting is not something that lets you recognize it and say that it's a cup or whatever, but just something that lets you know how to reach for it, how to grasp it. So uh, you need both, right, in everyday life. You need to know that it's a cup, and you need to be able to grasp it on the basis of vision. And these two pathways are doing different things. So this is very um, light and schematic, but what the scientific study of the mind has been doing for the last 50 years is generating uh, ever more complex, precise, and detailed functional characterizations of how the brain is working. And for these characterizations of uh, the way vision works and the way vision relates to your ability to say what's in front of you and your ability to do things with what's in front of you, um, at this level, at this functional level of characterization, it doesn't actually matter what the brain is made of. What matters is the functional structure of the whole thing. Okay, so that's what functionalism is, and uh, that's why it's so important in our current approaches to the mind. Okay, more on Friday. Thanks. Good afternoon, class. <laughs> okay. Hi. Um, 
OK, so today we're going to look a bit further at uh, functionalism and uh, Ned Block's um, objection to functionalism that was actually anticipated by someone's question in the last class um, that we're going to go over today. Uh, for Monday, there's a paper by Martina Niederrumelan um, in the Chalmers collection called Pseudo-Normal Vision. So tr try and look at that for uh, Monday. Okay, I want to start off today by uh, just going over a bit wh what functionalism is saying and why there's an appeal to functionalism. And then look at Bloch's example um, of, I, I guess it's a kind of robot, really, um, that is now popularly known as a blockhead. Um, and then look at how that connects back to questions about variable realizability and self-knowledge that we looked at already. So why is functionalism an appealing idea? Well, there's a, scientists do often say things like pain is sea fiber firing, or the feeling of sorrow has turned out to be an electrochemical discharge. And there's a natural reaction to this kind of statement, which is simply a kind of wonder. I mean, how in the world could that be? I mean, imagine I came in and said, I've just heard, uh, it's been discovered, the number nine, the number nine is a small rock. I have it here. There have been years of collaboration between the maths and physics departments, and they found out it's this rock. Who knew? All over the world, the hunt is already on for the number 10. <laughs> and there they are. It's the same thing. And if you heard that, uh, the natural reaction would not be, Gee whiz, isn't it fantastic what progress they're making in the science and maths departments? Um, the, the right reaction would be, what in the world are they taking up there? Um, how could the number nine be a small rock? It makes no sense. And similarly, when you're told um, sorrow is an electrochemical discharge, the natural reaction is, this ache in my heart how, it makes no sense. How could that be an electrochemical discharge? I mean, it's not enough to be told, well, scientists have said it. You have to have some grasp of how such a thing could be true. How could it be true? And one reason functionalism is appealing is it gives you a way of seeing what might be going on with that kind of claim that the feeling of sorrow is an electrical discharge. Um, functionalism says, look, I can describe to you the functional structure of sorrow like this. Humans have the following characteristics. Um, when there's a tragic event in their lives, it goes something like this. When there's a tragic event in their lives, um, there's this state they go into. This state has a little bit of complexity. Um, it affects their further emotions, their, um, their mood, their uh, tendency to ruminate, to go over and over again, bitter regret, oh, if only I'd done this and if only I'd done that, which feeds back into their emotions, which feeds back into this uh, original state, and that in turn feeds back into what they tend to brood about, and so on. Something like that is where you'd start, anyway describing the functional role of sorrow. You say, what makes you go into this state and what happens once you're in that state? And the thing is, that's what scientists use when they're trying to find what the uh, biological basis is um, of a psychological state. What the scientist does is, in every single case in which a scientist says, look, the biology of emotion is this, or um, the sensations in perception can be found here. What they're doing is they're saying, let's look at the typical causes of this experience, and let's look at what they do to your brain. And let's look at what being in that brain state does to your subsequent output, to your subsequent behavior, and how it affects other states of yours. And then when you find 
a brain state that's operating in the same way, playing that functional role that the psychological state does. That's what makes you say um, the feeling of sorrow is the electrical discharge or uh, the pain is the C-fiber firing. The pain is the state, the biological state, that's caused by a bodily injury and it results in all these pain behaviors. So one appeal of functionalism is it um, gives you a way of understanding how the brain could have something to do with the mind. It's where you pinpoint the point of contact between the brain and the mind in this kind of functional uh, structure. And there is a kind of basic problem here is, I just made this up, um, and uh, I, even I can see it's not that great as a characterization of the functional role of sorrow. And you, many of you could probably do better. So, but how do you know what the functional role is of sorrow? Um, there are a couple of different ways you might think about this. One is that it's um, a matter of the meaning of the word sorrow. When you learn the English words, what you're learning is a definition really in terms of functional role. I don't know that that's tremendously convincing. Here's an analogy. Um, suppose you think of someone playing basketball. Boop, 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 boop. Um, and <laughs> you know the kind of thing. Um, and um, there's a, there can be a great deal of skill in that, in interacting with the other players. You know what's going to happen if you go do this. You know what's going to happen if you do that. You know your best shot, way to get a shot is this. Um, the thing is, the guys who are actually very good at the game are not necessarily very good at telling you what they're doing so well, if you see what I mean. If you ask them, um, how do you do that kind of shot? You might get something like, well, I train hard. Um, you know, you, you won't necessarily get a very good explicit articulation of what is going on. Um, and you could think of interacting with other people in practice, engaging with other people socially, uh, engaging with other people's psychological lives, as kind of like playing basketball in that sense, that there's a practical skill here. Some people are really good at it, some people are not so good at it, some people are kind of clumsy. Um, but what's going on is that Actually, in this case and in the basketball case, you've got a practical skill of engaging with someone else's functional structure. You have the art of knowing which button to touch to make them feel better, or if you're feeling mean, which button to touch to make them feel worse. Um, you know how to do it. You know how to talk this round. You know how to get them through it. Um, but that's not necessarily a matter of being able to say what's going on. Um, you say what's going on, you might, if someone asks you, you might actually give all the wrong answers. Um, if you're asked explicitly to write this out, you might not be that good at it, but you might be a real whiz at it um, in actually engaging with other people. And putting it around the other way, even if you're very good at saying explicitly what it is, I mean a basketball player um, who can write a manual on how to play the game might be terrible in practice. And someone who's um, really good at characterizing the functional structures of psychological states um, explicitly might be just a terrible person to be around. Um, uh, so uh, there are a lot of different takes you could have on how we know what the functional structure of a mental state is. You could say, well, it's because you've learned the word. Or you could say, no, it's not that you can explicitly say what the functional structure is. You might say, is something that you use in interacting with one another and uh, it's something that you really have it, it's a kind of implicit knowledge you have, a kind of practical knowledge that you have. Um, and when you try and say it, when you try and make it articulate, you might actually go wrong. You might be much better in practice in dealing with other people than you could really show when you try and write down everything you know about the life of other people's minds. Or actually, there's another way you could go. You could say, well, um, actually, we, we, we need a scientific approach here. Science is going to tell us um, what the functional structure of sorrow is. Um, that would be a different approach. OK, so so much initially for the appeal of functionalism. Um, it helps you understand um, how psychological states might be connected to the brain. 
And um, uh, you can see how having that grasp of functional structure in everyday life is really a real world skill. It's really important to have that. I mean, there probably isn't any other factor in human life that's as important as having that practical capacity to negotiate with other people socially. OK? Yeah? Couldn't the feeling of sorrow be replaced with the exact opposite of being very much joyful? Couldn't, couldn't, it be, couldn't it work the exact same way if you consider that into your diagram? So joy is here? Oh, oh, I see. I, okay, there are two scenarios. Uh, first, I thought you had in mind a scenario where when I see a tragic event, my heart sings. And <laughs> when my heart sings, I get very gloomy. Um, that, 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 that's not what you mean, right? Uh, if you replace the tragic event with something good that happens. Yeah, um, yeah you, you could say uh, uh, th that might give you a model for how it's going to work. And you could say, well, the, the mood over here is not negative, the mood is positive. Um, the ruminations tend to be happy ruminations and not wildly regretful ruminations. All that kind of thing, yeah? yeah. You can just do it as a mirror image. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it would need a lot of detailed work, actually, to, to really think that through. Um, um, I think, OK, I don't want to go too far into this particular example, right? But, but it's fair enough to say you could take that kind of structure and use it again and again, yeah. Uh, but that's all right. I mean, eventually, some of the output connections would be different. Yeah, because um, uh, well, does it, because there's just all the difference in the world between the behaviour of someone who's experiencing great sorrow and the behaviour of someone who's experiencing joy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can tell that you know the difference. Can you repeat that? Sorry. Can you repeat that? You do know the. I mean, the, the output behaviour of someone experiencing great sorrow is typically different to the output behaviour of someone experiencing great joy. Yeah, I mean, if their arms are in the air and they're shouting, hooray, <laughs> then it's likely not the sort of one. Um, yeah. Okay. So there are going to be differences at some points. Um, but also, isn't, what is the, the point of having emotions there? Because isn't sorrow the emotion? Yeah, I, I, the point of having the emotions there is that sorrow feeds into your other emotions. You know, it's hard to feel all that hopeful, for example, if you're feeling profound sorrow. Yeah. Um, there was somebody else that's gone away. OK. OK, that all plain as day? Very good. OK, so um, before going on to Bloch's objection, just a remark about another reason functionalism is attractive. Um, when you're thinking of what pain is, um, it's natural to start out thinking that pain is this sensation that is caused by all these things, bodily injuries and so on. Um, and it, pain is this sensation that has all these effects. And then when you try and say more explicitly what that sensation is, you run into the problem that um, humans could have pain with one kind of biology, animals could have pain with a quite different kind of biology. So the functionalist answer is to say, don't think of pain as Think of this as a black box diagram, right? So when there's a black box that's doing stuff, when you act on it, it gives various out outputs. There must be something in the box. But don't think of pain as what's in the box making the whole thing happen. Being in, pa being in pain is just a matter of having that kind of structure. The mistake is to think of pain as the bit in the middle the thing that generates all the, all the behaviors and that is caused by the sensations, it's, you're not really identifying a working part of the machinery here when you say pain. Um, what's going on is being in pain is just a matter of that flow chart being true of you. And the stuff in the box might be quite different for different animals. It could be different for humans, different for octopuses. What's in the box making it all happen is just the bits of biology. But the bits of biology are different from case to case. What everybody that's in pain has in common is a kind of functional structure. That's the point of variable realizability. So that's, the, 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 that's functionalism, I think, in a nutshell. 
it's very important that that, uh, that, that seemed like a plain enough point to you. If it's not, can you, can you just put up your hand if that's not absolutely plain as day? Uh -huh. Aha. <laughs> right. Um, I'm not quite sure <laughs> how, how, to, how to get at it then. Uh, what's wrong with it? Yeah. Yeah, to, for pain to be occurring, just as for this structure to be in operation, yeah? Um, and the stuff in here is just biology. The stuff in the middle box is just biology. And it could be any kind of biology, really. Lots of different kinds of biology. But so long as this structure's operating, then you've got pain. Yeah? Okay, so that does it for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, Sorry? OK, OK. Well, keep coming back. Um, um, uh, uh, yeah, I do encourage you to stop me at any point. Yeah. Um, maybe if you explain what the other two boxes are, the black box. OK, this is something like a bodily, on the left is something like a bodily injury. Um, on the right is something like yelling. Yeah, I, I, I don't have anything very fancy in mind here. Um, it's abstract. I, I left it blank just because this is the general picture that the functionalist has. Um, don't think you can go deep into the nature of a mental state by going deep into the contents of the box. The, 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 that's the big mistake. You go into the nature of the mental state by looking at the functional structure, everything that surrounds the state. That's what tells you what it is. Yep. Just as if, you ask, if you're asking what a switch is, you can't ask what a switch is by going deep into the chemical composition of the thing. The way you find out what a switch is is by seeing how it works in a whole big circuit. Yeah, that's how you know what it is. So a similar point like this would be would apply to the notion of a switch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, variable realizability says um, you can make pain out of practically anything. So you could be, you could have, just to keep using the same example, you could have human biology, make pain out of that. You can have octopus biology, make pain out of that. You can be um, an extraterrestrial um, made of a gas, and you could still be, make, have, be having pain. You can make pain out of that stuff. Yeah? OK. Yeah? It's telling you, the, what is the purpose of functionalism? It's giving you an analysis of what it is to be in any particular mental state. It's saying the way you explain what it is to be in a mental state is by describing some kind of box and arrow structure. And the fa that's the fact that makes variable realizability possible because lots of different things could have that kind of box and arrow structure. Yep. So is the uh, the mental state uh, sorry the the behaviour is going to be part of the output here. Yeah. Um, it's not that it's not that you know what the mental state is independently of knowing what kind of behaviour it causes. Does that make sense? You know what the mental state is only when you know how it fits into a whole big system that includes other mental states and includes behavior. So there's no such thing as saying, the, the functionalist is saying, there's no such thing as saying, I know what pain is, um, but now I wonder what causes it and what effects it has. You only know what pain is when you know what kinds of behavior it gives rise to and you know what kind of things cause it. The thing is just defined by its place in a system. That's what the functionalist is saying. Yep. Oh, all right. Yep. Uh, 
Uh, isn't it similar to behaviorism? It is in a way similar to behaviorism, yeah. Um, um, behaviorism says, you can think of behaviorism as a kind of functionalism, um, where the only functional outputs it considers are outputs for behavior, yeah. But functionalism says, behaviors are part of the outputs, but sometimes um, the outputs include other mental states. So I define sorrow here, in terms of its implications, not for behavior, but for other emotions and the kinds of thought processes you go through. Yeah. And these themselves will be functionally defined. Yeah. So it will connect, it will, the whole vast grid will connect to behavior in the end, in the outputs. Yeah. But um, there's going to be such a lot of structure inside. That's what behaviorism missed out. Behaviorism, remember that thing from Carnap about to be excited is to act in this way. There's, the functionalism says that's, it very rarely happens like that. There's that kind of direct connect between a mental state and behavioral output. It's always this big grid of states interacting to give you the output. But still, you're explaining what the state is by its place in that big grid giving you the output. If we think of that flow chart uh, in the terms of a Turing machine. Yes. That's right. Is the change in state like being in pain? Like, the, do, does your state ever change from being not in pain to in pain, or is the entire flowchart what it is to be in pain? Uh, the, the the entire flowchart is what it is to be in pain. Yeah. Um, there are going to be uh, there's going to be a, a fair bit of complexity here. There will be something about being in pain uh, makes a difference to what outputs you will give to what inputs. So suppose I'm not in pain and I see a bottle of aspirin. I don't even notice it, right? I just walk on by. Um, I'm in pain and I see the bottle of aspirin and I get that as input. Now it lights up. It's the most important thing in the room. I head straight for it. So what inputs you get, what outputs you get for what inputs will be affected by which state you're currently in. There are, there, are, there are two different dimensions to it here. One is, given that I'm in this state, what kind of outputs will you get for what kind of input? And the other is what I've been focusing on here, which is how do I get into this state? And what happens next once I'm in this state? But characterizing the outputs here, a full characterization here will include things like, um, as input, once I'm in the state of sorrow, someone comes up and says, uh, and makes an unpleasant remark to me, yeah? At my best, I would, re I would reply with um, a brilliantly witty and sarcastic remark back. Um, since I'm feeling sorrow, I might just burst into tears, right? So you get different outputs for the same input, depending on whether you're in this state. So the full characterization is going to be fairly complex. Yeah? Okay. Okay, last one, yeah. That's right, there's going to be that kind of looping, yeah. That's exactly right. OK, very good. OK, let's go, <laughs> right. Um, OK, so that, uh, so much of what functionalism is. And now blockhead. Um, for some reason, China plays a big part in all these examples. Um, OK, and here's, here's blocks appeal to China. Um, uh, suppose we convert the government of China to functionalism um, and we convince its officials that it would enormously enhance their international prestige. I think <laughs> this is kind of a naive assumption, but anyway. Um, we convince its officials it would enormously enhance their international prestige to realize a human mind for an hour. So we're going to take, we assume we've got the whole complex characterization of the functional structure of a human mind. And we give each of the, as it was then, a billion people in China, 
with a specially designed two-way radio that connects them in the appropriate way to other persons and to an artificial body. So you have a kind of robot here being driven around by this vast collection of people. And the task of one person is, we've got one person here whose task is, if the current state is S4 and the input is Y, then the person changes the current state to S5 and outputs L. It's not much of a job, but you could do that, right? I mean, you've just got things labeled S4, Y, S5, and L, and you just hit the buttons. Um, when you hear that, uh, when you hear on your two-way radio that the current state is S4 and you've got input Y coming in, then you just give out the instruction, make the current state S5 and output L. You could do that. That's the whole thing. And you have lots of people doing that kind of stuff. Now, I said last time that the, the, in abstract, the general way you characterize the functional organization of something is by saying, given I'm in state S4, and I get a particular sensory input, then what happens next? What state do I go into? And what output do I give? And to describe the whole functional organization, I do this for every possible sensory input, for every possible state, and for every um, motor output. So each of these people in this exercise is doing this um, for one of these cases. I didn't put that very well. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, OK. Um, so if you've got that, you've got that whole vast committee that are put together, then that could be functionally equivalent to you. I mean, this is such a general schematic scheme uh, uh, description that you just know that your whole functional description right at the moment could be specified in this way. So if we just have enough people and enough two-way radios there, then they could duplicate what you're doing. Um, in fact, suppose that what we do is we miniaturize everybody and um, we um, everybody just a few uh, millimeters, a few microns high, um, and they're all put into the head of a robot, then that robot would talk, act, and behave exactly like you. Interacting with that robot would be just like interacting with you. And we assume that it's all, they're all very fast and nimble at doing this stuff, so they all react very well. And uh, they're maybe the same shape and size. Maybe it looks pretty much like you. So you could have a robot like this that is behaving, interacting in just the same way you do. If its functional structure is the same as yours, then interaction with it is just going to be like interaction with you. That's all right? That could happen? OK. But then, does this system have any mental states at all? Someone said last time, the Apple Corporation doesn't have a mental life. Does this system have a mental life? You've got a mind. Does this thing have a mind? I mean, you could probably get, if you wanted to, if you wanted to interact with it, you might say, well, um, I can tell what it's going to do. It's saying to me, um, I really want a coffee. So I can predict what it's going to do by assuming it's saying it, that it's got the intention to get a coffee. And sure enough, at the end of the class, it goes straight to the cafe. Um, you can predict what it's doing by assuming that it's got intentions and beliefs and so on. Um, but does it really have them, these intentions and beliefs? Or is that just a handy way of predicting what it's going to do? And if you think about the stabs of pain you feel, the yearning in your heart, the itches and tickles, the pains and pangs, does it have any of those? Bloch says it's especially doubtful whether this um, uh, uh, blockhead is going to have what philosophers have variously called qualitative states, raw fields, or immediate phenomenological properties. And by that he means not what you're planning or intending to do, but the sensation of mortality the feeling, uh, the tremor um, in the knees as you start to speak before a large audience, the, um, 
Um, that experience of, you know when someone gives you a Chinese bun? Do, do, do people still do that? When I was at school, it was very popular. Um, you, <laughs> you take someone's arm and you twist it in two different directions. Yeah? Um, very popular. You know the feeling? Do, do people still do that or is that kind of... Oh yeah, so popular, yeah. <laughs> the old classics, right? You know that feeling, right? That's the kind of thing Bloch means by um, an immediate phenomenological property. So this duplicative view with this vast population inside it, you take its arm and you kind of do that thing to it. Does it feel anything? Doesn't seem to. I mean, does it? I mean, what, can you put your hand up if you think it does feel anything? Can you put your hand up if you think it doesn't feel anything? Can you put your hand up if you've really no idea? <laughs> I see. Okay. <laughs> it is a hard one. Okay. But Bloch thinks it's pretty plain. It doesn't feel anything at all. I mean, after all, if you uh, just have all these people going around, they ha they're a collective. They're not individual. They they that, that doesn't constitute a single individual. Um, how could it, as an individual, have a kind of unified life where it's feeling those sensations. Yep. Yes. Well, I mean, our neurons are single bits. If you look at any neuron, you can't see the conscious mind. That's right. It's not any different than, oh my God, this is a collection of neurons firing all over the place. Right. That's my problem with Yeah, your point is, it's hard to see how this population could be generating uh, sensations, but it's hard to see how a collection of neurons could be generating sensations too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like his thought experiment just has the same problem as brain does. Right. Yeah. But um, I'm not sure if that tells in favour of Bloch's example or against it. Um. Do you see what I mean? I mean, if it's really puzzling how the brain could be generating sensations, maybe that's the wrong way to think about how sensations are generated. Okay. Okay. How do you feel about the Apple Corporation? Does it have pangs and pains and itches and hard to say? Come on. <laughs> Be real. You give the Apple Corporation a Chinese button, it gets nothing. <laughs> I promise you. It's not a duplicate, but it's pretty complex. True. Yeah. But it's not intended to model the mind. Well, he, it yes. Is. OK. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I saw you in this order. One, two, three. Yeah. Uh, I don't think the Apple Corporation feels pain, but the bodies that make, that make it up feel the pain that it would as a, as a whole. Yeah, no, well, yeah, the, 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 that's on Bloch's side, right? I mean, if the whole corporation isn't feeling pain, then um, uh, sure, nobody disagrees. Well, I, I, no, nobody of any sense disagrees that the individual people in the corporation can feel emotions and pains and so on. Yeah. The question is, does the whole corporation feel pain? But, but, but they're all affected in the exact same way because they're all under one body. So aren't they all feeling the same thing? Is that true? If everybody get if if a couple of hundred of them get a big pay cut and Steve Jobs says, I feel your pain. Okay, was it you? Yeah. <laughs> yes, you can say the company is hurting. You know, people do say the company is hurting, but does that? Do you, do you really want to take that seriously and say they feel sensations the same way you do? It feels sensations the same way you do. That's what Block is arguing. It's just crazy to think it feels sensations the way you do. I mean, it's important not to say, yeah, of course, in a metaphorical sense, it feels sensations. You know, anybody will give you that, but it really has that sensation. 
Yeah, that kind of slow burning pain. <laughs> yes, right. Uh, yeah. Why? Why do we think that if there's a functional system, it has to have consciousness or a mental life? Can't functionalism just explain how the mental lives of things that are conscious work, but not necessarily imply that whatever is a functional state also has these? Functional yeah. Couldn't you have functionalism without the idea that whatever you've got the same functional organization must have the same mental life? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, the thing is, functionalism would still be an important idea because it's very, you know, when you're, when you're trying to uh, characterize practically anything, at some point it's important to give a kind of flow chart showing how the thing is organized. Yeah? Well, that's true of the Apple Corporation, it's true of a motor car, it's true of the electrical system in the room, you know, it's, it's true of so many things. Um, a university, um, that at some point you want to just give a flowchart of how, 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 how all the parts are connected up to one another. And it's certainly true of the human brain, that if you're trying to understand how the brain works, at some point you want to give a flowchart of how all the bits are connected to each other. Um, but functionalism about the mind was much more than that. Functionalism was the thesis. Having a mind just is having a particular functional organization. That, that was the, the whole idea was that functionalism solves the mind-body problem by saying the reason that the mind is related to the brain is that to have that mind is the same thing as having a particular functional structure. And it's because you have the complex brain you do that you have that complex functional structure. That's what's so interesting about it. I mean, it's meant to be solving that problem how having a mind is connected to having a brain. And the answer is having a mind is having a very complex functional structure, and it's the brain that gives you that complex functional structure. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, well, isn't free will a matter of having a particular functional structure? I mean, Having free will, we, we will actually come on and discuss this in much more depth uh, in, in a couple of weeks. But um, the immediate thing the functionalist has to say is to have free will is a matter of having a particular kind of functional structure. So having free will be a matter of um, being able to make choices that affect your actions and having your behavior determined only by choices that you make that aren't controlled by outside forces, something like that. If you're controlled completely by outside forces in what you choose, then you're not free. But um, if you have a range of options that it's only factors internal to you that are deciding between, that's a matter of your functional structure, but that's what it is to a free will. So the functionalist has to say there is no more to having free will than having a particular kind of functional structure. Yeah. Uh, yep. If you say the free will and consciousness are emergent from the structure, but not identical to the structure, then functionalism has lost. Uh, I, I mean, the whole idea of functionalism was, I mean, the whole puzzle about um, the mind and the brain is something like, um, well, what does it mean if you say it emerges? Um, how, how, <laughs> I mean, you don't literally mean it kind of walked out. Um, uh, in, in that sense of I emerged from the room, you know, the, the, you, you opened the gates of the brain and outstepped the mind. Um, um, how did that happen? And the functionalist means to be giving a very explicit answer to that. The brain got a particular kind of functional organization, and having that functional organization is the same thing as having a mind or having consciousness or having free will. That's how you understand how the, mind, how the brain can be generating a mind. If the functionalist doesn't say that, if the functionalist loses that, then the functionalist has nothing to say about how the brain is generating the mind. Yeah, we're really back to square one. Um, I've, I've lost track. Uh, uh, and I haven't looked over here at all. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry, can, can you say that louder? I'm sorry, I literally just, I just can't hear a word. Oh. 
Prima facie, yeah. Oh, oh, what does it mean? Oh, on the face of it. Yeah, there is an on the face of it doubt. Oh, what he means is, if you just think of it straight off and you think, you're looking at this gigantic committee of people manipulating a robot, and you say, does that whole thing have sensations? And I'm saying, well, on the face of it, it just doesn't seem to have sensations at all. Yeah. Uh, okay, one, two. Yeah. Alive. Alive is not a notion the functionalist uses. I mean, they're only talking about minds. They would say it's got a mind. Yeah. Life, life is kind of a biological notion. Yeah. Um, a robot could have a mind without being alive, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and last one. Yes. No. I, well, th that's Bloch's idea anyway. A collective of conscious states would not itself generate a further conscious state. Like, it would be a conscious state at a level that we cannot recognize. Um, I, I, I see what you mean. I mean, people do sometimes say that everything in the universe is conscious. Um, and um, uh, e even the humblest potato in the darkest cellar has a low cunning of its own. Um, <laughs> and, and, and when you stick together enough of these kind of very low level consciousnesses, then you get human consciousness or animal consciousness or something. Um, and then if you carried on with that process, if you stuck them together, you'd get a still higher form of consciousness. Um, people do sometimes put forward that kind of picture. I'm, I'm, that's not what the functionalist is saying. Yeah. Uh, the functionalist is saying, if you took this um, collective uh, of uh, people organized in that way, you'd get a conscious life that's exactly the same as your conscious life. Okay. okay we, we, we have to move on. Could, uh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, let me just have. Okay. Okay. So that's Bloch's um, uh, objection to functionalism. Um, a way to think of it is, when you're thinking of this kind of functional structure as a characterization of pain, the reason that seemed like a good idea um, was variable realizability. So um, uh, the thing is that um, you, you characterize the functional structure quite abstractly so that humans can realize this, and octopuses can realize this, other animals can realize it, extraterrestrials can realize it. That was the whole idea that you got variable realizability and functionalism respects that. The trouble is that the variable realizability has gone so wide that it's letting in things like blockhead that um, according to Bloch, anyway, aren't conscious, don't have mental lives. Um, so variable realizability is really hard to, to juggle with because you've got to have quite a liberal notion of uh, what it is to be in pain that will let in lots of different creatures across the universe. But the idea is you don't want to let in everything that's got that kind of functional structure, even um, uh, vast collectives of people. So for variable realizability, it's OK when you have humans and the octopus all realizing this structure. But Blockhead is realizing this structure too. And Blockhead doesn't seem to have sensations. Um, in Putnam's original ar article, he actually tried to, he actually anticipated this very clever man, Putnam. And um, he said, no organism capable of feeling pain possesses a decomposition into parts that um, themselves have this kind of functional characteristics. And he said that's to rule out um, organisms, if you could really call it an organism, like a swarm of bees as uh, single pain feelers. Um, so Putnam really tried to rule that out. But if you look at this, it, it looks ad hoc. I mean, it looks like he just stipulated that to rule it. I mean, if, if when Bloch produces his counterexample, Putnam says, um, but I didn't mean that. 
I mean, um, you know, that, that, that doesn't count. Um, I, uh, but it's got the same functional structure, and functional structure is supposed to be the important thing. So why does, whether it's decomposable into parts of themselves of this kind of functional organization, why is that important? Why does that matter? Uh, the best answer I know, actually, was given by, uh, the best answer I've heard um, was given by a student in this class just a couple of years ago. Uh, um, so let me give you, this is something to shoot for. You can do this. Um, this is, uh, uh, here is where I have found the most convincing rejoinder to blocks, as example. Um, this is, the student was called Takash, and uh, the point is, each of the people constituting um, uh, blocks uh, robot are themselves free agents. That's very important to the example. Um, and that they are doing this, I mean, that, if it was you or me just being dragooned into this, that you're doing this, that you're going into state S5 when you get input L and giving X as output, that you're doing this for even an hour is a matter of your voluntary agreement, because you're a free agent. Um, and you could withdraw that at any moment. You could say, what's in it for me? And if the answer is, well, you're being paid or um, you're going to be sent to jail if you don't do this, then the answer might be, we're going to form a union. Um, we're going to protest. We're going to organize. Now, in the case of the neurons firing in the human brain, the neurons firing in the human brain are not free agents in that sense. The neurons firing in the human brain can't each say, well, what's in it for me and organize a collective? Um, to do something different or something more to their own advantage. Um, so um, the functional structure of blockhead is actually not the same as that of the human brain. Each, th th there might be a revolution while the robot, is, you know, while the experiment is in progress. Um, the people might just rebel. They might think of something better to do. So the whole um, example only works because um, it pretends that the functional structure of a human brain has been duplicated. But we all know perfectly well that it hasn't, because these are all people who can do what they like. So it's a different functional structure to the structure of the human brain. OK, so I, I give that to you for what it's worth. It seems to me a pretty powerful objection. Um, le let me just. There are something like 60 seconds left, so let, let me just make one last remark about why there nonetheless seems to be something troublesome for um, uh, functionalism here. It's when you think about your knowledge of your own sensations, your knowledge of something like pain, and consider your knowledge of what pain is. There are people who don't feel pain. I mean, there are children who are born and they just don't get pain when they're cut or whatever, and that is a real handicap because they don't get frightened by the things that you rationally should be frightened of. They don't, get, they don't fear injury in the same way that someone feels pain does. It's a real problem. But for a child like that, you can come to learn. People will tell you that there is such a thing as pain. And you can learn all about its functional structure. You can learn, look, for most people, when they cut themselves, they get this state, I don't get it. Um, and that makes them do all this stuff. Um, that I don't do. So someone who never feels pain can know about the functional structure of pain. But if you know all about the functional structure of pain, is that enough to know what pain is? You've never felt it yourself. You understand, you, you could draw the diagram. You understand exactly what its functional structure is. You know how to react to someone else who's feeling pain. But you've never had it. In that case, do you know what it is? Well, it seems, I think many of us would say, you don't know what pain is unless you've actually had the sensation. It's having the sensation that tells you what pain is. And moreover, once you have the sensation, you have complete knowledge of what pain is. It's not that you've just found out a bit about it. You know the whole thing about what the sensation is. It's not as if you don't really know what pain is until you've done some brain biology. You know completely what pain is when you have the sensation. 
you don't even need to watch other people. Um, you ju you, you, you're just reflecting your own sensation, and you know exactly what that sensation is. Pain itself gives you complete knowledge of what pain is. So you know what's possible so far as uh, the sensation of pain goes. Um, but then if you have complete knowledge of what pain is from um, just having the sensation, how could it turn out that that's really a brain phenomenon? If it was a brain phenomenon, there would have to be more to it than what you had knowledge of um, just from the sensation. So you say, well, the, the kind of picture you get is there's pain and there might be C fiber fi firing correlated with it, but that's something different. There might be X fiber fiber, uh, X. Well, this is what the octopuses have, they have X fibers um, correlated with it. Um, 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 but the sensation is one thing, and the X fiber firing is another. And it doesn't help to be a dualist. Even if there is ectoplasm, um, there could be ectoplasmic C firing. There could be ectoplasmic X firing. If there's ectoplasm, um, then there um, could be variable realizability for the ectoplasm too. So you're being told there's this sensation, and then the functionalist says, all that pain is, is this functional structure. But at that point, you seem to have lost sight of the sensation altogether. If you've only got the functional structure, you've only got something that the person who didn't have pain sensations in the first place could know about. OK, th great questions. Thank you for that. Um, that's the end of the message for today. Hey, hello, good afternoon. Um, so today, uh, we're looking at um, the inverted spectrum and the problems it raises for functionalism. And Martina Nina Rumelan's article, um, Pseudo Normal Vision. Uh, on Wednesday, we'll look at uh, Nagel's article, a Brain Bisection and the Unity of Consciousness. Now, um, be very careful. So far, we have two textbooks in this class the um, Chalmers and the Perry. So far, we've been using entirely the Chalmers. Now, this next week, we take an article from the Perry. Uh, did you follow that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, and th 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 this phenomenon uh, Nagel is discussing, brain bisection and unity of consciousness. There are some wonderful YouTube videos um, showing the phenomenon that Nagel uh, is describing. Um, you could find them by, I I'll try to send around a link tonight, but uh, you could try to find them just by Googling split brain patients um, and see what you come up with. Uh, OK, so th th that's what we'll look at on Wednesday. Uh, today, I, I just want to start out with a very straightforward description of what spectrum inversion is, um, what it means to talk about spectrum inversion. I suspect that many of you will have thought of this already. Um, uh, sometimes you find people who've been thinking about this kind of problem since they were 12 or even younger. Um, anyway, this is a issue that our people think about spontaneously, I think. Then I want to do a, a kind of review of where we've got to so far in the class um, and how we've come up uh, uh, to thinking about functionalism. And the thing is, spectrum inversion looks like it's a real problem for functionalism. So naturally, anyone who's a functionalist is going to say, actually, you think spectrum inversion makes sense but it doesn't really. Um, then I'll look at uh, uh, Nida Rumelan's point about pseudo-normal vision. Uh, I, I, I may, if there's time, I'll finish by um, looking at how these points connect back to the role of physics in the way we think about the mind. OK, so spectrum inversion. Suppose the following. Suppose you wake up one morning. Maybe this happened many years ago. And you find that the colors of all the objects around you have changed. The sky that used to be that peaceful blue is now a kind of red. Um, the fire trucks have all gone blue. There's been a systematic change. All the colors are different. Um, your, how should I say, the acuity, the discriminations you can make in color vision seem to be just as rich as before. But it's all different. They've all changed round. And at first you say, 
Look at that, you say to other people. Isn't that wild? Why is the sky red? And people simply refer you to a doctor. Um, uh, and it turns out no one else is noticing the slightest difference. It's just you. So it's your problem. Nothing out there has changed. It's the stuff in you that has changed. Now, um, at first, this is going to be very confusing and um, upsetting. Uh, but after a bit, um, you'll adjust to this. You'll start to use color words in the same way as everybody else. I mean, after all, blue is just the word for whatever color the sky is. So you'll start to call the sky blue the same way everybody else does. You'll start to use the word red for the fire trucks the same way everybody else does. If someone says to you, bring me a red one, you'll bring one that everybody else agrees is red. You'll be using, how should I put this, you'll be using the sensation that you used to call blue to identify the red one, if you follow me. But you'll manage, you'll bring, you'll succeed in complying with the request. So you, after a period of adjustment, you'll be using the words red, green, blue, and so on, just the same way everybody else does. And you'll react to them just the same way everybody else does. So at this point, are your color experiences just the same as everyone else's? I mean, the mere fact that you're using the words the same way as, ev as everybody else doesn't show that your experiences are just the same as everybody else's. You're wildly out of tune with everyone else so far as what your experiences are like goes. Um, I mean, there might be some differences. You might say, you, you know, you, you, your aesthetic preferences might be different. You walk into a, a house, you walk into a room in a house, and you say, my God, the colors here are so cold. In fact, they're, um, what you'd have to describe it as, the walls are all, all, are, are all orange, the curtains are all bright red, and you say, but the colors are so cold and clinical. Um, uh, you, uh, what you'll describe as a warm or a cold scene will be different to the way everybody else describes it. But maybe as time goes on, that'll change too. And after all, um, uh, these terms like warm or cold, presumably they, they have to do with facts like fire is kind of reddish orange, blood is kind of red. Um, so wh when you cut yourself, you'll be getting these blue sensations as it all oozes out, if you see what I mean. Um, when you look at the fire, it'll be go glowing a kind of pale blue violet. Um, so maybe you're, you'll adjust there in which scenes you call warm or cold, just being just this way, the same way as everybody else. So there might be not much difference. There might not be any difference between the way you react to these sensations and the way everybody else does. So the general point here is that there could be a systematic shift in your color experiences as a result of which you wouldn't be able, uh, uh, your, your experiences would keep the same structure as everyone else's. So um, the simplest way to do this, I mean, the simplest kind of map from one color space onto another would be if you think of two creatures that just have black and white vision. So they have very simple spectrums. Right? It's just various shades of gray from black to white. So one creature looks at the screen and sees this. The other creature looks at the screen and sees this. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> um, so there, um, these two creatures, their spectrums are mapped on to one another. Um, uh, which one has which spectrum? Maybe you couldn't tell that just by observing them. And with our rich uh, color experience, the colors have a lot of structure. They have hue, saturation. Um, uh, they are all um, in a space with these axes. And the question is, couldn't you map them? Um, so for example, here is uh, one. Uh, th th this is from Alex Burns' article in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Um, 
Here is one uh, uh, way of arranging the spectrum. Now suppose you just shift that 180 degrees. So this is shifted 180 degrees from this. So maybe my color experiences are shifted 180 degrees from yours. So that when you look at the, um, um, at the fruit, this is the set of color sensations you get. When I look at that very same collection of fruit, I get the color sensations that you're having when you look at this scene. You see what I mean? So this is a very simple shift, 180 degrees. There are lots, actually, of different um, shifts you could do, maps you could do of the color space. So maybe we have um, six people looking at the same bowl of fruit and getting quite different color sensations, different structures in their color sensations. So the general point here is there could be that systematic change. You can make sense of waking up and the bowl of fruit that used to look like this now looks like that, or that, or that, or that, or that. Um, and you think, wow, isn't that wild? Uh, but it just stays like that. Um, but then you learn to fit in with everybody else. You can have that kind of map of your color space. Um, it preserves the structure, it preserves which colors are in between which. So if you say I want a color that's in between the color of this banana and the color of this um, orange, you could do that. The structure of the color space is just the same. Which colors are lighter than which is kept the same? Which colors are more intense than which is kept the same? So when that happens to you, after that change, either I mean, of course, a number of questions would occur to you if that happened. And you wake up, and the colors are all different. And you say to everyone, um, hasn't the world changed? And they say, no, it's just you. Something has changed about you. And one basic question you have to ask is, um, before that change, is it that before the change, my color experiences were the same as everyone else's, but now they're out of whack? Or is it rather? But before the change, I was having quite different color experiences to everyone else. And I've only now suddenly come in line with everyone else now that, um, now that the fruit looks like this or the fruit looks like that. Then uh, it's only now that I'm getting the same standard color experiences as everyone else. You're not going to know. But either your color experiences were different to other people's before the change or are different now, or both. OK, so the idea of spectrum inversion is just the idea that scenario makes sense. Very modest claim. You can just imagine that happening. There's no contradiction in it. But then, suppose at the moment your color experiences were different to mine in that way. Well, you couldn't tell. There would be no way of telling. No amount of testing um, by an optician uh, would hit it. We'd say, give exactly the same words and reaction to exactly the same color samples. We'd act and re react to uh, uh, language involving the colors in just the same way. We'd be taken in by the same camouflage. Um, we'd identify just the same objects against just the same backgrounds. Everything would be the same in our behavior. But our color experiences would be quite different to one another's. OK, that's spectrum inversion. Uh -huh. Don't colors naturally um, ignite feelings or thoughts in your body? Like, like red could make you feel more tense, um, more hyperactive, and blue could calm you down? Blue, yeah. I think that's right. There are these psychological differences between the colors, I mean, the kind of emotional reactions that they provoke. But what I wonder is, um, aren't these learned, really? Or what are, they're, it's not so much that it's, that it's because of the associations they have with actual phenomena. So red will make you tense because it's the color of blood and fire. Blue will make you calm because it's the color of a, of a cloudless sky or a peaceful ocean. 
you, you see what I mean? Red, has, red just really has that association with danger. So if your color experiences are flipped, then it will be different sensations that now get associated with blood and fire. Plain as day? OK. Well, I, I, I want to just backtrack a bit. The class has been pretty fast and furious, it seems to me, so far. I just want to um, review in a slightly more leisurely way where we've got to with um, dualism and central state materialism and behaviorism and all that. Um, this will also go at breakneck speed, but um, anyway. Um, Dualism, which we started out with, was the point that it's very hard to see um, how the mind can be physical. So dualist says, well, there's some different kind of stuff here, some non-physical ectoplasm. That's what generates the mind, not the physical stuff. Um, and the trouble with that is uh, it's no easier to see what ectoplasm is or how that could be generating a mind than it is to see how the physical stuff could be generating a mind. We have no idea what ectoplasm is. We have no idea what a soul is. We have no way of explaining how that stuff could be generating a mind. Um, it's as if people said, well, it's really hard to see how a TV can generate those colored images. Um, so let's suppose there's some other kind of non-physical stuff, TV stuff. Um, that just doesn't help. It's better to stick with the initial problem and see if we can address that. How can the physical stuff be generating a mind? Behaviorism was the idea. All there is to having a mind, all there is to being in particular mental states, is exhibiting particular kinds of complex behavior. And the general problem there is um, mental states don't connect one to one with particular displays of behavior. For any mental state, you could exhibit the fact that you're in that mental state in lots of different ways. There are lots of different behaviors that um, might express any particular mental state you're in. People show they care in so many ways. Your enemy might display hatred for you in a million different ways all depending on how, how ingenious and just how malevolent they are. Um, or sometimes mental states might not show up in behavior at all. That was Putnam's point about super Spartans. So behaviorism uh, really seems vulnerable to that kind of objection. Funct central state materialists, central state materialists are the guys who say things like pain is C fiber firing. Sorrow is this particular electrochemical discharge in your amygdala. Um, and the problem there was variable realizability. You can't identify any particular mental state with some one physical state because um, different animals could be having that very same mental state, but quite different <coughs> physical realizations of it. You and the octopus might feel pain even though uh, the octopus is a quite different biology to yours. So the great thing about functionalism is it seems to solve all these problems at once. It doesn't um, involve postulating a non-physical kind of stuff. There's only the physical stuff there. It doesn't say um, uh, being, in the being in the mental state is just exhibiting a particular kind of behavior because um, it's only a collection of functional states that together generate your behavior. And about central state materialism, it says it's not whether you have C fiber firing like a human that determines whether you're in pain, and it's not whether you have X fiber firing like an octopus that determines whether you're in pain. It's what role C fiber firing plays in the way your whole brain is wired up how that um, bit of the brain is connected up, is wired up to other bits of the brain, and those other bits of the brain are jointly producing your behaviors. So 
So it's like the notion of a switch, that um, you can make a switch out of lots of different things, but what makes something physical a switch is just the role it plays in a whole bunch of electrical wiring. If you ask, is flipping the switch going to make a lamp go on or off? Um, you can't answer that just by looking at the switch. You have to look at what else is in the system. And similarly, if you ask, is being excited going to cause me to leap about? Well, it depends what else is in the system. And then we ask, well, how do you describe functional role? Um, well, you remember our old friend S2? Dear old S2. Um, the way you specify S2 is by saying, if you get input X, then um, you, go into another, you go into some other state, or maybe you stay in the same state, and you give some particular output. And for every possible input to state to that state, you say what output you get. And once you've done that, you've described the functional state completely. And that's what the mind is. It's a collection of functional states. That's what functionalism says. And as I've said a couple of times, that is how the scientific study of the mind proceeds. The scientific study of the mind proceeds by looking at the functional structure of the brain. That's what it is to be engaged in experimental psychology, looking at the functional characterization of brain states. <coughs> but now consider the question, what is it to have a red sensation? The experience of red you have, the experience of whiteness that you have when you look at the screen, what is it to have a particular color sensation? Well, a functionalist has to say, all it is to, um, to have a particular experience is to be in a particular functional state. So um, having a red sensation is just a matter of, if someone asks you, is that thing red? Then, is that fire truck red? You'll say yes. Is, is the sky red? Then you'll say no. Um, if you're having a red sensation, then uh, that's what, uh, that's th that, that determines the kind of outputs you'll give for those kinds of inputs. If someone says, if you're having a red sensation, and someone says, um, can you bring me a red one? Then, if, you, if you're feeling obliging, um, you'll bring them that one. Let's get the red sensation. Um, that's all it is to have a red sensation. So if you and someone else have got the same functional structure, then you've got the same sensations. That just follows. That's what functionalism says. Functionalism says all it is to have a red sensation is to be in a particular machine uh, ta table state. Our old friend S2. The trouble is, suppose that your spectrum is an inversion of mine. So your color sensations are quite different to mine. You and I might be in exactly the same functional states. The way we are wired up, the box and arrow diagram of our brains could be exactly the same. For every input, we give the same outputs. So you're looking at the, at the scene here, and uh, you, you engage in conversation. You say, that's the dear old Campanile. Isn't it magnificent? Oh, the happy memories. Um, the great days around the base and the top of the Campanile. Um, uh, what a noble and inspiring sight. I, meanwhile, standing beside you, I'm getting this kind of experience. Um, but I talk just the same way as you do. I say, what a noble and inspiring sight. Ah, the memories it brings back. Look how beautiful and lush the green of the trees is against the uh, white of the Campanile. Um, I talk just the same way you do, though my experiences are quite different to yours, as you can see. Um, so there's something about the nature of our color experiences the functionalism just can't catch. It's not going to help to talk about some non-physical stuff. And our behavior, our outward behavior is exactly the same, so behaviorism doesn't help. Um, and uh, uh, of course our brains, the, the physiology of our brains, uh, 
uh, can't be the important thing because my brain might be just, might, you, you die, like, might be like the octopus so far as our brain goes. Uh, we might be just variably realizing the same state. So functionalism is missing out an aspect of our color experiences, the aspect that's different between you and me in that kind of scenario. And it's very hard to see how we're going to catch it. I mean, how could we catch it? And this is a different kind of challenge um, to the block uh, 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 homunculus-headed robot kind of challenge to functionalism. Um, in the trade, this is called, an, the, the, the argument I've just given against functionalism is called an inverted qualia argument. The qualitative character of your experiences, the qualia, might be quite different to mine, even though the functional structure is the same. If you're a regular person and I'm a homunculus-headed robot, then the argument is our functional structure might be just the same, even though I'm not getting any sensations at all, and you are. So that, th th these are different challenges, but they make the same point that there's something about the qualitative character of your sensations and experiences that can't be explained in functionalist terms. What it is to have a conscious life resists scientific investigation. That's why, that really is the basic reason why consciousness is sometimes described as one of the 10 hardest problems facing science at the moment. Um, the only methodology we have for studying consciousness is the functionalist methodology. But these basic points seem to show that you can't address the nature of conscious states by functionalist analysis. It is a re this is really a hard and unresolved problem. Yes? But by the absent quality, I just mean to be referring back to um, what we talked about last time. The, the robot was driven by a million people, a billion people, or a billion tiny little, a few, a few millimeters high um, homunculi, uh, uh, each just pushing levers. Yeah? And wh where I was arguing this is like the Apple Corporation, uh, you can't say what sensations or feelings the whole thing is having. Yeah. Uh, so th that's got all the functional structure of a human being, but without um, qualia. Yeah. So this is, uh, that, that is an absent qualia argument. You've got the same functional structure, but no qualia. This here, uh, the, the inversion scenario shows you've got the same functional structure, but different qualia. Is that all right, the way I'm t saying qualia here? The qualitative character of your experience, what the sensation is like? Yeah. Uh, so, will the, the whole idea of something like that, the sensation being inverted, will that apply to like, any sensation? Right. If it works for color, why shouldn't it work for just everything? Yeah. Um, I, you know, here I've kept it in terms of, um, you, they're both color sensations, what you and I are getting. It's just that uh, mine are not quite the same as yours. But really, what I'm getting when I look at the colors might be like what you get when you listen to the tones of a mighty organ. You see what I mean? I mean, the, the, so long as it's got the same structure, what the experiences are like in themselves could be just wildly different. Um, so, and if that works for color, then why shouldn't it work for shape? Why shouldn't it work for... Um, Movement, yeah. any other aspect of experience at all. I mean, as a problem for functionalism, it's enough to be a real problem if it works for color. But why shouldn't all sensations be, mapped, be swapped around? Color's a very pure case where you can see how it would work. But, um, yeah. Yeah. Synesthesia. Synesthesia is an interesting case. Um, the first thing about synesthesia is that uh, it's functionally different. 
I mean, a, 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 a person with synesthesia will say things like, um, my, what a crumbly yellow voice you have. Uh, yeah, or you, 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 uh, listening to a piece of music might say, it's a nasty, jaggy thing. You could cut yourself in this. Um, uh, uh, so so that, that's functionally very different, right? They give very non-standard outputs for the same inputs. Um, but it's a good question why is right, why they're, how their description of the sensations can possibly be right yeah. on a functionalist account. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, there are questions there um, that are kind of interesting, but I think they are different questions. The synesthesia is a very interesting phenomenon. Yeah. Okay? This should be absolutely plain as day. If it's not plain as day, I'm not explaining it correctly. Is it plain as day? Okay. Yep. Can you say something about the way that colors are compared to each other? So, uh -huh. if, for instance, like my purple is your um, red, my yellow is your orange. No, red and orange not correlate the same way that purple contrasts yellow. Yes, very good. Um, the, 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 Th th that's a very important point. The uh, there's a structure in your color sensations, right? Red is next to orange in a way that purple is not next to green. Is that your point? Yeah. Um, so th th that's what I meant by saying you've got to look for a map in color space that finds a kind of symmetry in it so that you can map everything across the symmetry. What I mean is, you just take the very simplest case of um, uh, I see, you see, you, when I look at the screen, the sensations I get are the same as the sensations you get when uh, you look at this screen, right? Now, if it's just black and white and grey, then uh, uh, you can keep the structure. You see what I mean? All the greys are just arranged in a single line, and you just flip the line. Yeah. So I keep the structure. So um, if red is next to orange, and I'm getting a purple sensation when you get a red sensation, then it's got to be that when I get an orange sensation, when you, when you get an orange sensation, I'm getting some sensation that is next to purple. You see what I mean? You've got to set it up in such a way that you do get that structure. You've got to find a symmetry so that you can flip everything and get a symmetrical structure across the people. Now, it's a real, it's a significant question whether that's possible for the case of color. It's certainly possible with black and white. It's easy for black and white. Um, whether you can really do it for the case of, the co of color um, is, 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 is Steve Palmer in the psychology department here has actually spent some time arguing, um, as I recall, that you can do it. Um, and these photographs ultimately, the photographs I was showing ultimately come from Palmer's, uh, arguing that you really can get very close at any rate to getting a really symmetrical map. Uh, uh, I saw you first, yeah, yeah, one, two, three, yeah, four, yeah, okay, but uh, let me just check, uh, okay. okay, yeah. Um, so you think though that, that it's kind of reasonable to sort of, I guess, I don't want to use the word assume, but I assume that, like, since we, we would, like, we have pretty much the same, like, anatomy, like, if you take, like, the eyes, so we use our eyes to see color, uh -huh. right, so yep. if, Physiology, Our yeah. Physiological features, and you know, and we know through science, and biology, chemistry, whatever, that um, how light reacts, or you know, how right. our eyes see light, right? right? So, I don't know. I just thought it would be like pretty easy to like not for people to assume that. If you get the same physiology, yeah. In the same way. Yeah, um, if we've got the same physiology, we're going to have the same color sensations, that's the argument. Are you, are you saying that the, um, or is this functionalism, is it more referring to like the color sensations that we don't know what consciousness or like the mind, that the intangible part, is that what makes it possibly would make, it, make a difference in what people see? The, the argument here is a little bit complex at this point. It's a little bit tricky at this point. Um, uh, 
uh, suppose we just accept what you say is you get the same physiology, then you get the same color sensations. Right? If it's exactly the same physiology, then it's exactly the same color sensations. Um, the whole point about functionalism and variable realizability was um, uh, you could have different physiologies, but the same mental states. Remember that thing with the octopus and the octopus pain? Yeah. So um, you want to allow the different species could also have color experiences, even though they have different physiologies. Yeah. Um, but now the question is, when do two different physiologies have the same experiences? And what the functionalist is saying is, two different physiologies have the same experiences um, when they have the same functional structure. But what the spectrum inversion example shows is that's not right. Because then you could have two animals with different physiologies, different sensations, but the same functional structure. So that shows that same functional structure can't be a matter of same, fun uh, or can't be what makes it the same sensation. You, you see what I mean? Yeah. If, if your assumption is right that humans all have the same physiology, but we'll see in a minute that's not actually necessarily correct. Th th that is the point about pseudo-normal vision. I mean, it's a big assumption that humans all have the same physiology in the relevant respects, and it really may not be true. You know, we don't know that much about the relevant bits of brain physiology. Uh, but we'll come on to that. Um, okay. Everything has to go quite fast here, so yeah. Uh huh. Yes. Yes. It'd be very hard to get the map. Yeah. Maybe I went over. Maybe I was a bit too breezy at that point. It'd be very hard. It'd be much harder to get the. To, I, I, I said you can do this kind of map, you can find the symmetry in color space, but how could you find a kind of, that kind of symmetry in the space of shapes? I mean, <laughs> the space of shapes seem to uniquely determine what each shape is. Is, is that catching what you say? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't, I don't think this is trivial at all. I don't, I don't think there's an obvious answer to this. Uh, um, uh, let me just, leave, uh, since time is pressing, let, let me just leave that as a question, maybe come back to it in, uh, uh, for proper discussion later. But it really is a good question how, how this can be generalized. You were the one that raised this first, so. Uh, I kind of wanted to ask, like, what does color scheme, like, or color inversion really have to do with like, the way that we Yeah, the function of the thing will remain the same, but the whole point was, the whole hard thing was, um, with the human and the octopus, the physiology is quite different. But you want to say they can both feel pain. The animal rights people will kill um, uh, on the basis of the belief that animals can feel pain. But since the physiology is different, you have to have a good answer to the question. Um, what makes it the case that the octopus is feeling pain? Why should you believe the octopus is feeling pain? And the only answer we have is, look at the functional structure. Look at the way this bit of physiology is wired up. But when you apply that answer to the case of uh, color sensations, you just run into this problem. So it's not enough to say, well, we've got, even, if, even if our spectrums are inversions, we've got the same uh, functional structure. And if we've got the same functional structure, who cares about this other stuff? This other stuff is really important. This other stuff is what being alive and having a mind is all about. I mean, wh when you feel hurt or happiness, when you feel joy, when you look at a painting, when you look at the face of a loved one on an autumn evening, um, the qualitative character of your experience is what it's all about. When you're listening to a great symphony, 
um, when, you, <laughs> when you're in a lecture, <laughs> the, the, the qualitative character of your experience um, is really what is making this thing significant. It's because we have this that human, we think humans are more important than lumps of stone, blocks, or senseless things. Um, uh, that's what makes humans matter. So it's not enough to say, well, if I've got the functional structure, um, then uh, that's all I care about. This other stuff is really important. Yeah? If you, if you go back to the case of inflicting a burn on someone by twisting their arm in two different directions, yeah, what makes that so awful is not the damage it causes, because it doesn't cause any damage. Um, what makes it awful is the feel of it. Um, I'm sorry, that was, <laughs> I got a bit carried away. I think we, we actually do have to move on. Um, uh, 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 well, there was a question back there early on. I, I can't remember, wasn't it? OK, l l let's come back to it if, if, if there's time. Um, so <coughs> functionalists naturally are not going to um, uh, uh, let this go all that easily. So the, the next question is, does spectrum inversion really make sense? I try to describe it quite vividly and say, yeah, you can imagine this. But there is an issue about whether it really makes sense. Look, there are ways of comparing across other people's mental lives to each other that at first sight look as though they make sense. But then when you think about them, they don't. I mean, suppose you and I, for example, are, uh, are going to watch a movie. And um, um, we've narrowed it down. It's either an old cowboy movie with, J with uh, Jimmy Stewart, or it's a new Woody Allen film. And you say, I just can't stand these cowboy movies. I'd rather tear my eyes out than watch Jimmy Stewart in a cowboy hat. Um, uh, but Woody Allen, I'm a real big fan. Um, uh, please let's watch this new one. And I say, well, for me, there's not much in it. Um, I, you know, I really like them both, actually. And uh, uh, I maybe um, have a slight preference for the Jimmy Stewart film. But what you have to understand is that my desires are many orders of magnitude greater than your tepid preferences. <laughs> the slightest difference between any two of my desires is gigantic compared to the biggest difference there can be by any two, to any two of you, your tiny desires. Um, so we'll watch the Jimmy Stewart film. Um, now, the thing is, that doesn't, I mean, it conveys a kind of attitude that, but it doesn't really make sense. You can take people's desires and rank them with respect to one another. But um, does it really make sense to say, um, the absolute value of my desires is greater or lesser than yours. All you can do is take the structure, the relative uh, uh, strengths of people's preferences, and rank them. But saying, is this person's pref uh, preference an absolute 10 volts larger than this person's preference, that probably doesn't make any sense. So there's a way of comparing desires across people preferences across people that at first you might have thought made sense, but when you think about it, it doesn't really. Um, another kind of example is um, if the, the, those of you who wear spectacles, or if you just, even if you don't, you just try it on someone's spectacles sometimes. So something people often say is, when I wear them, everything looks smaller. Um, it's not that you can't see so widely, it's just it's a slightly weird phenomenon. A friend of mine, um, once said, uh, when I got the new glasses, everything looked smaller. But then after a couple of weeks, it stopped. And when I put them on, I thought, they've stopped working um, because everything looks a regular size. Now, suppose um, you go to the optician, and the optician says, well, the good news is that your vision is 20-20. You have just the same acuity as, um, as everyone else. Um, you, uh, uh, your field, size of your field of vision is just the same as everyone else's. But you have a very rare defect. You see everything smaller than everyone else does. But fortunately, we have this very expensive treatment um, that will put things right in no time at all. Now, uh, that, it just doesn't make sense, right? Um, it can happen to you 
It can have, that thing with the glasses obviously does make, the new glasses obviously does make sense because people say that things look a bit smaller. But if you ask, when you get the new glasses and you say things look a bit smaller now, if you ask, well, do they look smaller to me than they do to other people? Or do, thing, do things usually look this small to everybody? And I've just been brought in line with everybody else. That is just, it's just a question that doesn't make sense. You can raise, you know, you can, it's possible to get into raising a question about how your mental states compare to other people's that looks like it's making sense, but isn't really. Um, one last example. Um, uh, there are famous experiments with people putting on inverting prisms that turn everything upside down. So at first, when you put on these inverting prisms, um, it's very confusing. You walk into things. Um, you, you can't really navigate around the room properly. Um, but people adapt after a very short time. The, 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 these experiments were first done in Austria, in Innsbruck. Um, and uh, one of the patients, after a few days wearing the prisms, um, they, all, they all had to keep wearing the prisms day after day. And one guy would drive his motorbike around the streets of Innsbruck wearing the prisms. He did just fine. Um, so there, uh, suppose this guy's driving his bike around, and you say, is he see seeing things the same way up as everybody else or not? I mean, there are two different ways you could think of it. One way you could think of it is it's like spectrum inversion. Everything flipped, but you learned to respond differently. But that doesn't really make sense. I mean, if you can drive your motorbike around just fine, then surely you are seeing things the right way around. It just doesn't make sense to suppose you're seeing everything the wrong way around, but um, uh, uh, you've just adapted. If you adapt like that, then your experience is adapted. So couldn't it be like that with spectrum inversion? Couldn't it be something that at first sight you say, well, just like with the strength of desires, you say, it makes sense to ask if your experiences have the same absolute value as mine, as opposed to this relative ordering in a structure. But really, it doesn't. You see what I mean? With the experiences, I'm saying, relatively, your experiences are all arranged the same way as mine. But are they absolutely the same? But with your preferences, with your way you rank what you'd like to do, you can give that relative ranking, but it doesn't make any sense to say, uh, but are the absolute values of your preferences the same as mine? And similarly with these other cases. So um, a functionalist could say, well, uh, uh, the comparison between your color experiences and mine, that's something that seems to make sense, but it just doesn't really. All you can ask about is um, uh, the relative ordering, the relative structure of your color experiences or mine. The trouble with that is, um, uh -huh. the trouble with that is, uh, the idea of waking up and finding that all your experiences have been flipped round, that seems to make sense. All the colours have flipped round. That makes perfect sense. That could happen. I mean, I didn't see anybody protesting at any rate when I said that earlier. But if that could happen, if that makes sense, then. I mean, after all, that, that kind of thing doesn't make sense for things like the strength of your desires. Um, it doesn't really make sense to suppose you could wake up and find that all your desires were much stronger than they had been before, um, or all much weaker than they had been before. And anyway, couldn't it happen that there are differences between your physiology and mine that show that your spectrum is an inversion of mine? Look, let me blast through something quite quickly here. This is Nida Rumelan's example of uh, pseudo-normal vision. In ordinary um, color vision, there are three kinds of cone in your retina. Um, three cone types, BGR. They have different kinds of photopigment in them that absorb light of different wavelengths. So if you look at how much light of different wavelengths is um, absorbed by each uh, photopigment, in these different cones in your retina, then um, um, the curves are, are different. Um, they're absorbing light at different wavelengths. So they're being, they're being stimulated differently by light of different wavelengths. 
What happens in red-green color blindness is that um, the red and green cones, instead of containing different photopigments, contain the same photopigment. Um, and there are two ways that can happen, two different ways you can get red-green color blindness. Either the pigment that's usually in the G cones is put into the R cones, or the pigment that's usually in the R cones is also put into the G cones. So if you get either kind of situation, then you won't be able to make all the same color discriminations that a regular person can. Okay, that's how you get red-green color blindness. Is that all right? Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, so that's what's happening. You get either um, um, uh, the pigment that was in, uh, uh, that's usually in the red going into the green, or the pigment that's usually in the green going into the red. Now, there's a genetic basis for this. And uh, you can look at the statistics as to how often this is going to happen. Um, but there's also a scenario in which the pigment that's usually um, in the G cones winds up in the R cones, and the pigment that's usually in the R cones winds up in the G cones. So think about that situation. Um, if you have both types of um, deviancy, then you are actually going to be able to make all the same color discriminations as a regular person. Everything has been flipped round for the two cones. So if you, look both if you have both types of red-green color blindness, then you won't show up as color blind in the, uh, on the usual tests for color vision. You will show up as normally sighted. But obviously your physiology is not standard. Um, your physiology is such that um, think, uh, 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 different cones are responding um, uh, to the non-standard wavelengths. So statistically, there should be about 14 cases per 10,000 males of um, this kind of double color blindness. But it's never, ever been detected, this double color blindness. Um, and you can see why. Because if that's happening, then you have a case where this is an inversion of the regular spectrum. So you have to ask the question, 14 per 10,000, these people are out there with spectrums <laughs> inverted from the regular population, and nobody knows. So if you're male, ask yourself the question, <laughs> is it me? <laughs> Couldn't I be one of them? OK, that's the end of the message for today. Hi. Um, <laughs> am I on there? OK. Um, so today, we're going to be looking um, at another argument that uh, uh, brings out how difficult it is to understand the mind as a physical system. The point here is, uh, there's a kind of understanding we ordinarily have of each other's minds. And um, it's actually very difficult to see how you can interpret that as the understanding of a physical system. Um, and you see this uh, point most clearly when that kind of understanding breaks down in the case of split brain patients. So today we're looking at uh, Nagel's article, famous article, Brain Bisection and the Unity of Consciousness. On uh, Friday, we look at um, John Searle's article, Can Computers Think?, which is again about the, the limitations of a functionalist understanding of the mind. And on Friday, um, we'll also give out the essay topics, the essay questions uh, due at the start of October, so you can express yourself. Um, OK. Uh, Oh, and that's been the Chalmers again. That's back to the big Chalmers collection. OK, so I want to start out by putting this into a little bit of context and going back to Descartes' three arguments that we began the course with. Uh, then we'll look at the basic phenomenon of brain bisection and what it means for the idea that your conscious life has a kind of unity. It all hangs together as one thing. How uh, are to interpret that kind of notion? So let's look again, once again at Descartes' three arguments. 
Remember, three, Descartes had three objections to physicalism. One was, your knowledge of your own existence is more certain than your knowledge of the existence of any physical thing could be. The whole world might be an illusion. The whole physical world might be an illusion. It might all be a dream. None of that stuff might be there. It might just be you be with your sensations being stimulated by an evil neuroscientist. Um, but you'd still know that you existed. So how could um, you be a physical thing when your knowledge of any physical thing can be called into question, but your knowledge of your own existence can't? The second argument is you can conceive of yourself without a body. So the body and the self have to be different things. And that point that you can conceive of the mind differently to the way you uh, conceive of a body has actually been coming out in um, these last uh, uh, couple of um, arguments that we've looked at. When you think about the inverted spectrum, the point about the inverted spectrum is you can look at someone else as a physical uh, unity, as a, as a physical system. You can know how they're organized as a physical system, but that doesn't tell you how their visual sensations are organized, whether their um, visual uh, sensations are the same as yours or different. So what you can um, imagine someone else's mental life to be like seems to be different to your knowledge of them as a functional or physical system. Bloch's point, when you think about it, was you can conceive of a body that's functionally organized exactly like yours. But it's not, um, it doesn't have a mind at all. So that's right. How can having a mind, how can having sensations be the same thing as having a body, having a, being a physical system? These arguments from the inverted spectrum or from absent qualia, the homunculus headed robot, you can see these as ways of developing Descartes' second argument. Can't you? So the first argument was your knowledge of your own existence is more certain than your knowledge of any material thing. The second point is your, your ways of conceiving the self come apart from your ways of conceiving the body. So the body and the self must be separate. And the hardest argument to understand is the third one. Matter is divisible, but the self is indivisible. The self hangs together as a unity in a way that a physical system doesn't. The body is, by its very nature, always divisible, while the mind is utterly indivisible. And I think one way to put it is to say, when you have a collection of thoughts or sensations or feelings, there is always the perspective from which those thoughts and sensations and feelings are being had. There is always a single perspective from which they are being had, a single experiential point of view. And it makes no sense to try cutting that up or cutting it in two. Um, that would only, the best you could generate um, two different experiential points of view, two different minds. It makes no sense to talk about half a mind and we do sometimes say, I have half a mind to do this, or I'm in two minds about that. Um, but you don't take that literally. Right? There is always just a single experiential point of view. And the th I think the way to put Descartes' argument is to say, you can't explain that unity that the mind has in physical terms. So this is kind of abstract, but the great thing about Nagel's uh, argument is that it's a way of making these points concrete. Okay, so the cerebral cortex is in two halves. That bit of your brain has two components that are like mirror, they're roughly mirror images of one another. Um, there's a bit in the left and a bit in the right and they look very similar. They have slightly different functions. The bit in the left uh, 
controls your output of speech. Um, the bit in the left gets its input from the right-hand side of your visual field, from the right-hand side of your body, and it controls movement on the right-hand side of your body. So it controls uh, your uh, right arm movements, your right leg movements. The right hemisphere doesn't have much to do with the production of speech, but it gets its input from uh, the left side of the visual field, goes up to the right, and then it controls uh, movement on the uh, left. So it kind of crisscrosses. Follow me very closely. Does that all make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. So the left is getting its input from the right and uh, controlling movement on the right and also speech production. The right is getting its input from the left and controlling movement on the left. Plain as day? Yes. Is philosophy at the mercy of science? Um, I wouldn't put it like that. It's a collaborative exercise, dear heart. Um, <laughs> I mean, what we do in philosophy in our humble way is we point out the limitations of what the scientists are doing um, to their enormous satisfaction. Um, <laughs> um, th there are both elements. There are elements of collaboration and competition. Uh, I think that's a fair. But it would be foolish not to pay a lot of attention to what is going on in science. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. So, you will find at this university that uh, empirical psychology and philosophy actually work a lot together. Um, uh, okay. Uh, you'll see today actually that this point you couldn't you couldn't have made this point without the scientific work, but the point is actually a point about the limitations of a scientific understanding of the mind. Always remember, um, the scientific approach to the mind is functionalism. There is nothing else that science has to offer except one or another kind of functionalism. So if you think there is any kind of limitation in functionalism, you are really pointing to a difficulty in cu the current scientific approach to the mind. OK, so um, the corpus callosum. So um, if, um, as I stand here, a blade were to fall from the ceiling, and slice me in two, then something like that is what you would see, right? I mean, you see more, I guess, but you, uh, uh, that, that's kind of the picture. And then um, um, I would be able to say to you, look, there is, well, I wouldn't actually, but um, <laughs> you would be able to see the corpus callosum there, a broadly, a transversely running broad band of fibers, about 200 million fibers connecting the two hemispheres. Uh, a large band of nerve fibers connecting the two hemispheres. So what's it for? As Nagel says, um, um, in the old days, people used to get this cut, and um, it didn't really seem to do, make any difference to what happened. So uh, it was thought, well, maybe it stops the two um, halves collapsing onto each other. Um, that would be handy. Um, but actually, it turns out to be a bit more important than that. Um, in cases of epilepsy, when someone's having an epileptic fit, what happens is you get a kind of electrical firestorm on one hemisphere, and the corpus callosum transmits that electrical firestorm to the other hemisphere. So when you have someone who's getting a lot of epileptic fits, you know, one or two a day, that's really incapacitating their lives, um, one surgical procedure that really helps is to cut the corpus callosum. Um, uh, so that the two hemispheres don't have that uh, connecting band linking them anymore. You contain it in something like the way you contain a forest fire. Uh, and what does that do to people? Well, um, uh, I, I was just watching the video I, I recommended to you where um, the patient says, uh, well, I don't feel any different at all after this. It's, um, it's I just have a backup brain. That's all that's happened. Uh, so, You've got 
input from the, this is the brain viewed from the top. Here are the eyes. You've got input to the left side coming uh, up to the right hemisphere. Um, and you've got input from the right side coming up to the left, left hemisphere. And you've got the corpus callosum here being cut in the case of the epileptic patient. Um, that's absolutely plain as day. Yeah. OK. Now, the thing is, as I said, um, the patients who have this done don't behave any differently. Uh, they can play a game of tennis just as well as anyone else. They are fully functionally integrated. They hold down regular jobs. They have regular social lives. Nothing seems to be different. So is there any difference at all? Well, the difference shows up only when you um, uh, consider pretty subtle testing. Um, it doesn't show up at all in everyday life. If the person sitting next to you is a split brain patient, um, you're not going to know about it. If you were a split brain patient, you might not even know about it. Um, <laughs> food for thought. Um, <laughs> so you'll still be able to play tennis just fine. It shows up when you get very brief presentation testing, where you have very brief presentations, a few hundred milliseconds on a screen, um, and, the, and the patient's being asked to respond to these very brief um, presentations. The thing is that intuitively what happens is that there's a lot of uh, w w what the, the corpus callosum does is it allows the two hemispheres to communicate. But in everyday life, um, anything that's in the left side of my visual field can be brought very quickly into the right side of my visual field. And anything that's in the right side of my visual field can be brought very quickly into the left side of my visual field. You can try this right now. See, it's really easy. It's really fast. Um, you can do it in a second. Uh, so um, there's a lot of redundancy then. Both hemispheres can get the information very quickly. Um, uh, so it's just when you get these very fast presentations on screen that ordinary head scanning can't happen. I mean, it doesn't happen fast enough to let you bring what was in the left. I mean, if I, uh, I said that's pretty easy to do it now. But if I say, do it in a couple of hundred milliseconds, uh, that you can't do, right? That, uh, that's much harder. I mean, I don't wish to arouse uh, competition here. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah. OK, so suppose what you get is a display where the word pencil, there's a bunch of objects in front of the, on a tray in front of the patient. And um, the word um, pencil is flashed to the left side of the visual field. So class, if the word pencil is flashed to the left side of the visual field, which um, hemisphere is doing the processing? Right, very good. Um, and which um, arm movements is the right side controlling? Very good. So the left hand is going to hunt for the pencil, right? <laughs> yes, right. You mean I mean correct, <laughs> right? Okay. Um, and similarly, you follow me very closely here. If the word toothbrush is flashed to the right, then if it's on the right, which hemisphere processes it? The left. And which arm movements does the left one control? Very good. So the right, the left hand is hunting for the pencil, and the right hand is hunting for the toothbrush. So you get that dissociation. Well, a, a regular person doesn't do that, right? Um, what am I hunting for? These signals are flashing backwards and forwards with these 200 million nerve fibers very fast between the hemispheres. So um, you don't see that dissociation. You do see that in a split brain patient. Um, Nagel's got this wonderful example of a monkey. Uh, uh, a, going, a split brain monkey going for a peanut and the two hands having a tug of war for, for, for the peanut. Uh, um, okay. <laughs> so here's um, a split brain patient um, being told, can you say what word you're seeing and also reach for the thing that uh, uh, this, the, the word names? I didn't put that very well. So if, it say, if you see the word ring, you've got to look for it. You've got to hunt manually for the ring. And uh, you've got to say the word ring. And if you see the word key, 
you've got to um, uh, hunt manually for the key and say the word key. If you see, see the word key ring, you've got to say key ring and hunt for the key ring. So a regular person looking at that would be hunting for a key ring. Yes? Um, the split brain patient looking at this uh, doesn't hunt for a key ring at all and doesn't say key ring. Um, the split brain patient, well, the information, uh, the word that goes on the right here, which word goes to the left hemisphere? Ring, very good. Um, and, uh, and the left hemisphere is the one that controls the production of speech. So the patient says the word ring, but with his left hand, his, uh, the, the right hemisphere has got the word key, and uh, uh, the uh, right hemisphere therefore is controlling the left hand, and the left hand's hunting for the key. That's quite different to the behavior of a regular patient. Okay, that, that all makes sense? Okay. Here, as you can see, the patients in these experiments usually have the top of their heads cut off, um, which makes it easier to see what's going on in them. Um, so uh, uh, here, here we have one such patient, and he's shown um, very fast again. Uh, in the left-hand side of the screen, a snow scene, and in the right-hand side of the screen, a chicken foot. And he's asked, point to the object in this array that goes with the scene being displayed on the screen. Can you just track through this? I, I, I leave this as an exercise for you right now. What's going on here? So the snow scene, anyone want to do it? Okay, the snow scene being on the left is um, being processed by the right hemisphere and uh, the left arm, being controlled by the right hemisphere, is pointing to the shovel to clear up the snow. Yes? Yeah. So the chicken foot, being on the right, is processed by the left hemisphere, and the right hemisphere is controlling the right arm, which is therefore pointing to the chicken. Yep. So now you say to this patient, um, look, isn't that weird? Turn your head. Look, isn't that strange? You pointed to the shovel. Why in the world did you point to the shovel? By this time, the picture is gone. So it's only the left hemisphere that is controlling speech. So the, right, the left hemisphere doesn't know anything about the snow scene. What is the patient going to say when you say, why did you point to the shovel? I don't know. Actually, the patient does better than that. When asked, why the, chick why the chicken? He said it goes with the chicken claw, he said. To clean up the chicken coop, why else? And when you see patients, if you spend some happy hours on the web looking at these videos, when you see patients saying this kind of thing, they are not being mischievous or, uh, uh, they are just regular people trying to answer the questions the same way you or I might. These are perfectly serious, sincere answers to clean up the chicken coop. You can fabulate these answers very, very fast and really without knowing that's what you're doing. You make sense of your own actions there. Uh, the, the, the stuff about specialization I've seen has all been about, um, well, I don't think so. I'm not an expert in this. Um, yeah, you could express it with, yeah. That's right. Um, well, what, what, what does happen in some cases is um, Nagel gives this example of um, a person who's shown a, a, a pipe in the left visual field yeah, and asked, what's that? Um, and uh, write the answer. Yeah? And uh, uh, so this comes to the right hemisphere. Um, so it controls the left hand, which is not the hand the patient writes with. The right hand has no idea what's there, but the left hand says, well, I'm not usually the writing hand, but I may as well get on with it. <laughs> so um, it starts writing out the letters P, I, yeah? But at that point, um, the, uh, uh, the left hemisphere, seeing what the words are that have started, takes over and writes the word pencil. 
with the right hand. The right hand seizes the pencil from the left. Yeah. That's right. It takes charge. It says, I know what's going on here. I'll let me do the writing. <laughs> In a way, it's like the confabulation. The brain is trying to tell a coherent story about what's going on around it. Um, and it's just making sense of all the cues as best it can. Would it take over if the person is left-handed? Sorry? Would it take over if the person is left-handed, naturally? Uh, I, I, I think it would depend on the case. I, 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 don't, I, I, I couldn't make your prediction about that. Probably not. Probably not. Um, would be my guess. But I, I don't know of any experiment where people did just that with a left-hander. OK, so that's a basic phenomenon. Um, yeah, you can see that here he's not only had the top of his brain cut off, but some radioactive dye has been used to um, <laughs> make the situation very clear. But um, if you have that, I guess you can remember exactly what's going on. OK? Let me just give you a second to look at that and keep that in your head. OK. What, but part of what's going on in that pipe pencil case is that communication between the two hemispheres is going on outside the brain. So if a concealed object is placed in the left hand, so it's being processed by the right hemisphere, and the patient is asked to guess what's in it, wrong guesses will elicit an annoyed frown because um, uh, the left hemisphere is controlling the wrong, is making the wrong guesses. The right hemisphere knows what's in the left hand and can hear that these are the wrong answers. Though it is powerless to say anything, um, um, but it can frown. Um, but if the speaking hemisphere should guess correctly, the patient will smile. OK. That's basic phenomena of what happens in brain bisection. Is that all right? OK. Um, so what are we to make of it? Well, Nagel's point is there's a kind of understanding that you can't have of those patients. You want to know what kind of experiences is the patient having? What is the visual experience of the patient like? And the answer is, well, you can't, it's not, there doesn't seem to be an integrated visual experience here. Is this patient, looking at this scene, is this patient experiencing the whole thing? Is the patient having the experience of what's on the left or experience of what's on the right? None of these answers seem to make sense. Um, the, the patient can't be, surely can't be experiencing the whole scene because then the reactions would be just like yours or mine. They'd be having visual experience just like you or me when they see that, that, that scene. Um, but if they're only experiencing what's in the left, then, um, if, and if this was unconscious, then they, they, they shouldn't be able to, uh, uh, to give the answer here but, um, pointing to uh, uh, the chicken. I mean, if, if, this, if, this isn't, if they're not having any experience of the chicken claw, then how come they're able to do this? And on the other hand, if they're not having experience of the snow scene, how come they're able to point to the shovel? Um, it is really puzzling to know what to say about what the patient is experiencing here. It doesn't seem to be all to get something that's altogether below the level of experience. I mean, people sometimes talk about subliminal perception or implicit perception, but that doesn't seem to be what's going on here. Um, the whole thing is fully under the patient's control. So what kind of experience is the patient having? You can't get into the mind of the patient. You can't imagine from the inside what the patient's subjective life is like. If I say to you now, try and imagine how the room looks to me, all these eager, alert faces, um, um, intent in the quest for knowledge, um, then you, you can do that, right? Uh, you can imagine what kind of visual experience someone is having from another point in the room. You can do that with no problem. With this guy, you can't get into his head. You can't imagine what he's seeing from his point of view. Um, 
you know, if you say, imagine what you, you see from the top of the Campanile, you can do that. Imagine what you see uh, when you're a split brain patient. That seems impossible. I mean, people have reacting to the split brain patients. One early reaction to the split brain patients was every human being actually has two minds. This wasn't suspected before, but really there are always two cells occupying the same body. It's just that the corpus callosum lets them talk to each other very quickly. So you are actually, in, this is a ridiculous theory, um, but you are actually, but you, though you can see how someone might say it, but you are actually inhabited by two cells, two different minds. Um, the unfortunate Roland Puchetti wrote um, a long series of articles um, arguing exactly this view. Uh, I mean, it's, it didn't really catch on, uh, that view. Most of us think, no, there's only one mind, and even in the case of the split brain patient, there's only one, or at any rate, there aren't two completely different minds there. Or is it that your mind just inhabits one hemisphere and the other one isn't? Uh, um, but the, the left hemisphere is doing the speech production. So it would, you know, if you were asked, you would say, that's me. The, the speech production, that's the real mind. The other one, that's just a lot of unconscious stuff. Um, but the, um, the right hemisphere is the one that does um, the emotional or affective processing. It's what we think of as um, where your heart is, uh, wh where your richest, deepest emotions lie. So it's very hard to say uh, is one hemisphere rather than the other that's got the mind. The, mi the, the mind, as we ordinarily think of it, involves both hemispheres. How many minds do we have here in the case of a split brain patient? If you think in box and arrow terms of the patient and say, well, um, uh, I'm going to explain to you, you can, ex you can imagine a functional breakdown, you can imagine multiple personality, a true multiple personality case, where you channel different people at different times, and you could do that in functional terms, you could functionally distinguish the operations of the two people, but from that kind of functionalist perspective, these patients are fully integrated. They drive a truck, they um, talk to their family, they live regular lives just like everyone else. And on any persuasive functionalist way of explaining what it is to be a single person, they are fully integrated. So, and it's not just that, they're, they're fully integrated and also you can give a complete functional description of them. That's basically what we just did. We walked through everything you need to know for functionally characterizing these patients. There's no puzzle about them from a functional point of view. You could write down, uh, most of you in the class could at this moment write down a box and arrow diagram for what the hemispheres are doing, what kinds of input, what kinds of outputs. They are functionally very well understood. But there's something here that we're missing. We don't know what it's like from the patient's point of view. You can't imagine what kinds of experiences the patient is having. That's why I say, when, you, when you're asked, what is, that, what, what is the patient experiencing when they look at that whole scene? That's the thing that is so hard to answer. Let me give just one other kind of example here. There are um, paintings by Archimboldo that, um, uh, is this a face? Is this fruit? Very good. Um, so um, it's a face made of fruit. Um, so uh, uh, for a regular perceiver, what you see is both things, the face and the fruit. Um, but the, their specialization in which parts of your brain process faces in particular and I thought that the area that um, is specialized for processing faces uh, uh, is in the right hemisphere. So suppose you show um, a blind sight, a, a split brain patient, um, this kind of picture in, let's say, uh, the, um, the uh, uh, left visual field. What will the patient say is there? Right, very good. Suppose you, because that processing is going to the right, which is capable of doing the face processing, the patient will see the face. 
suppose you have the picture in the left side of the visual field. It will just get it. Sorry, I said left side of the visual field. That's again what I meant. What I mean is, suppose you show the patient in the right side of the visual field. What you'll get is just that's some fruit. Yeah. So when the patient is, um, when you're asking, what experience is the patient having when you just confront them with the whole thing? That's very, very hard to answer. If you give them a, yep. No, um, the, 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 it is really, this is why I say look at the videos, it really, really gives such a vivid sense. The patients say, no, it, uh, all that's happened is that I don't get the epileptic fits anymore. Otherwise, everything is just fine. It's only when you're doing these pretty subtle experiments in the lab that, um, that the, you, you know, the, you don't, in ordinary life, you're not being shown things only for a few hundred milliseconds. Uh, with, with somebody observing exactly what behaviours you do. So from the patient's point of view, everything goes on exactly as before. Yeah. Uh, th they don't say um, anything's different. Uh, uh, yeah. Sorry? Oh, yes. I mean, um, um, uh, it is considered ethical to do it. Well, because from the patient's point of view, um, Nothing is happening negatively. Oh, the only things that are happening are positive. Sorry? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, uh, yep. Yeah. That's right. Oh, no, okay, that, that's why I put out the word here. If you say point to what you're seeing, yeah? So if you put the whole thing in front and say point to, to the word that indicates what you're seeing, right, then the patient points, um, uh, wait, wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute while I sort this out. The patient points um, like this. No, like, talk me through this. <laughs> like that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> At any rate, the two hands point to different words. Yeah. Yes, you're quite right. Okay. <laughs> okay, so what is, is the patient doing this? What is their experience? I mean, as you sit here, um, and look at this. You can imagine someone looking at this and seeing only the fruit and not realizing there was a face there. Or you can imagine someone looking at this and having an experience of a face and not realizing it was made of fruit. But what in the world is the experience of someone who's doing this and pointing to the two words simultaneously? What is their mental life like? You have no idea. You understand functionally exactly what is going on, but something is missing. And if that's right, it shows that there is a kind of understanding that we have of each other's mental lives in ordinary life that isn't a functionalist understanding. So Descartes' argument was the mind is indivisible and matter is divisible. And what I'm suggesting is you can read that as saying, when, when you ordinarily know someone else very well, when you know someone else's mental life very well, when you're sitting with your friend at the window and you, f you see them stiffen and you look out to see what they're looking at, um, you know what they're experiencing. Um, you understand what's going on in their mind. Um, you understand it from their point of view. In the case of the split brain patient looking at a scene like this, you can't have that kind of understanding of what is going on in their mind. Um, you know, so, so far I said, well, look, this is um, the kind of dissociation you get in the case of split brain patients, and they don't really get a comprehensive understanding of what's going on. 
There are advantages to having a, a split brain. If you have a pen, um, you can try this right now. Oh, actually, you need two pens. If you have two pens, get them ready, and you can try this right now. Um, I, I, I'll. OK, your task is the figure in the left, copy it with your left hand. The figure in the right, copy it with your right hand. Simultaneously. <laughs> well, not too good. Um, it's very hard to copy two different figures simultaneously for a regular person. I hope, I, <laughs> I hope you guys have not all just shot through this and done perfect drawings. But, um, <laughs> but I don't do too well at this. A split brain patient can do that kind of task absolutely straightforwardly. Yeah. So there are, I mean, I'm not saying this is a great advantage in life, being able to do this, but um, there are positive things. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, just look at the things on the screen. Sorry? You know, there are no restrictions on what you can look at. You can scan it, you know, you can turn your head back and forward, you can look at your hands. But the only thing is you've got to be doing it simultaneously with both hands. Yeah. And the thing is that our action is usually so integrated because the corpus callosum is feeding information back and forth between the hemispheres that um, uh, it's really very difficult to do uncoordinated actions with the two hands. A split brain patient can just do that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Are you not versus just having a yeah, b b being able to write just as well with your left hand as with your le right hand, right? <laughs> that's ambidextrous. Um, um, but it's being able to write different things with your right hand at the same time as your left. As your left, I, I got muddled up there. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm going a bit cross-eyed with all this right and left. Um, <laughs> but, um, where was I? Um, yeah, it's one thing to be able to write just as well with your left hand as your right hand. Yeah, it's a different thing to be able to write one message with your right hand at the same time as you're writing a different message with your left hand. That you couldn't do, but I guess an ambidextrous split brain patient, well, why not? Yeah. Um, uh, the Right. So you do have knowledge that you don't have a split brain? No, not that I know of. Yes, that's right. Uh, that, that, uh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, but, but you were saying that somebody with a split brain would also point to both for a different reason? If, um, well, wait a minute. Yeah, the, 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 they would point to one unique. Yeah, if I asked you, if I asked you only point if you're seeing one or the other, but not both. Yeah, then you wouldn't point to either, right? Split brain patient would, would actually point to both. Yeah. Yeah, because it's being done very fast and there's no communication as to what each arm is doing. Um, yeah. Well, you see, the, it, it, it'd be pretty bad if you did have to say we have two minds because a split brain patient really. It's not, it's not the, this is not a case of multiple personality. You know, the, these tests are just bringing out a very tiny part of the patient's life. Yeah, so the, the, the lack of functional integration here is very, very, you only observe it in these very sen sensitive, um, delicate experiments, um, not in everyday life at all. So it would really be the wrong answer if you had to say this person has two minds. Well, a functionalist would say, look, for, to, uh, I mean, the natural thing for a functionalist is, would be to say, I'm giving you a functional characterization of what it is to have a single mind, and that's something that um, applies to the whole of a person's life, not just some tiny situation in the laboratory. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I 
That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, so <sighs> this is what I mean by saying when you have this kind of diagram that I guess is familiar now, um, showing how the specialization works. Um, you do have a theoretical knowledge. You do have a functional understanding of what is going on. There is no deep mystery about um, um, functionally specifying, scientifically classifying what is going on here. So when you get this kind of phenomenon, the patient uh, has got a, um, the instruction, pick up the spoon, flashed um, to the uh, left visual field, and is saying, um, I didn't see anything, but simultaneously picking up the spoon. When you, when, you, when you see that kind of situation, you can give a scientific functional uh, explanation of what is going on. That is not deeply mysterious. Um, nonetheless, there is something missing here. There is, there is some notion of what it's like from the patient's perspective, what it's like to be in the patient's shoes that we're not getting. And that seems to be very important for our ordinary understanding of each other's mental lives. Um, and we use it all the time. You say, how would you like it if that happened to you? You say, put yourself in someone else's shoes. So if that's right, the knowledge of other people's minds, you, you're kind of imaginative, empathetic understanding of other people's minds can't be the same thing as having some kind of theory about how they're all wired up. There must be something different going on here. There's something, there's a kind of understanding we're missing here that we take for granted in our ordinary understanding of each other. And what's so important about this case is it's not so much that the split brain patients are important in themselves, though they are, but they shed a lot of light on what is going on in the ordinary case. In the ordinary case, something is happening that we take for granted. The other person has a single experiential perspective, um, and you're grasping what it's like from that experiential perspective. Functionalism can't explain what that missing knowledge is, can't explain what it means to put yourself in the other person's shoes. And behaviorism can't explain what's missing either, because we know how that you, you've all just been predicting how the split brain patients are going to behave in response to various stimuli. You know about the patient's behavior. And dualism is no help either. It's one thing to say this resists understanding as a physical system, but it's not as if, oh, well, if you just assume that it's an ectoplasmic system, then it all falls into place. That's just a piece of nonsense. Um, it, I mean, that just, makes, that just makes the whole thing completely in, the fog, in, a, in, a, in a fog. If you say, ah, well, it's ectoplasm. I mean, how, how does ectoplasm work? Um, the, the dualism doesn't help. It's not that it's not a physical stuff. It's not that it's, it's, we don't seem to be dealing with any kind of stuff at all. It's resisting understanding as some kind of uh, system, whether physical or ectoplasmic. That's the basic point. Yep. Oh, they have two different minds. Well, no, Nagel's point is um, you can't really say they're just a single unified experiential uh, system here. Um, but on the other hand, uh, if you try to say, well, there are two different minds, that loses the point that in everyday life, this person's emotional connections to other people and so on are just as seamless as ever. Um, and, they, and the way Nagel puts it is, it's very hard to say that there is some whole number of minds here. It's not one mind, it's not two. Um, it's hard to know what the right answer is. Yeah. It's not that there's 1.5 either. Yeah. Um, the, the cautious way I'm putting it is, our ordinary understanding of each other presupposes a kind of unity in the mind that is missing here, and therefore there is a kind of understanding that is missing here. Okay, great questions. I, I, th I, th I think we have to stop. Uh, thanks very much. Okay. okay, hello, good afternoon. Let's start. <laughs> good afternoon, class. Um, does everyone have copies of the essay questions? You're... 
Okay. Uh, I'll also send them, post them online, and mail them to you. Um, okay. Uh, so today we're looking at um, cells, very much discussed paper, the Chinese room, and um, on Monday uh, we'll do a review, and on um, Wednesday uh, we'll start in on consciousness. Um, uh, I want to begin with the computer, what the computer model of the mind is, and uh, then look at um, uh, Searle's argument, uh, and just look at the details of how that's meant to work, and then finish up by looking at the broader implications of this for consciousness and understanding. So, the computer model of the mind has been very popular since, I guess, the 1950s, 1960s. Um, the question it's addressing is, what is it to be able to understand a language? What is it to be able to think in a language? Um, having a language seems to expand the possibilities of your mind. Um, if you think of a dog, um, and what you, you, know, you look at your dog and you try and figure out what's going on in that um, furry brain of its, then if you try supposing, could the dog be wondering what's going to be happening a week next Wednesday? Um, you can be pretty sure it's not thinking that. That seems like a crazy idea, or that the dog might be remembering what happened last year. Because the dog doesn't have a language, you can only be thinking about what's going to happen two weeks from today if you have a language. So, um, getting some analysis of what it is to understand a language or to be able to think in a language um, seems really important for understanding what's distinctive about the mental life of a human being. And uh, machine analogies in general have always been popular for understanding the mind. I was reading Gaio, uh, a very um, distinguished 19th century um, a psychologist who was writing about memory. This is around 1900, around the time of the invention of the gramophone. And, um, what Gaio does is he uh, gives a kind of explanation. You, you know what? I, you guys probably don't remember gramophones, um, the excitement of the, the vinyl and the needle and all that. But um, um, what Gaio does is he gives a kind of basic explanation of how a gramophone works. He says, look, there are the grooves of the needle. And then he says, look, when you think about it, memory is just like that. Human memory is like that. When someone reminds you of something, what that's like is dropping the needle into the grooves of the brain and playing back those scenes from long ago. Um, in the 1950s, I remember someone writing an article uh, uh, comparing the mind to um, a telephone exchange. Uh, in around 1700, um, Swiss clocks, were the very latest in technology, so it was generally thought that the mind was pretty much like a clock. Um, if you go back to the Stone Age, people were doubtless saying, you know, when you think about it, the mind is like a wheel, or when you think about it, the mind is like a fire. Um, this is really the key. But anyway, um, since the 1950s, the computer model has been very popular. The idea is that you view the physical brain, the biological brain, as hardware, and the mind is the software of the brain. Just as a computer runs a program, and the same program can be run on many different physical computers, so uh, your mind is like a piece of software that is running on this bit of biological wetware. In principle, the very same program could run on lots of different bits of biology, or maybe on something that wasn't biological at all. And then the question is, well, how, how would that, what would it take for a computer to understand the language it's using? Uh, and first of all, really, we need some kind of analysis of what a computer is. I mean, you know the kind of thing that people mean when they say a computer, but the thing about ordinary computers is it's very easy to understand them in mentalistic terms. In fact, most of us interact with computers on the basis of thinking of them as having minds. You think, well, I've got to tell it what I want it to do. It's got to understand that I, do, that I, that I need it to do this or that. Um, we interact with computers as if they have minds. 
But we need something better than that. We need some kind of definition of what we're talking about when we say a computer. It mustn't be just that we can interpret it as having a mind. We can read it in as having a mind. So um, here's Searle explaining how you uh, characterize a computer. A typical computer rule will determine that when a machine is in a certain state and it has a certain symbol on its tape, then it will perform a certain operation, such as erasing that symbol or printing another symbol, and then go into another state, such as moving the tape one square to the left. Okay, if you think of it, this is a familiar idea. Is that right? We recognize this? This is none other than our old friends S1 and S2. Yeah, that what he's describing there is um, um, what happens when you've got a particular sensory input affecting state S1, then um, when the machine is in a certain state and there's a certain symbol, and it's, when it gets a certain symbol on its tape, that is when it gets that sensory input, then um, it will perform a certain operation such as changing the symbol, erasing the symbol or printing another symbol. Uh, so it performs the operation, um, erases the symbol or uh, prints another symbol. And then it will enter another state, such as moving the tape into, into our old friend S2, moving this tape, this tape one, one square to the left, and so on uh, for a characterization of state S2. So you can fully characterize the operations of the computer by these kind of rules. The computer model of the mind is a version of functionalism. Um, it adds something to functionalism. Um, it adds something about why it is that the computer is behaving in this way. The idea is that it's because the signs have the physical shapes that they do that the computer is behaving in this way. The physics of the signs used in the language that the computer is using are what causing it to behave in the way it does. So these signs inside the computer have particular shapes they have a particular syntax. Let, let, let me uh, give an example here. Um, suppose it's a, a beautiful summer's evening with the sun setting um, in the west. Um, and as you sit there in the quiet reading Descartes' meditations, I come up softly behind you and I <laughs> I bring my mouth close to your shell-like ear and I say, yip, 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 yip. <laughs> now, that, that may have an effect on you. That, that may cause you, that may traumatize you. Um, but it's not because of the meaning of what I said, because just between you and me, what I said had no meaning. But the physical sign had an impact on you. Now, and straight off, it seems completely different if I say to you something like, do you realize what time it is? Then it seems like it's not just the physics of the signs that are causing you to react. It's something about the meaning of what I said. But the computer model says that's actually an illusion. Really what's going on here is the same kind of thing in both cases. What happened when you were learning your language was that your brain was being tuned to respond differentially uh, to the fine details of the physical signs that are impacting on you from the people around you. So these signs are impacting on the biology of your brain in quite fine-tuned ways, and you react in complex ways. And that's what it is to be understanding the meaning when I come up behind you and make a loud, meaningless noise, you react to the physical sign. Um, when I come up behind you and say, uh, uh, you it's me, then um, you're reacting to the meaning, but really it's the same kind of process both times. It's just a very fine-tuned kind of response in the second case, but it's a physical response in both cases. You are reacting to the shapes or the syntax of um, uh, my utterance. So the computer model says it's because the signs um, 
have the physical characteristics that they do, that the states that they think of work as they do. So what's happening is that um, there's the language outside that we're all talking, the, the, the common language, English, that we're all talking, and there is the internal structure of the brain, which itself has a structure like a language, and that physical internal language of the brain, cell firings or whatever, um, that is what's causing you to respond as you do to the signs of the language. That's how a computer works. The symbols of a computer language, the kind of thing that's assumed to be going on in your brain, the symbols of a computer language have no meaning. This is Searle. They have no semantic content. They are not about anything. At the end of the day, in a computer language, what you have is a bunch of zeros and ones. And those signs um, have to be specified purely in terms of their shapes, their physical characteristics, their formal or syntactical structure. The zeros and ones in a binary code are just numerals. They don't even stand for numbers. So at the end of the day, what's happening is that we talk English to one another, and that's processed by a computer language in our brains. That is the computer model of the mind. And that's what's going on in our understanding of language. So the computer model of mind is functionalism plus the idea that the way all those boxes and arrows are working has to do with the uh, physical activity of something that is physically like a language operating in the brain. The computer model of the mind then is functionalism plus the idea that what makes the box and arrow connections work the way they do are purely physical sentences inside the boxes. I probably don't need to emphasize that's a very popular model of mind. The, ho the whole idea of artificial intelligence is built on something like that. Yeah, that's been the dominant model for decades now. Okay, so that's what Cell is going to attack. Plain as day. <laughs> Stop reading the essay questions. Um, <laughs> okay. 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 So, Cell says, how can this have anything to do with an understanding of how the mind works? Suppose you did it. Suppose you've written a bunch of computer programs as a result of which you did have some artificial intelligence. You did have um, a robot, a computer that could react to being given sentences of English in a way that was quite like the way a human being reacted to sentences of English. I mean, there are various computer programs like that out there right now um, that will have some kind of conversation with you. So imagine it's been successful, and imagine it's been working for Chinese. So for example, if the computer is given a question in Chinese, then it'll match that question against its memory or its database. And um, after uh, it, it going into state S1, S2, printing symbols and so on, what you get is appropriate answers to the questions in Chinese. Suppose that the computer's answers are just as good as those of a native Chinese speaker. Suppose that in AI, they have actually done it. And this thing seems to be holding conversations um, with you as well as a regular person. That's a really stringent test. I mean, there isn't a computer at the moment that really meets that uh, criterion. But um, if you had that, would that computer literally understand Chinese? I and mean, what's your hunch? Can you put up your hand if you think, if, if straight off the answer to that seems to be yes? I'd settle for that. Yeah, you say, yeah I mean, you, I think we would actually say it understands Chinese in that case. What about, how many of you think it's no? Okay, how many of you think it's no because you read the cell? <laughs> okay, that's very interesting, okay. Um, okay, um, well, I mean, if you say no, it is a really tough call what you are asking for from a computer programmer, um, someone trying to do artificial intelligence. I mean, what more do you want? The thing looks like a Chinese speaker. I mean, doesn't the, uh, when he talks like a Chinese speaker, reacts like a Chinese speaker, behaves in every non-visual way like a Chinese speaker. 
What more would you want for an understanding of Chinese? Well, here's the Charles Chinese room example. Suppose you are locked in a room, and in this room are several baskets full of Chinese symbols. You are given a rule book in English for manipulating these symbols. This, in effect, is whatever computer program it is that is so successful here. So and here you see Searle's beautiful sensitivity to the intricacies of the Chinese language. So for example, the rule might say, take the squiggle squiggle sign out of basket number one and put it next to a squoggle squoggle sign from basket number two. So that's how a computer program breaks things down, right? It is these very simple operations. So the thing you might get is if you see this shape followed by this shape, followed by this shape, then produce that shape, followed by that shape. What you'd be doing then is simulating S1 or simulating S2. Right? You are just manually doing what the computer does. But all right, that could happen. So if you've got a successful computer program, it would take you a very long time to do all this stuff, but you could do it. You could, if, I mean, if a computer can do it, you can do it, um, given you enough time. So then, this is you. Sitting in your room, people post in questions to you. You don't understand a word of Chinese, let's suppose. You um, identify them merely as squiggles and squoggles using this gigantic rule book. Um, you get uh, inputs. P people put questions in Chinese in. People say, how should I? Uh, sorry, you got a question? <laughs> it's really very good. I wish I knew. I would like to credit it, but um, it wasn't me. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> okay. Um, I think this makes unmistakable what Settle is talking about. This is exactly what he's envisaging. So this is you um, uh, uh, getting questions in input to you in Chinese, and what you do is you identify what kind of sign you've got here. You look through your gigantic instruction manual and it says things like, take a squiggle squiggle sign from basket number one and put it next to a squoggle squoggle sign from basket number two. Um, you do enough of this and then you post back out through the door a bunch of Chinese characters. Do you understand a word of Chinese in this scenario? No, you have no idea what's going on. Here you say plentifully, I'm just manipulating squiggles and squoggles. I don't understand Chinese. The rule book itself is in English. And Searle says, there's no way you could learn Chinese just by having a gigantic rule book like that and working through what it tells you to do. But that's what the computer is doing. The computer couldn't be doing anything more than that. You're doing everything the computer could do. A computer has a syntax, Searle says. The computer has the physical signs, um, and they interact with one another pretty much the way the physical signs of English or Chinese interact with one another. But there's no meaning to it. There is no semantics. So on the outside, people will be inputting questions in Chinese to you. You will be outputting answers it will seem to them as though they are interacting with someone who speaks really very good Chinese, a fluent, idiomatic speaker, um, someone of sensitivity and intelligence. But no, it is just you um, working through this gigantic manual. They are really being taken in. So if you're interacting with a computer and the computer seems to be talking intelligently, it doesn't really matter how good it is. All that is happening is stuff like this. So just as you'd be being taken in in this case, there's nobody here that understands Chinese. Um, uh, then uh, you, you'd similarly be being taken in if you thought that the computer understood the language you were speaking to it in. There can't be a successful attempt at making a computer that speaks English. That's Searle's argument. It's a very simple argument, but it's very powerful. Yep. How do you know that like, when interacting with other human beings, their minds are not doing the same thing? 
yeah, how, how do you know that? I don't know. I mean, what do you think? I think we don't. You think we don't? Yeah. I, I mean, th that's right. Look, um, um, Turing had a, uh, the uh, logician and mathematician Turing had a test, for, Alan Turing had a test for um, whether you have succeeded in making um, a machine that thinks and is sentient. And his test was um, if you're, something like this, if you're on the telephone to it, you can't tell whether you're talking to um, a human being or a, or a machine. Yeah. Now, um, that, that's a very plausible test. But if Searle's right, then that test is no good. Uh, but if the test is no good, then how, it, it really is a live question. How do we know that other people um, are, are, are uh, any better than the computer? Because all you have is the way other people interact with you. Uh, yep. Right. They add a few more pages to the book. It's not a fixed dictionary. And it's not what, sorry? <coughs> it is not a fixed dictionary. It's not a fixed rule. It's uh, always changing, and therefore it has a mind, and therefore it is precisely like how we understand languages. Well, there has to be some. Uh, the, the, uh, what happens in real life is that there's variation in what people say. You know, you, part of the joy of these exchanges is I have no idea what you guys are going to say. It, you, you see what I mean? You can't really predict what people are going to say. Um, but, there ha so, but the manual isn't changing because there has to be stability in how we react to the signs that we use. And if there wasn't stability, you couldn't have a language. A language depends on the meanings of the signs staying, staying the same over time. And of course, language, but words change their meanings, but they don't change them that fast. You know, they don't change them moment to moment. Over the course of a day, the signs of the language you're speaking say pretty much the same. Otherwise, communication would be impossible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Could we say that the um, computer has a mind of its own because it has to understand the language? Like, like, like the man understands English if you output the, the Chinese characters, um, but the computer has to understand its own language, the ones and zeros, to output the English or any other language. Ah. He's only, he's not translating the Chinese into English. Yeah. yeah. Um, he's just using the English to tell him what to do next. Yeah. Um, so, the, but the computer has that knowledge too. The computer is doing it without the benefit of a language to tell it what to do next. It's just been physically set up in such a way that it does do all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, but the fact that he has English is not really being used to, um, interpret the Chinese is just being used to do the manipulations which a computer can do without having a language at all. Yeah, I mean without having a language like English at all. Yeah. Is, is that addressing your question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, let's give this guy a voice box. Yeah, so uh, I mean, th there are these. Can't an iPhone do that? You, you know, you, um, it, it talks to you instead of um, giving you uh, a, a written output. Is that what you're talking about, having something auditory, something you can hear? I'm more interested in the input. Like, instead of just having a written input, right. could he have a pictorial, like a, a pictorial input or like a, a sound? A sound, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, if that was what was going on, then, then he'd have understanding. If he was translating things into Chinese, yeah, then he'd have an understanding. Uh, sorry, if he was translating the Chinese into English, then he would have an understanding of what's going on. But that's not what's happening here. All he's doing is getting symbols that he is just describing as squiggles and squoggles. He doesn't have a meaning for any of them. Um, and he's just working with them doing the S1, S2 thing with them. Um, and that's what all the English is being used for. So I, it would be just the same situation if this happened with something being done with a voice. Yeah, I mean, you can voice control an iPhone. Yeah, 
uh, uh, <laughs> it's still just a phone. I don't mean I say just a phone, I, you, you see what I mean. It's, it doesn't really understand English the way a human does, just because it's voice controlled. Yeah? Have I addressed your question? Is That's, that, that is really interesting, but um, if it had images and smells and a, a richer set of inputs. But suppose it gets images, um, and all it does is it treats them like squiggles and squoggles and manipulates with them. The result might still be something that looks like understanding, but it isn't really understanding. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's it, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it can't, it can't be just a matter of complexity, because look, this is a really big book that uh, uh, this guy is working with. If you think that's not complex enough, you know, make it two books, make it ten, make it ten to the ten, give them a really long time, speed them up. Uh, you see what I mean? It's not, it's not going to help. And if you say, well, um, you can't do anything except output the language, well, you know, put this into the head of a robot. Um, let them drive the robot about. That's still not going to constitute an understanding of Chinese. He still doesn't know what's going on. So no amount of this kind of thing is going to add up to an understanding of Chinese. That's a very simple uh, but really basic objection to... Um, well, so, since it's an objection to the computer model of the mind, it's also an objection to functionalism as a way of explaining what's going on in our understanding of language. Okay, plain as day what the what the objection is. Um, okay, I just want to give a, a, a real uh, a, a example of um, uh, how this goes. Suppose you've got a gadget that can multiply numbers. Um, I mean. Um, uh, uh, practically anything these days can multiply numbers. But suppose you just got a simple calculator that you can multiply with, and you ask, how does it do that? How does your pocket calculator do the multiplication? Well, look, here's one way you can, um, do multi you can make something that does multiplication. Here's one way of writing a simple program that does multiplication. So suppose you want to multiply 2 times 3 OK? Shall we do that? Let's multiply 2 by 3. Um, the way you do it is the answer is going to be A, right? OK, the answer is going to be A. So the first thing we do is, see, that. just look at what we have here. Here we have a box and arrow functionalist diagram that is really a little computer program for, um, showing, for letting you multiply 2 by 3. OK? So what we are going to do is we are going to be the guy in the Chinese room just working this. So you want to multiply 2 by 3. So the answer is going to be A, A for answer. So we, first of all, we set A to 0. And say, let's suppose A is 0. And now we ask, what's N? Um, is N 0? And we say, well, no, N is 3. Um, so that's no. So we subtract 1 from N. Um, and uh, what do we do? Well, what's, that? What's, what's 1 from N? 1 from N is 2. 2. Right. Um, and we add M to A, and A was 0. So now we got, and what was M? M was two, 2, right? So um, A is now 2. And now we go back, and we say, is N 0? And uh, N is not 0, N is 2. Um, so we subtract 1 from N, so N is now 1. And we add M, which was um, 2. To two. Uh, so now we've got four, and now we go back round and we say, is n zero? And um, is n zero? No, n is um, one. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, n is one, so we subtract one from n, which is zero, and we add two to a, which was four, so now we get six, 
And now we go back round and we say, is n zero? And we say, yes, n is zero. So now we can stop. So uh, two times three is six. Okay? Don't say you don't learn in this class. Um, <laughs> so, so what you've done here is you've taken, this is, you've taken how a person does, uh, how the calculator is doing two times three. You've broken it down. Now, the thing is, you broke it down to further cognitive operations. You, you, allow, you, you, you had this ability to subtract and add, and you didn't explain how the calculator is doing that. And at the end of the day, when you're explaining how a calculator subtracts and adds, how it multiplies, how it does the stuff it does, I mean, this is just a very simple computer, but it's simple enough that I can explain it. This is its great appeal. What you get is um, the computer's doing... Um, so, uh, binary addition. And you say, now how does the computer do binary addition? Well, it's going to have something like this. It's going to have something like um, an AND gate and an exclusive OR gate, so that this is going to tell you that um, if you um, add 0 to 1, well, if they're the same, you've got an AND gate that outputs a 1. If they're different, it outputs a 0, so it outputs a 0. Um, and uh, uh, this is an exclusive OR gate, so if they're different, it outputs a 1. And if they're the same here, it outputs a 0. So this one outputs a 0, and that outputs a 1. And that tells you that 1 plus 0 is 1. Now, I don't say that's terribly brainy, but if you ask, how is it doing this? Well, how is it doing that? The thing is, when you break this down, you break, you break the ability to multiply down into the ability to subtract and add. But when you try and break this down, it doesn't break down at all. I mean, there is no simpler operation than this. All that you'd have here, if you look at what was going on in the calculator, is um, you could only explain what was going on here by looking at the electricity, by saying how these voltages here are um, interacting with one another. So the idea is, there are going to be primitive processors. Um, when you're giving these box and arrow diagrams, you can always say, now, how is that box generating these outputs for these inputs? How is that happening? And you can break that down to further operations and say, uh, there's um, more boxes and arrows inside this box that are explaining how it does what it does. But at the end of the day, it's going to bottom out in primitive processors, things that are just explained as voltages or cell firings or something like that. And one way to see Searle's point is um, you've got a bunch of primitive processors, just cells firing, voltages being put together. Um, and that's giving you the basic grammar of the brain. That's the, that is basically the vocabulary of the brain that uh, the computer model regards the brain as operating by having a set of um, primitive processes like that interacting with one another. And Searle's point is, how could any amount of that kind of thing add up to an understanding of language? When a calculator is doing this kind of thing, you wouldn't say, oh, the calculator understands addition or it understands multiplication. Just because the primitive processors are generating this kind of box and arrow behavior. So, that kind of approach can't explain how an understanding of language is happening. That's the argument. And that's really a basic argument. Okay? So, all these guys in AI are wasting their time. You couldn't get an analysis of human understanding. And the computer model of the brain can't explain how it is that we have a mental life. That, that's the challenge. Can you put your hand up if you're convinced by that? And if you're not? Well, okay. And if you've no idea what's going on? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. If you've no idea what's going on, please feel free to... You're trying to articulate it. I'm not explaining it correctly if it's obscure. It's a very direct argument, this. 
Okay, well, come back to it. Okay. Well, suppose you think um, that there is something um, missing here. What exactly is it that's missing? Um, you might say, well, actually, you shouldn't think of it like this. I mean, when you think about what a computer's doing, um, a computer's got a central processing chip somewhere that kind of does the, 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 does the work. But you talk about the whole computer as doing this or that. It's the whole computer that's got, got the capacity um, to run Microsoft Word or to um, uh, play a video or something. It's the whole computer that does that. You, it would be a mistake to say it's the chip that does the work. Um, and similarly, you could say, look, Cell's example is very confusing, because, really, because this guy is basically the central processing unit. This guy is basically the chip. It's the whole thing that should be being said to understand or not understand. Um, it's really what Ryle would have called a category mistake, to home in on the guy. Um, that's like homing in in the chip. What Cell says about that is, um, suppose you say it's the whole system that really understands not just the thing in the, in, the, in the middle. It doesn't matter whether that guy understands Chinese or not. The whole system could still be said to understand Chinese. Searle's answer is, I, I find it extremely confusing. Searle's answer says, um, the, the person in the room could have a characterization of the whole system built into his manual, and yet he's still not going to understand Chinese. So you can't explain what it is for the whole system to understand Chinese in these terms. You might say, well, um, there's a virtual person here. What I mean is, um, if you look at the particular reactions that this, um, that, that this system is giving, then the reactions might exhibit characteristics like sarcasm, or tenderness and sensitivity, or a really cruel sense of humor. You know, if what's coming back out at you from the slot, or jibes at the stupidity of your questions, for example, or um, attacks on your mother, then um, you will build up a picture of the virtual person here. This might, this might be um, a very diffident, harmless, well-meaning guy producing all these brutal jibes. Um, and you might say then, well, there's really a kind of virtual person here, kind of like an avatar. And that virtual person, just as you could say, they have, um, uh, they are cruel and unfeeling, um, or no, they know a surprising amount about me, or whatever. Uh, you could say, well, that virtual person, just as it has all these virtual characteristics, that virtual person is understanding Chinese. That virtual person is kind of like an avatar. Um, I mean, that seems to be, it seems to me that you would, you would actually say that if you're confronted with this phenomenon. Um, you, you would talk about the personality of the, the, uh, the virtual person that understands Chinese there. But really, that's only a virtual person and a virtual understanding of Chinese. We really need to know what makes the difference between that kind of virtual understanding of Chinese and a real understanding of a language. You might say, remember, there was, th th this is kind of like um, the homunculus headed robot. This is really the homunculus headed robot adapted to an, be an attack on the computer model of the mind. And in the case of the homunculus headed robot, I said, well, um, there's this Takash objection that the, uh, the robot doesn't really have the functional structure of an ordinary human because there are all these free agents. Um, driving the robot about, and they could rebel. Um, and similarly, you might say, well, in the room, I mean, after all, this really isn't going to have the uh, functional structure of an ordinary human being because, um, you know, this guy might get bored. He might get fed up. He might say, I'm not being paid enough. He might say, well, what's in it for me? And um, just stop doing it. So it's not really get the same functional structure as a human being. Um, the trouble I have with that kind of reply there is, when you think about the point about the calculator, 
The primitive processors in a calculator are like this guy here, um, only, how should I put it, they're dumber. Um, the primitive process in a calculator really don't have free agency and all they can do is do this stuff. And the puzzle is still the same. How could any amount of that stack up to an understanding of language? Or you might say, as someone said earlier, this thing can't act and behave in its environment. But really, if the manual tells the thing how to act and behave, that doesn't of itself mean that the thing is understanding. You know, this guy is still just pulling the levers and saying, I wish I understood what was going on. I have no idea what any of this is all about. I mean, the whole robot might be making a cup of tea, let's say, um, in response to a request. Um, and if this guy is just pulling the levers and saying, I wish somebody would tell me what's happening here, uh, that's still not understanding. There isn't an understanding of anything going on here just because you've added the ability to make tea to the thing. Now, in Bloch's case, when Bloch was talking about the homunculus-headed robot, Bloch was really raising a question about consciousness. Bloch was raising the question, what is it to have sensory experience? Can functionalism explain what it is to have a sensation of redness or a feeling of pain or a pang or a yearning? Um, the point about the homunculus-headed robot was this thing being driven about like that um, meets any functional description you like. It can be as complex in a box and arrow way as you like. But it's not conscious at all. The whole thing doesn't have sensations or feelings. Um, here's Bloch. There is a prima, prima facie, um, there is a, on the face of it, doubt whether the homunculi headed system has any mental states at all, especially whether it has what philosophers have variously called qualitative states, raw fields, or immediate phenomenological properties. So the puzzle there was about whether functionalism can explain um, sensation and experience. So Searle's point is not really about sensation and experience. Searle's point is about um, the understanding of language, the ability to uh, think intelligently in a language. That's a way to put it, that it can't think in Chinese cell system. So there are these two problems for functionalism. One is, can it give you an analysis of what experience is? And another is, can it give you an analysis of what thinking is, what it is to be able to intelligently use a language? And these seem to be different problems. And then it's natural to wonder, is there a connection between these two problems for functionalism? Is it that Functionalism can't give you an account of what it is to understand a language or to be able to think intelligently. And it's because of that that it can't give you an analysis of experience or consciousness. Or is it round the other way? Is it that it can't give you an analysis of experience or consciousness and actually the intelligent use of language depends on experience or consciousness? As you get the homunculus-headed robot, is that unconscious because it can't think? And would it be right to say that it's only if you can think and understand a language that you can be conscious? I mean, what's your feeling about that? Deca, yeah? Th couldn't you separate thinking from understanding a language? You probably could. I ha I've been running them together. But um, w w what I've been identifying is being able to understand the language with being able to think in the language. Yeah. I, I wouldn't want to deny that there might be a kind of thinking that you could have without language at all. You know, maybe some primates of that. Yeah. Um, my own feeling is you could perfectly well be conscious without being able to think in a language. I mean, presumably um, fish or sea slugs or whatever could be conscious without um, being capable of intelligent verbal thought. Uh, so it really seems, you know, presumably infants are conscious even though they don't have um, verbal thought. But it seems, if you put it around the other way, is it that 
um, the homunculus-headed robot isn't conscious and therefore can't think? Is it that what gives us the ability to think about the, the world, what gives us our understanding of the, lang of, the, of the language we're using, is its connection to our consciousness? Well, this guy doesn't have, I mean, <laughs> how should you put it? This guy doesn't get out enough. Um, th th this guy doesn't have any experience of his surroundings. Doesn't, uh, I mean, someone put it there, I was talking earlier about images and... Um, smells and so on. And I actually really think there is something right about that. It's just that if you only think of it as a dead image just being presented here, I think it doesn't help. But if you think of what is needed is um, sensations of the external environment, experience of the external environment, and experience of the external environment being hooked up to the use of the signs here, that's what would make the difference. Then then there should be a link between being able to think about your world and having experience of your world, getting in from the senses, um, consciousness of the other people, the tables and the chairs, the stuff around you, and um, the ability to think about the other people and the tables and chairs. And it's because functionalism isn't giving a good characterization of the, your experience of the world around you that is not giving a good analysis of verbal thought about the world around you. Because verbal thought depends on experience of the world around you. Okay. On that note, let's leave it there for today and we'll review the situation on Monday. Thanks. <laughs>